Thank you. Okay, uh, good morning or good afternoon. Welcome to our 1130 a.m. session of the August 23rd, 2022 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Kalantari Johnson, present. Holder. Absent. Coming. Here. Brown. Here. Myers. Present. Vice Mayor Watkins. Here. Mayor Brunner. Present. Thank you. I have a few announcements and then we'll move on to our regular meeting. Thank you for your patience. We just finished our closed session portion of today's meeting. Today is being broadcast live on community television tw channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. Our rules of decorum are on the window ledge to my left. If you are joining us here in person, it's my job to keep the meeting running without disruption. And we ask that you respect your fellow citizens when you are inside or outside our chambers. For the consideration of our community, please stay home if you have symptoms of a cold or flu or are feeling unwell in any way. Thank you. <coughs> if you wish to comment on an agenda item today and are attending virtually, call in at the beginning of the item you are wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. And please note there is a delay in streaming so that if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it's your time for public comment, you will be able to raise your hand if you're joining us virtually by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting the raise hand feature in the webinar controls on your computer. Please note that public comment is heard only on items that council is taking action on and not regular updates or reports. The items that will be open for public comment during today's meetings are numbers five through 21 on our agenda. I'd like to start off by asking the council members if there are any statements of disqualification today. Okay, seeing none. I'd like to ask the city clerk to announce any additions and deletions. There are none. Okay, thank you. I'd like to ask the city attorney to provide a report on our closed session. Good afternoon, Mayor Brunner, members of the City Council. This um, morning, the Council met in closed session at 10 a.m. to discuss two items of business. The first item was a conference with labor negotiators. Council received a report from and gave direction to its negotiators with respect to the uh, bargaining units listed on your agenda, um, which are essentially all bargaining units. Uh, item two was a conference with legal counsel concerning potential initiation of litigation. And uh, the council received a report from the city attorney's office on that matter. Um, there was no reportable action. Thank you. The city council, okay, will review the meeting calendar attached to the agenda. And I'll call on the city clerk to provide any updates to the calendar. There are no updates, thank you. Thank you. This is the time now for council members to report out on actions at external boards, committees, and joint powers authority meetings. For future meetings, please come prepared to provide an update on any meetings or actions that occurred since the last council meeting so that the council and public can be informed. And I'll start with uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Um, I'm gonna ask my colleague, um, Vice Mayor Watkins, to report out on the Children's Fund meeting and um, our Metro meeting will be coming up Friday, so I don't have any reports. I haven't, I haven't been to other meetings. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I will report on uh, the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Committee meeting. Um, I just wanted to, that we had a number of <coughs> items on our agenda, including some items uh, related to moving forward on <coughs> the highway, um, but the, the big item was uh, a discussion about um, the uh, electric passenger rail uh, and coastal rail trail project between Pajaro Junction and Santa Cruz along the Santa Cruz branch rail line and um, the commission at that meeting did vote unanimously to move ahead with uh, environmental review and some other work that needs to be done in order to um, begin to move forward with our rail trail. And um, I also attended and some others were there as well, um, other members of this uh, body as well as many members of the public uh, groundbreaking uh, sponsored by the city and the RTC for uh, the groundbreaking of the uh, second half of segment seven which runs through the city on the west side down to the boardwalk and so I'm just pleased to report that we're moving forward um, in that in that arena and I will also report on the area agency on aging meeting um, the, our last meeting was a somewhat difficult one. Our conversations, um, many of our, much of our conversation and multiple agenda items uh, connected back to the challenges that current um, senior programs are facing as a result of the core investment cuts and in particular. <coughs> so I, um, and, and we've talked about this and we have it on our agenda later today and um, I'm not gonna go through all of that again, but I, I, I did just want to highlight two programs that we got um, extensive reports for, um, which both of which were defunded and not given any bridge funding uh, for, um, well, one of which was given bridge funding and one of which was not given bridge funding, but both of which were essentially defunded. Um, the first one is Project Scout, and I just want to, I'm, I'm talking about these because they're really important programs for our community, and I think people should know about them and understand what the challenges are and be prepared to step up to help support them um, because what they do in our community extends not well beyond um, just you know the su direct immediate support that's provided um, but really um, you know acro across for families um, <laughs> and you know in the broader community so the first one's project scout which you've heard about it does um, you know tax assistance for low-income seniors and um, I just want to give you a couple of stats. Um, in the past year, as of July um, of this year, so the, for the previous year, um, they helped prepare uh, 1,334 tax returns, which brought um, uh, 1.5 plus million dollars back into our community to um, low-income people through the Earned Income Tax Credit and other um, deductions on their returns. Uh, that's money that um, is it will be the project scout will be challenged to um, provide support for because they um, do not have the, the resources to um, ensure ongoing staffing for that program. Um, so <clears throat> I just wanted to give them a shout out and um, for folks out in the community who are interested um, in supporting them, you can you can find them online and um, you may hear more from me on that <laughs> in the future. Um, some things are in the works. Um, also for this one, I want to just highlight again, Advocacy Inc.'s Ombudsman Program. Um, it, they're responsible for seven skilled nursing facilities and 26 residential care facilities for the elderly, some of which are in the city of Santa Cruz, and a total bed count of 1,800 um, approximately people. That's 1,800 seniors who are in long-term care facilities and uh, skilled nursing facilities who um, rely on the 2.4 people um, who are responsible for monitoring those programs. Um, and um, so as a result of this defunding, what the, the executive director of the organization reported to the um, AAA would be likely happening if they cannot find a way to backfill that money um, is a loss of uh, 624 advocacy hours um, for those long-term care residents. Um, a reduced ability to hold facilities accountable to quality of care, which we know is, is critical. 
um, increasing workload, you know, the kinds of things that we just know happen when, we're, when staff get squeezed, we're experiencing it here. Um, but um, I, I also want to highlight again um, the loss of essential funding locally um, then reduces the ability of that organization to draw down federal dollars to do that work. And so they're looking at, um, you know, potentially um, closing their doors, and that's, that's where they're at. Um, and it's a federally mandated program. There is no other alternative program um, in, the, in the county that provides that service. The county um, Adult Protective Services, we talked about that, you know, as a, as a space for kind of um, complementary and collaborative work. Um, but those funds do not, um, because of their, um, uh, you know, funding restrictions do not, can't be used for this purpose. So there really is a funding gap there. And I think it's, I can't remember how much the city's portion of it was, but, um, you know, there's probably $100,000 that <coughs> could be lost and um, much more than that as a result of the federal loss of funding. So um, I just think we all <sighs> should be thinking about that, and for those who are out there, I uh, highly, highly recommend supporting um, Advocacy Inc. at this time. Uh, I'm going to leave it there. Um, I guess I'll say that there's conversations about the Live Oak Senior Center are ongoing, and we're still, um, you know, trying to figure out an alternative site there, so I'll just keep saying that if people have thoughts on, um, they can, you know, refer uh, Meals on Wheels uh, to think about other other locations, they're trying really hard, and they're in conversation with the Live Oak School District. But it's um, it's been um, a, a rocky road, and I think um, I'll leave it there. I, I'll say on a, to end on a uh, positive note: um, things do look good with the state budget, and so there there is some additional funding coming in again because those those funding streams are so compartmentalized. It's very it can't be used for some of the places where the funding is being lost. and um, But we do have, overall, the picture looks uh, pretty good for uh, money coming into our county for senior services this year in particular areas, um, a specific in particular around nutrition, but some others as well. And I'll keep you updated as we move forward. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I guess the first group I'll report out on is AMBAG. I think of significance at that meeting, <clears throat> as many of us are aware, there's the regional housing needs assessment um, planning that's going through and the um, finalization of the plan for this next cycle. Um, the cities of Sand City and Greenfield both appealed um, their allocations to AMBAG. Um, a part of what Sand City's um, concern was is the ability to build on the current land that they're there, that they have there, given the size of Sand City and how much land that is there is actually um, preserved for environmental protection. Um, that appeal was denied uh, by AMBAG. And then the city of Greenfield, um, during its last arena cycle, actually exceeded, met or exceeded all of the housing that needed to be produced under uh, its arena goals. However, there's nothing built into the arena process for cities that exceed the housing that they built for that those new units to be incorporated into um, the next cycle's arena goal target. And so that was a major concern that came up. Um, and I know that for some of the housing that the city of Santa Cruz has produced, we've exceeded our um, requirements and those numbers won't be incorporated into the next cycle. So there's a lot of concerns about the arena process and it was brought to our attention that there's actually um, a group or there's a a law firm and there's a number of cities that have been interested in suing the state over the arena process given that the state is mandating that cities um, produce these different levels of housing but they don't take into account the amount of space that cities have to build the housing nor are they providing any resources to actually um, support especially in production the production of very low and low-income housing and so um, hopefully we can explore that and I've mentioned that to the city manager or the city attorney and I'm hoping we can maybe have a follow-up discussion and maybe introduction of what's happening across the state around that. Um, the next, it just slipped my mind yeah. and I don't have my list in front of me. That's okay. Um, you yeah. want me to pull it up? Yeah, maybe come back to me. Maybe come back to me in a second. Okay. Sorry. 
Uh, Council Member Myers. Let's see, um, definitely was summer break, so not a lot of my um, committees and commissions met uh, during that period. Um, for the Central Coast Community Energy Policy Board, um, we did not have a meeting this past quarter, but we are having the annual um, both policy board um, and our annual meeting. That's gonna be in Monterey, uh, Wednesday, September 21st through Thursday, September 22nd. And that will be both the um, policy board and the operations board. And uh, so uh, there will be some interesting updates, both for investment back into communities, as well as um, securing the uh, various energy portfolios that have been underway all summer. Um, let's see here. Any other group? Metro was also, um, uh, did not meet uh, in July, so we have not had a meeting since then. And I did attend the Santa Cruz Mid-County Groundwater Agency meeting um, just last week. Uh, and there were two items that were voted through. One is um, compliance with the governor's executive order uh, for the GSA to uh, review well, uh, well permits uh, prior them, to them being uh, uh, approved by the county and with a specific uh, evaluation of consistency with the groundwater management plan. Um, and uh, they also have accepted their uh, large grant of 7.6 million that each groundwater agency has received this year. So they'll be doing projects with that. And then last but not least, um, I did, the CALS Working Group did have a meeting um, this past month. And uh, for the third year in a row now, CALS Beach has been off the beach bummer list, which is great. Um, so this is three years in a row. Um, they're gonna be starting an epidemi epidemiological study, I believe, working with the EPA and Stanford University to continue to explore the sources of bacteria and then continue to work um, on uh, maintaining and keeping off the list. We did talk about um, doing some outreach to visit Santa Cruz um, so that folks maybe promote that we have a clean beach and um, talk about the investments that the city has done to keep that beach clean and um, making sure that our, um, our tourism folks know that Cal's is off the list this is third year now, so, so that's good. And so that was the main, two main things that we're working on in that group. And I believe that is all of my groups for this time. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Myers. Council Member Cummings. Yeah, so the, the one group that, that also met was the Criminal Justice Council. And um, to date, kind of building off of some work that initiated last year, the Criminal Justice Council has been taking on different um, items regionally. Last year was looking at policies around use of force, accountability, transparency. This year we've been looking at um, uh, mental and behavioral health and kind of what calls um, are coming in um, and what, how, what the response is by law enforcement agencies. And then comparing between those agencies that have mental health liaisons with law enforcement versus those that do not have mental health liaisons. To date, all of the, um, the um, public safety agencies for the entire region have um, filled out that survey and the mental health liaisons have as well. And we're hoping that by the end of, uh, by our last meeting in November, we will have that report. Um, and again, we're, it seems like we're one of the few regions uh, in the entire country that's actually doing this work. So I really wanna thank um, Chairperson Zach Friend and all of our police agencies for participating in this. I think we're, as we start moving towards these types of systems of shifting um, behavioral crisis response away from law enforcement, that this will be very informative in that effort. Thank you. When do you meet next? Do you know? Offhand? November. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Vice Mayor Watkins. Sure. Um, I too don't have as much to report since it was the summer break, but I was gonna just briefly report that we had our health and all policies um, subcommittee meeting and just really impressed by the work that's happening uh, with that initiative in Tiffany Wise West and is always very impressive with what she produces. 
um, we looked at a, um, a dashboard mock-up, so really thinking about fleshing it, that out and thinking um, how to integrate also our proxy measures with what we're trying to accomplish with CORE and with the CAP and really being mindful of what to capture there. Um, a lot of work happening within the equity best practices and engagement for staff. Um, great things happening a lot also along the lines of having um, really accurate and um, meaningful uh, Spanish translation and interpretation and guidance for our staff around how to do that. Um, exploring diversity and commissions um, and then more to come. I think there will be a presentation from the Civil Council soon. And as uh, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson mentioned, we had our, health, our children's fund um, meeting, but it was really kind of the next iteration of where, we've ex where it's existed and resided, which it's been um, a part of our city schools committee meeting and a, a point of conversation at that meeting. And given now that the Measure A had passed, really looking at how to thoughtfully capture what's worked, and then capture what's written in the ordinance for Measure A, and then really thinking about holistically how to propose um, moving forward. So um, really exciting stuff happening there. And I will let you, Mayor, um, report on Visit Santa Cruz County because I was late to that meeting. I couldn't make it. Thank you. Uh, okay, so let's see. Visit Santa Cruz uh, County meeting. We received a presentation on a metric software system um, that would connect all property management systems, vacation rentals, hoteliers, et cetera, um, and would be able, I think right now there's about 45 different metrics that report to key data dashboards. And they look at things like average daily rate, um, booking windows, track cancellations, et cetera in our lodging industry. Uh, there were some other um, um, reports around the key data and connecting with Airbnb and VRBO and sh uh, short-term vacation rentals. Um, we also um, spoke a little bit about some potential California legislation around lodging uh, industry that's um, being researched. Don't know um, enough yet to report on that, but it was something to look into. And a lodging task force was created to explore recommendations for group marketing strategies. Um, we, I also sit on the revenue budget committee and we um, last met and we had a very short timeline, but did, uh, as some of you know from our last meeting, uh, made the recommendation to put a transient occupancy tax, the TOT tax, on the November ballot. And that information is on the county elections page uh, website. And so all the information is there. Um, we also had a two by two meeting and that is um, in connection with uh, City of Santa Cruz, County of Santa Cruz collaboration on um, various aspects of homelessness and housing, uh, countywide and city working together. Some of the um, topics we talked about were project home key updates, the county has applied for a couple of home key projects that are in process. And um, we also talked about some funding opportunities uh, and uh, the county has a couple of uh, uh, funding opportunities, home key round three and um, ARP winter funds, et cetera. There's a couple of other items that I, um, we didn't go too into detail. We discussed the 14 million investment updates, property acquisitions and changes, pre-development funding. Um, we had a, a one-time 14 million uh, 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 money uh, from the state and that was a county city collaboration on um, spending that money. Um, towards homelessness and housing. 
uh, and workforce hiring challenges and housing for workforce. Uh, also uh, started discussing um, move-in and sustaining support for those that need help with moving trucks, storage, unpacking, and how the county has been helping with a lot of um, that aspect and how we can get more support for that. And identifying starting the discussion for uh, November as we have new county supervisors and new city council members, mayor coming in um, after the November elections and really kind of identifying uh, and preparing for uh, new folks onboarding and uh, the city and county roles uh, and, and protocols. It was very overview. So uh, do you have a question, Council Member Kalantari Johnson? I forgot about a subcommittee that did meet, so. Okay. Uh, and you mentioned health and all policies, so that concludes my report out. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Hearing all your reports remember, made me remember that I did as part of the um, uh, safe parking subcommittee, uh, member of that subcommittee met with members of AFC as we are starting to um, roll out tier three of safe parking. And I know we'll hear more about that later this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, we are now at the point in the agenda for consent agenda. These are items numbers five through 17 on our agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting virtually, now is the time to call in if you would like to comment on any consent agenda item five through 17. The instructions should be on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device and you can raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting the raise hand feature on the webinar controls on your computer. If you're joining us here in person and would like to comment on any consent agenda items five through 17, you can sign in at the front podium to the right and um, line up on the right side. All items in our consent agenda will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. So at this time, I will ask if there are any council members who wish to comment on or pull any consent agenda items. Council Member Myers. I just have a question for staff on um, items 13 and 16. Okay, you have a question on 13. Citywide Vegetation Management Award Contract and 16. Annual San Lorenzo River Flood Control <coughs> Maintenance Award contract. Okay. Anybody else? Council Member Kalantari Johnson? Comment on 12. Comment on 12. The award contract for playground equipment at Garfield Park Playground. Okay. So at this time, then, I will go to uh, item number 12 for Council Member Kalantari Johnson's comment. I saw Council Member Cummings also had put his finger up. Yeah, I have a question on um, item number 15. Okay. Item 15, cost of construction fee revision for public works. Okay. Oh, you know what? Actually, I'm sorry. It's, it's on a different item. I'm, I'm done. Okay. So I will cancel that question on item 15, and I will return to Council Member Kalantari Johnson for a comment on item 12. I just wanted to um, comment that I'm really thrilled to see investment going into this tiny little park that gets a lot of use, including my kids when they were growing up and a lot of community members over on the west side. Um, I think these, these are the investments that we need as a community to make it, make it healthy for everyone, so I'm just really happy to see that and wanted to pull it out and highlight that. Excited. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, Council Member Myers, you had a question on item number 13, 
Yeah, I just had a just a question for staff. Um, we got a letter um, in our packet um, from Jane Mio, who's who's a longtime um, person who cares a lot about the river. She had some, she had a question just, um, and I just wanted to reiterate with staff, which I think I know the answer to. But um, both of these awards and the folks um, who are doing the work will be doing the work according to the. Um, Streambed alteration permits um, under both cases, is that correct? And following all those uh, those uh, criteria. Hello, Filipina. Um, and I think I know the answer, but I just thought I would just ask that question and reconfirm. Sure, hi, good afternoon, Mayor and Council members. My name is Filipina Warren, Public Works Operations Manager. And to answer your question, yes, they will be abiding um, by our permit regulations. Um, we'll also have our um, biologist um, who will walk through with the crews beforehand um, on the stipulations for vegetation management. And this, I mean, your question really was for um, for 16 for the annual um, right for the for the contract along the river, right, yeah, along the, the river. river, yeah, flood yes. management, yeah. And then I know that the veg management, I think she sent another another email to just regarding that. And I believe that is, that's a citywide stream bed alteration permit, correct? So that, correct. that kind of work could take place in other areas, but has similar protections in terms of the biological Correct. Resources. And then um, for 13 and 16, for both items, we do have our biologist who will go through um, all the projects that are needed. I mean, whether it's working um, you know, along the tributaries um, for San Lorenzo River, um, just making sure that we abide by our permit regulations. Right, so thank you. I just okay. wanted to clarify that just because of the letters that we received. No, I understand, thank you. thank you. Thank you very much for that clarification. Okay, that concludes comments and questions. At this time, I will go out to public comment. If there are members of the public that would like to speak, if you're joining us here in person, you can uh, line up on the right. And I will also look out to our virtual attendees. If you are attending virtually, please raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting the raise hand feature on your webinar controls. And I have two hands raised. The first name is I am watching you. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Welcome. Yes, hi. Having watched your processes, your priorities are clear. First, hire lots more city employees, grant employees an extra paid holiday, pass out one-time money you don't really have to benefit very few people, and the backlogged infrastructure spending is expendable. I see the bad landlord is added again in item number 10. I see in item number six, you want to extend the COVID emergency to October 22nd based on the fear that COVID case counts can be variable and various government bodies have also done so. In truth, the seven day average of COVID deaths in Santa Cruz County have averaged zero, rounded to zero for almost every single week except for reading one or two in a few weeks since March of 2021. More homeless people alone died in the streets than from COVID. No emergency there. There will be seasonal case count spikes in December as usual. You can count on it, but that doesn't make it an emergency. It's the normal seasonal illness, and at this point, the new normal. There is no zero COVID possible. It is here to stay, and hopefully it will evolve as it has to the usual more contagious, less deadly variants like Omicron, which joins 200 or so viruses humans deal with every year. I dare you to name one thing this extension will do that will prevent the very few COVID deaths that might occur. The fact that 95% of children under five and 70% between five and 11 have not received vaccination shots tells me parents have lost confidence in the public health system and its rhetoric and understand children take more risk of harm from side effect laden shots than benefit. This emergency is more such fear monger rhetoric. We see the CDC backtracking on its previous guidance as if the awful response failures based on no real science ever happened as the truth now comes out. COVID infection protection is brief as the vaccines wear off quickly. Plenty of evidence exists that in less than six to nine months after the last vac 
people's now damaged systems make them more likely to have health problems than the unvaccinated. You can expect a much more sick population with the vaccination effectiveness wearing off and the immune systems and other vaccine induced damage taking its toll. Fauci is retiring, obviously around the midterms to avoid its science, if I say so, Mr. Science himself being thrown out or I wish hauled out in chains if probably when Congress changes stripes in November. Note you state uh, your emergency declarations will continue, quote, until it has been determined the conditions giving rise to the emergency have been abated. Uh, that is never going to happen anytime soon. If you're Thanks. Thank you for your comments. Um, our next hand raised is phone number ending in 4844. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hi there. Hi there. Uh, are you able to unmute yourself? There we go. Welcome. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd request initially, first of all, that you schedule specifically item 19 at a time certain today so that people can know when to attend. That's often done with conven at the convenience of other housed folks. But regarding the consent agenda, items 6, 7, 12, and 16, I would request that uh, council member pull them from the agenda for brief comment for the public. It's nice that the city council gets to make brief comment, but it'd also be nice if the public did as well. So I know that uh, council member Sandy Brown has made a commitment to that effect. And I'm, I pause briefly to ask if she will do this so I can then we can proceed to those items individually. The now items, I don't hear her thank, uh, did sorry, she thank Sandy. I'm, I'm just hearing this request, um, the items that you're asking. Six, seven, 12, and 16. Six and seven for brief comments, 12 and 16, perhaps for a little more, but not a lot. Um, well, I'm willing to pull them. That would give you two minutes to speak on them, but we don't have dialogue during our public meeting. Um, I understand. Yeah. You're talking about two minutes per item, correct? Yeah, you, and you said for two and six? Or six? Six, sorry. Uh, just just six clarify for me which items that you want to talk about. Item uh, 12 and 16 and six and seven for brief comments. Okay, why don't you try to make your six and seven comments here during your time, and I will pull um, 12 and 16. That's, that's acceptable. Thank you. Uh, six and seven, of course, have to do with the emergency declaration, which was discussed in some detail by the prior speaker, who I may not entirely agree with on all his points. But there is a question as to whether, what are the criteria when the emergency will end? Specifically, what are the particular criteria for the ending of the emergency around the fire and the ending of the emergency around the issue of uh, the COVID crisis? So I'm sure the staff can answer that because they must have criteria. That's the reason I wanted to pull it so you could ask the staff to do it. Perhaps the council member will after this. That, that, that's my only questions about six and seven. Okay. So the reason I'm paused is because I'm assuming 12 and 16 are going to be pulled individually and I can talk about them when that comes up. Yes. I've requested that they be pulled and we'll, we'll move the rest of the consent agenda before we vote on those. So you will have a chance to speak. All right. If that concludes your public comment and there is no one here in person, um, I will go to item item number 12 oh go ahead yes yes um so i will just go to uh council member brown who has pulled item 12 and 16 and um so that means that we will now I'm looking for a motion on our consent agenda items 5 through 17 with the exception of 12 and 16. And Council Member Cummings. I'm happy to move those items. And then I'd just like to see if um, I'd like to ask the question the, that the members of the public just asked around when we would anticipate the 
the that we would no longer extend the emergency declaration connected to COVID, and then also um, the fires, the CZ fires. I'll second that with the same question. And city attorney, would you like to comment on that? I'm waiting to see if my associate is uh, in attendance. Otherwise, I'd be happy to. Um, well, I'll just I'll just get started. Um, the uh, resolution extending the emergency declaration is a mechanism by which certain uh, executive orders and council uh, or emergency orders um, are able to be implemented, and so. When the council concludes that uh, that those measures that have been taken in response to the COVID uh, crisis are no longer necessary to implement, then it's really a council decision to to uh, to discontinue renewing the emergency declaration. Uh, item seven concerns um, a resolution that authorizes the city council continu to continue to use uh, teleconference meetings in lieu of in-person meetings and that's pursuant to a state statute that has uh, been implemented and I believe expires in the beginning of 2024 but again that's a city council policy uh, decision um, judging by the attendance uh, of late in recent council meetings I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that members of the public appreciate the ability to attend virtually and um, and so and that's really just a council policy decision. Thank you for that answer. Is that great? Uh, okay, so we have a motion by Council Member Cummings for a second for the consent agenda items five through 17 with the exceptions of 12 and 16. I second. And seconded by Brown. May we have a roll call vote, please? Council Members Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Holder. So absent. Um, Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. Mayor Bruner? Aye. That motion passes unanimously with Council Member Holder absent. Okay, and now we will proceed to item number 12. Item 12 is an award contract for playground equipment at Garfield Park playground um, and we had this item pulled uh, and if there are any questions we can answer any questions and then go to public comment and then vote on this item I'll just say since I pulled the item uh, I did that upon request by a member of the public I don't have any comments on it aside from I was glad to see it on our agenda Thank you, Council Member Brown. Are there any other questions? Okay, so we'll go to public comment for this item. If this is an item you wish to comment on, now is the time to raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand feature in the webinar controls of your computer. If you're joining us here in person, please line up to the right of the dais the timer will then be set to two minutes. And okay, we have one hand raised virtually and it is phone number ending in 4844. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I apologize to the council and to Sandy. I meant items five and six, but the, the, the issue is I'm, I'm happy with telecommunication access to the council. It, it does extend the reach of the council provided combined with actual in-person stuff. But the, yeah, the issue of the criterion has not been established. It's just when you, whenever you say it's going to go away, it's going to go away, but you give no criteria for it. So that's unfortunate. But getting to the item 12, I'll, the only really brief comment I have here, this is about a quarter million dollars for playground equipment. And that's, who's going to want to deny playground equipment to kids? Certainly not me. 
but that's also the same amount that's going to deal with the demolition of the and relocation of people in the encampment area for 200 to 300, maybe more people. This seems rather disproportionate, and I, I would mention it at another time, but you are be, you're going to be passing this resolution now. And this is, I think, a serious situation where the public is being informed that there is going to be, uh, only, presumably there's only a limited amount of money, and this significant amount of this money is going to something that can be postponed until such time as emergency situations, i.e. living conditions for 300 or more people can be addressed. And this affects the entire community's health, of course. That's my only comment on this item. Okay. Thank you for your comment. Are there any other members of the public who wish to comment on consent agenda item 12? Okay, I will bring it back to Council for action. I'll move the item. Okay, Council Member Myers, is there a second? A second. Council uh, Vice Mayor Watkins, any other <laughs> comments? Okay, may we have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Boulder? Absent. Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Brunner? Aye. That mo motion passes unanimously with the uh, Councilmember Golder absent. Our next consent agenda item that was pulled is consent agenda item number 16, the annual San Lorenzo River Flood Control Maintenance Award Contract. Um, this is a motion to award a contract for the San annual San Lorenzo River Flood Control Maintenance. Are there any council member comments before going out to public comment? Okay, I will uh, look to our in-person audience and there's nobody in person for public comment. So I will now look to our virtual attendees. If you'd like to comment on consent agenda item number 16, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. There should be instructions on your screen. You can press star nine to raise your hand and um, and then press star six to unmute yourself. And I see one hand raise, phone number ending in 4844. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hello. Council members, uh Again, I'm concerned with this, the same kind of question as I had for item 12, but I guess what I'm asking here is this quarter of a million dollars going to the San Lorenzo River flood control, can it be postponed? Because obviously we have fences going up in the benchlands. We have an immediate situation that is gonna require some action, or at least that's what we're gonna hear later in this agenda. But here you have another quarter million dollars being pressed forward. And I guess the question which uh, no council member wanted to respond to uh, around item 12 is similar to item 16 is, is there a way of postponing this so that it can be dealt instead? Can this money instead be used for dealing with the kind of problems that are immediate rather than maybe at a distance? Now this, I, I would have to, you know, I would um, accede to the opinion of the city uh, city attorney on this to some extent, uh, I suppose, uh, or to someone who has specific information. But again, when we get vague comments such as, oh, it's up to the city council to decide this, we have no criteria for, for example, extending the emergency, I wonder about anything that is said uh, on this, in this matter. But initially, but again, the question is essentially basically, are you prepared to dump a quarter million dollars into a project if it can be postponed and instead, in essence, deny that to assist uh, a far more vulnerable group of people who need help? Now, admittedly, the bench lands is, always faces a danger of flooding, and that's a matter for the entire community. 
but it's going to be an immediate matter of uh, assistance to people when this comes up, uh, and it will be discussed further in 19, 19.1.2. Uh, thank you for listening, and I hope the community turns out on these issues because I don't know if my lone voice is going to be enough to persuade the council. Thank you for your comment. I don't see any hands raised. Um, I will ask the question. I know that in our agenda packet, this uh, item number 16, the annual San Lorenzo River Flood Control Maintenance Award contract, the funding for this item comes from the Stormwater Overlay Enterprise Fund, and there is no impact to the general fund. Um, I would like to maybe see if there's staff that can comment on the question as well. And while I appreciate the, the thought, um, I think it would be more appropriately directed to the Public Works Director who's in the audience today. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, Mark Dettel, Director of Public Works. Um, yeah, this is an annual contract that we do. We have to prepare the river for um, flood control. It's per our requirements of the Corps of Engineers. Um, these, these funds are restricted. They're stormwater related funds and they, they have to be used for that type of uh, purpose. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see, Council Member Brown. I, I just, I'll, I'll make a quick comment, um, just kind of summarizing the um, and, and responding to the comment that we received um, from Mr. Norse. Um, and while I agree that, um, you know, I have, I, I'd like to be thinking about our budget priorities and all of that. Um, and I want to have that conversation, and we will, and we do. Um, in these two cases, the, they are the, the money for these is coming from funds that are outside of the general fund, so restricted funds, and then external grant funding. Um, so we couldn't easily, or really at all, make that kind of transfer. Um, however much I wish we had more flexibility, um, it's just not the case. So um, I did want to say that as a response because I agreed to pull the item, and I recognize that um, Mr. Norris has some you know, some good questions, and I want to try to get the public's questions answered. So thank you, the staff, too, for um, sharing that information. And with that, I think we're done with public comments, so I'll go ahead and move this item. Great. We have a motion by Council Member Brown. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Vice Mayor Watkins. <coughs> May we have a roll call vote? <laughs> Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Aye. <coughs> Boulder. Um, Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. Mayor Bruner? Aye. That motion passes unanimously with Council Member Golder absent. Thank you. At this time now, we will move on into the agenda. I will pull up my notes. Thank you for joining us today. Next up on our agenda is item number 18. This is the independent police auditor report. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you wish to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from council. We will then take public comment and then return to council for deliberation and action. In addition to public comment that we will be hearing today, there was one email sent to our city council email address. At this time, I would like to welcome uh, Michael Janako, independent police auditor. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, City Council. It's good to be with you this afternoon. I see some familiar faces, but again, for those who um, may not recognize me, my name is Michael Janako, and for the past two and a half years, I have been your independent police auditor. Uh, we're here today to present uh, our report, which includes the cases that we looked at in 2021. Um, 
there was an initial presentation of this report to your public safety committee, um, but that was done in closed session, so this is the first time that the report has been publicly released, and um, we're certainly here to provide a brief overview on what we found and the conclusions we drew from our year of review uh, per and perhaps next steps. We did have a brief PowerPoint that I just, um, we created just for purposes of context. Um, and um, we'll go through this uh, rather quickly and obviously be able to answer any questions. I know you have a busy agenda. Um, before I get too far into the weeds, I think we lost a PowerPoint, um, but I'm sure it'll come back. We go to the next slide when you can. Um, I wanted to introduce my colleague, uh, Sam Ramarian, who's been with me for approximately a year and a half now, and will uh, be addressing you all uh, in a minute. Um, the benefit of having Samra as part of our team is that, unlike me, Samra lives in your fair city of Santa Cruz, and so it makes it easier with regard to complaint contact, um, having the opportunity to actually meet in person, although we've been challenged with the pandemic with doing that, but um, once uh, restrictions and people feel more comfortable meeting in person um, by Samra's presence here, it makes it a lot easier for individuals in your community to have that contact with your independent police auditor team. Of course, in addition, by her proximity, she's able to pick up cases on a more regular basis as they become due. I think she can walk to the station from her house, so all, the, all that is good. Um, in any event, just to remind you all about our role um, as pol independent police auditor, we are essentially to review complaint investigations. By that, we mean if any complaint comes in uh, by a matter of the public, um, that, that then triggers a requirement on behalf of the police department to conduct an investigation. And uh, as that investigation is moving forward, we're in contact with your police department um, your professional standard sergeant uh, to gauge and to sort of keep up on the progress as cases um, move forward. We also have a responsibility to review critical incidents, that is major incidents such as officer-involved shootings, and fortunately we, there hasn't been one of those recently, but as indicated in this uh, report itself, there was an in-custody death uh, that we reviewed as part of our, our last report. Um, Along with the review of the actual cases, and what we are looking at is we are reviewing the cases to see whether or not it was a robust, objective, and fair investigation with regard to the allegations, and whether the outcome was evidence-based. By that, I mean whether the evidence supported the decision that was reached by, uh, eventually, the chief of police. And then for the cases in which there is a violation of policy, we also review the case to determine whether or not the intervention, the discipline, the accountability uh, was uh, consistent with um, industry standards. <clears throat> In addition, another role uh, we have is to provide input on uh, Santa Cruz's police department policies. And just as an example, two weeks ago, we were provided by the chief of police uh, draft policy on uh, complaint investigations, personnel investigations, and we provided feedback on uh, what we thought could um, be done to improve the, the draft policy. And that give and take happens regularly throughout the year. Uh, we all get to see you once a year, and this is our annual visit to uh, the whole council. Uh, as indicated, our protocols also allow for a prior meeting um, with your public safety committee, which we had earlier this year. And finally, we have an opportunity, and we have, um, although have been challenged by the pandemic, but pre-pandemic, we were able to meet with your Santa Cruz community members, uh, any, um, any groups such as the NAACP, the UC Santa Cruz NAACP chapter, uh, the ACLU chapter. We have met either in person or virtually with all of those individuals over the past year um, and hope to meet and engage with them again, perhaps in response to this report. So while this report isn't intended to be a presentation to council, uh, and your larger community who have tuned in. We realize that uh, people may be busy during the day, so we always make ourselves available to meet with any group, and we've already had some invites on follow-up with regard to uh, this report uh, from some of those groups, and we'll be meeting with them, but 
we felt that our primacy uh, our, was important to meet with you all first. Can we go to the next slide, please? So that just sort of sums up what I just said on another slide. Um, the quantity of work here was 13 investigations that we reviewed and talked about in our report. There were two administrative investigations and there were two other matters involving policing performance <coughs> that didn't come in as a formal complaint, but we, that we did review as well. Um, and that's the sum of our work. We're gonna just spend a few more minutes talking about some of the high level uh, observations we made uh, with regard to this report. Um, if we could go to the next slide. And I'm gonna turn this over to my colleague, Ms. Marion. Cameron? Good afternoon, Mayor, council members, and members of the public. Um, I'd like to share with you a few observations we had as we reviewed the complaint investigations and also worked with the police department last year. Um, the department's been cooperative and receptive to our role as auditors. And there are lots of other jurisdictions where we don't have that type of uh, rapport. So that was absolutely a positive. Uh, they provided us prompt access um, to their files and their investigations have been thorough and their conclusions have been sound. Um, they also had an internal review process that was thoughtful and uh, a, a process by which they were making their own internal recommendations. Again, these are, are, are positives that sometimes we don't see in other jurisdictions. Um, our review process also enabled us to make recommendations to improve the process. And we made 26 recommendations, and they largely were about the complaint process. Uh, we made several recommendations to address the timeliness of complaint investigations. And, you know, we suggest a system that accurately logs in the complaints and that there's a process by which uh, they can be reviewed and monitored, and then there's a timely completion. Um, and we observed through our recommendation process that the department now is taking significant steps to address some problems in the past and this progress um, on older cases and incoming complaints, we, we're seeing um, some positive progress. Uh, we also made some recommendations to enhance uh, the, the rapport with complainants and such as a prompt interview of complainants and that complainants be notified in a timely manner, not only about the conclusions, but about when there are reforms or a learning that's occurred that complainants are aware of that positive process that's, that has come out of, um, of the complaint process. We also identified some aspects of the department's investigation and review of critical incidents that could be enhanced. Uh, for example, prompt interviews of involved officers during critical incidents. And the other aspect with doing this complaint review is we're able to make policy and training uh, recommendations when there's on particular topics. Um, so in one of our cases that really involved a proxy by bias, we were able to look at that case and see ways in which the department could enhance their training and their procedures. And when we talk about uh, bias by proxy, we're talking about times when community <coughs> members call in and, and are requesting service, sometimes those complaints or the, the request for service is ill-informed. Sometimes, sadly, it's by explicit bias. And there is a call for a better training, a better response. And so part of our recommendations was for the police department to have an actual policy and some training on this particular topic. Throughout the year, as we've met with the department again, we found them receptive to our, our recommendations and then they're in the process of actively uh, re reviewing and addressing some of the other additional recommendations. So thank you for this opportunity to provide you an overview of our annual report. And of course, we're interested in any questions that you may have. Thank you. Does that conclude your presentation? There are, are the high level uh, recommendations there on the next to last slide, and I think we just have a question. That sums up what Ms. Marion just told you. And then we'll go to the last slide. Can you push the microphone closer to your mouth, please? Of Thank course. You. Thank you, Mayor. Um, a judge just told me that this morning, so it's the second time I've been <laughs> reprimanded for that. But I wanted everyone to hear me, so I appreciate that. Um, but that does sum up. We are obviously here uh, to answer any questions you might have. I would just emphasize that if we had to sum up the biggest challenge that the police department had, it had to do with getting investigations done on time. And um, we, the, the great bulk of our recommendations were intended to ensure that investigations don't lay follow because 
um, if under state law, if investigations aren't completed within a year, even if, if there's a violation of policy, um, there can be no d discipline against the officers uh, if it's not completed within a one-year period. And we have found cases that have fallen out of that one-year statute. Um, it was um, mostly a performance issue of one individual within the police department, and I'll have the chief comment. He can obviously comment differently than me on that, but that has been resolved. The new sergeant has begun to catch up on the backlog, which was considerable, was considerable, but um, that has been rectified, and um, there have been new controls placed in the system to make sure that doesn't happen again. Just as an example, I understand that the sergeant and the chief meet bi-weekly uh, where the chief is apprised of the status of every investigation so that this, this doesn't happen again, recur, reoccur. Mayor, that's all we have. Thank you so much. I will uh, bring it out to my colleagues for questions and uh, any comments before we go to public comment. Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor, thank you for the report. I really appreciate hearing from you and the, the report was very thorough and, um, and, and does reflect uh, some of the, the things you said about the, the positive experience of working with the Santa Cruz Police Department. I was pleased to see it and hear it. I'm not surprised. Um, and I, so I th guess I wanted to ask, and this is kind of a question I want because I'd like to get your perspective, but I also maybe would ask this uh, of the chief. Um, so the report itself uh, is, is very clear and provides some, some really helpful information, and there are recommendations. And in some ways, it reads like a, a, a grand jury report with no responses, right? So um, <laughs> we're, um, we're looking at the recommendations that are being made. I'm hearing you say uh, you have a good working relationship, that you're in conversation about um, policy and about the complaints. Um, but in terms of how we on the council and members of the public understand to understand that, um, you know, how that's going. Um, so we know that we know what we, you know, we know what we've been told today, but we know that things are, are that, that you're working on stuff, right? That the, and the SCPD is taking this seriously. And um, so I, I guess I'm just wondering from your perspective how we might um, better do that. And I'd love to also just hear from um, Chief Escalante if you have a moment any thoughts you might have on how it is that we can use this information to say, well, we got the report and we just heard that it's, things are being worked on. Just something more detailed or, or direct. Yes, uh, through the mayor, um, Council Member Brown, thank you for that question. Um, what I can tell you is, um, I can tell you what other, how other jurisdictions respond to the questions that you've raised. So. In some jurisdictions, for example, in the city of Palo Alto, where we have been the auditor for a decade and a half, um, they have recently come up with a system whereby once we issue recommendations, there is an, a, a, an expectation that the police department will respond in a way to tell you all, the elected body or the elected body of Palo Alto, whether they agree with the recommendations and whether they intend to implement them or not. And that's one way in which you can have more uh, information about, you know, to the degree that the recommendations have been accepted, will they be implemented? Some of them may not reoccur as regularly, so we'll not know, so, you know, we'll not know until another similar incident happens, God forbid, before some of the recommendations end up becoming uh, real. But some are more uh, things that can be done now if, in fact, the police department is agreeable. The other thing that we will do in our next report to the degree that our earlier recommendations are relevant, we'll be commenting on them ourselves in the next report. Thank you. I'd like to invite Chief Escalante. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Bruner and Council. Um, one thought that comes to mind is uh, a report back to the Public Safety Committee, potentially. Um, I think the the challenge here was the timing of the public safety committee getting, or we discussed the report, you know, six months ago or more, um, and then we're just now getting an opportunity to present it publicly and, and to all of you. 
and to comment on the recommendations before all of council got the opportunity to see the report seemed a little out of line. So I think just this particular year with COVID challenges and stuff, timing has been off. And, and I think uh, uh, an opportunity for us to report back to the Public Safety Committee if that's sufficient on, on the recommendations. Thank you, that's, that's very helpful. Can, since you, can I also bring up just for members of the public, I believe if there is um, the process to file a complaint is on the transparency portal of the city website, is that correct? Yes, uh, there's a few different avenues. There's a written form at the police department in the lobby. There's also online with the uh, transparency portal. Okay, and there's more information there, I think. Um, I know I received a couple of questions about who the auditor is and um, kind of that role. So I would encourage anyone to get that information from the lobby or the transparency portal online on the city website. On the police department's website, the I believe. Police, yeah, city of Santa Cruz police yeah, department yeah. website. Thank you, Council Member Myers. Can you, I'm sorry, Chief. Can I ask you one more question? There was um, 26 recommendations, and you know, looking through the report, it seemed like some may, um, you know, require some initial or immediate, more immediate kind of addressing addressing those versus others. And I'm just wondering if you know, you have a sense of priorities. For example, the um, bias-based, you know, pol policing policy, um, it, it showed up, I think, in one particular incident, and there was a recommendation to, um, to really look at that, um, trying to reevaluate um, and develop additional training on to prevent bias by proxy. So I'm looking at one of those and saying, you know, that seems like a fairly important update to training, but I'm just curious, how do you look at these 26 recommendations and prioritize them in terms of training, information management, all of those? And just curious if you have a idea on how you do that, would do that in this case. Um, I think probably the highest priority for me would be policy that requires a, an immediate change at the, at the staff level that's happening every day, every night. Th those are the most immediate uh, priorities for me. Um, the training one is always a priority. We always try to put together a long list of quality training for our staff. Um, this report, I think, came out in March. Um, we're actually just hoping to go into our first training season this fall. So that would be the opportunity, our first opportunity, unfortunately. We weren't doing training um, like we normally do in the spring because of COVID and bringing staff together in one room. So that would be our, our earliest opportunity to address that. Um, honestly, there were some recommendations in there that were, um, I was disappointed to hear that weren't already happening and should be happening uh, and should have been occurring. Um, and sometimes it's just, we've always done it that way and it wasn't necessarily in policy or on paper, uh, but it was always understood to, to happen, uh, such as you know interviewing people as quickly and promptly as possible. So um, there's some recommendations that I think we fixed the moment we saw them. Okay, thank you, and thank you for the report. Yeah. Very thorough. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Um, Chief, I wonder if uh, with any of these recommendations in particular around training, if, we, if there's opportunity to um, work across jurisdictions in our county and leverage resources. Um, I know that you have a chief's uh, meeting or committee that meets regularly. So how much are other communities doing this and how much is there opportunity to kind of join forces to respond to the recommendations? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And we do collaborate with other training managers in the county uh, when possible, especially when we bring in outside, res outside resources, uh, instructors that are gonna cost us a lot of money, we kind of share that, that, that responsibility. So we always do look to try to come together when, when it works out. Sometimes it's just, it's hard to line up our calendars. Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. And I just wanna, one, um, thank the city staff and uh, the Public Safety Committee because I believe this is the first time that the, the auditor's report has been presented publicly in the 
passed, it's been in closed session, and a lot of members of the public were saying, why isn't this being presented publicly so we can have enough sense of you know, what's happening with our police department? And I think it's just a really good opportunity for us to see um, you know, what's going well, where there are areas for improvement, and then allows us and members of the public to um, just you know, support the recommendations or see where we can, where there's areas for improvement. So I just want to express my appreciation um, for the transparency of, of this department and, um, and the willingness of that transparency. Um, I just wanted, because I had a similar um, question related to um, Councilmember Brown's um, suggestions and questions around um, providing feedback on the recommendations, because I did find that with the, the one case that came up around um, the biased call, um, you know, one thing that, that we had passed back in 2020 was the discriminatory reports to law enforcement ordinance. And this seems like a really good opportunity for us to see, you know, how we can make that ordinance more effective because, and this is just for the members of the public, but one of the whereas is, is uh, discriminatory law enforcement reports against people of color for racially motivated reasons are common enough that many people of color have experienced one or more incident of being contacted by law enforcement when engaging in normal day-to-day -day activities. These in incidents cause serious harm to the person falsely accused of a crime, cause anxiety and distrust among people of color, and put an unnecessary strain on our law enforcement officers responding to frivolous calls, with frivolous and false calls. And you know, the fact that this was an instance where there were two African Americans, one white person at a storage unit that were unloading um, property from the storage unit into a van, that's you know, a normal day-to-day -day activity. And it's you know, the result of the call coming in and then officers responding to it is kind of the situation that we have before us. Um, and then to Councilmember Kalantari Johnson's point, I know that the Sheriff's Department passed something recently too around prohibiting discriminatory calls. And so it seems like you know, this could be an opportunity where if the recommendation is to come up with a policy, we already have a policy in place. Now we have to just kind of figure out how we can get that policy communicated you know, with dispatch to the officers and then the officers being able to respond. So I just thought it was really great that you know, we can have this before us and, and kind of see that you know, by us coming together, there's, there's a, we're actually working on a lot of these um, issues. Um, so that's, that's just a comment I wanted to make on this. Um, uh, and so I guess I really didn't have any questions aside from you know, whether or not um, providing some direction on bringing back responses, if that would be appropriate. Um, it sounds like it could go to the Public Safety Committee. One thought I had was whether or not we could bring this, the recommendations, the responses to the re recommendations back at the beginning of January or middle of January. That way when the new council sits, it's an opportunity for them to learn about this process and hear about what the police are doing to uh, respond to the recommendations. Yeah, and I was gonna mention that um, to your point about the bias by proxy incident, and I think that was one of a few incidents that uh, motivated the, the new ordinance. I think, if I'm not mistaken, the timing. Keep in mind here, this report, uh, because of the pandemic and other issues, uh, includes cases, I think, all the way back to 2019, if I'm not mistaken. So um, I'd have to look back to be 100% certain, but I think this particular call and a couple others is really what motivated that sort of conversation and ultimate ordinance that, that all of you, I believe, passed. So, um, yeah, and then, uh, you know, we, we could certainly add that to the, the agenda for the Public Safety Committee early in, in the year of 2023. And then um, I guess the one other question I had was around the investigations being done in a timely manner. Is that largely related to the fact that we've had such, we've had a lot of issues with staffing in the police department and a lot of vacancies and because of that, you know, people are being stretched pretty thin. So I'm just wondering kind of what might be driving that. Yeah, you know, I, I think there was a lot of factors behind it. Um, and so, you know, ultimately um, it, it falls on me and, and it's my responsibility to make sure that, that it doesn't happen. So, um, you know, again, we can get into a lot of the reasons and who, what, why and point fingers, but, um, at this point, it's my responsibility, so uh, it needs to change. And I think you'll see the next report will be much more robust because uh, we're sending cases almost on a daily basis to, to the, the group, and they're already trying to figure out how to incorporate it into a report because we've really done, um, Sergeant Hoppy specifically has really done 
a lot of work. We also made efforts to, uh, we brought in two independent contractors that we assigned cases to, to help us get caught up, which we're not doing at this point. We don't feel like we need to continue it, but that was one of the many measures we put in place. Um, I also want to touch real quickly. We also, as an organization, I think it's every year or every other year, we have required implicit bias training that is required to all of our staff. And some of that, you know, a part of that training includes some of this uh, bias by proxy sort of situations that we try to avoid. Great, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Are there any other questions from Council Members? Okay. Seeing none, I will at this time now take it out for public comment. Um, if you are joining us here in person, please line up here at the, f at the front of the dais. And if you are joining us uh, virtually, please raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone or choosing the raise hand webinar feature on your computer. All right, we have one person in person here. Welcome. Um, <clears throat> my name is Lee Brokaw. Um, I'm uh, on the board of the ACLU locally. I'm chairman of the Police Accountability and Transparency Committee, and I'm not allowed to speak for the ACLU, so I'll be speaking for myself. Um, I would like to welcome both Mike and Samara. I know both of them. Um, uh, Martin Bernal asked Peter and I to meet with Mike to talk about uh, hiring a full-time um, auditor when Mike was, uh, was our uh, interim auditor and I think after you left the room um, we said you've got one you don't need to go hire another one. Um, I've read this report and um, I initially wrote myself a question of the date that Andy left, but then I realized that even though this report is coming to us in August, it was in March. So everything that was in here is, as I understand, is on Andy's watch. Um, and I wanted uh, uh, the chief to know that anything I say, I'm not saying about uh, the time that he's responsible. Um, I would like to ask um, OIR, if they would put in the complaints the date of the complaint and the date of the resolution of the complaint. It's a little hard for a civilian to tell um, if there, all these complaints occurred one right after another or over a period of time. And from a civilian understanding, I, I think that would um, really help. Um, I see a recommendation to convene a uh, use of force board. And I also see that the parameters of who sits on that board are not, uh, at least not in this report. And I would like to ask council, Mike, Sam, and Bernie, if there is a position for a civilian on the use of force board, I volunteer, please. Um, there's one complaint in here that I find very troubling. Um, I speak to police departments as a citizen when I see officers breaking the law. And I call it to their attention because they're not watching that officer when I am. And it's just like when people call me up and say, my crew is acting up on a job and I'm not there. I'm thankful to have somebody tell me about misbehavior. And my response to the police is always, if you will lead, the people will follow. We have an officer who drove against traffic on Highway 17. Your, that is your time. And Thank that you. is unconscionable. Feel free to email us or contact us for further comment. Okay, is there anyone else in person that would like to comment on this item? I will look to our virtual attendees. 
I see a few hands raised. And the first name I see is Reggie Meisler. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Uh, thank you. Um, I mean, in my personal view, and I'm sure uh, you're not surprised knowing who I am, um, I feel that our current form of police and prisons are so rooted in exploitation and oppression at this point that <clears throat> they should just be abolished and sort of reimagined uh, the concept of public safety from the ground up. Um, I mean, there's some sort of like fundamental issues that as Mayor Cummings, or sorry, Council Member Cummings has cited, police response to people of color in the unhoused. I mean, we already have training for uh, implicit bias and people, we've had training for that for years everywhere and it just doesn't do anything. So I think it's just a little bit of reflection would be nice there, but sort of getting back to where we are today, I think I have several questions. If investigations aren't completed within a year, we are told that police can avoid accountability for complaints made against them. Um, given the well-known issue of the blue wall of silence, how are we supposed to take seriously that the checks and balances of just like the sheriff or chief Escalante uh, getting through these? <clears throat> for instance, what will happen to chief Escalante if he does not get through these complaints? That's my question. Um, and then uh, I had some problem with the police auditor didn't really give as much transparency as I would expect. He didn't provide the name and badge number of police officers who received complaints against them. <clears throat> and, uh, and it felt like a lot of the data was very flat, aggregated and obscured. So I'm not sure the benefit of this being told to the public if we don't have all the details. I think at this point, I mean, if we want to do something and you guys don't want to abolish stuff, like, fair enough. But I mean, it seems like you at least need the ability, the ability to elect and recall individual police officers. I mean, you need some amount of democratic accountability. It just doesn't like makes sense that you could give these people the power to kill you and you don't think we should be able to recall them like a city council member can't kill you but you can recall them so i just don't i mean this person can restrain you they can jail you they can take your rights away and they can take your life away it's just insane to me that we think that <clears throat> writing a complaint that can just disappear in a year is good enough <laughs> Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public is the name Serge Cogno. Go ahead and raise your, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead and press star six to unmute. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. My name is Serge Cagno, and as the co-chair of the county's Mental Health Advisory Board, I'd like to thank Councilmember Cummings' report on the Criminal Justice Council, their upcoming report, and the compilation of some data points on behavioral health calls for service from our county's law enforcement departments. Yet there's more specific data which the city could collect. Regarding the police auditor report, I thank Mr. Janako and Ms. Marion's work. I truly appreciate that we have an independent auditor not all cities in our county do. In fact, at this time, the county has not yet implemented theirs. With 988's recent implementation to make getting support for behavioral health crisis more accessible and timely, and 988's state and federal recommendations for more mental health mobile crisis services to respond to those calls, I would make the request that the city council consider having our police auditor add a section in the yearly report regarding city specific information on behavioral health responses and outcomes of calls for service for 988 calls routed to 911, for non-emergency calls, and for mental health liaison outcomes for callbacks and field responses. Data could include number numbers of calls in each of those three sections, responder type and numbers, call type, and outcomes of referrals made. Regarding bias by proxy, 
I appreciate Mr. Janaka's recommendation to implement bias by proxy trainings. I would also suggest the inclusion of data in future police auditor reports of types of bias by proxy, including gender, race, LGBTQI, homelessness, and disabilities, including mental health and substance use disorders. I would ask for explanation of the discrepancy between the racial bias ordinances, financial consequences on a caller, which City Council Cummings referred to, and the recommendation in the report for a restorative justice approach to following up with the caller. I thank the City Council for their focus on compassionate and effective trauma-informed services and oversight. Thank you for your comment. Our next uh, member of the public is the name I Am Watching You. You can press star six. Yes, hello. Yeah, I wasn't going to speak to this, but since you brought it up, this uh, law about the, uh, I don't know, racist 911 calls or, or something, you know, we went through that and you never did uh, justify that uh, that ordinance because it's very clear that the Supreme Court case of uh, Brandenburg versus Ohio defined what isn't free speech and it is uh, creating an eminent incitement of violence and harm. Uh, otherwise, offensive speech is protected speech, okay, period. Uh, and I don't see how you can cause a police officer to arrive somewhere without using speech unless, uh, I don't know, what, sign language? I don't know. So uh, it, it's a it's a it, an end around uh, the, our constitution, you know, and uh, I'm curious. Uh, and false police reports, of course, are already covered by other laws. And uh, I I just wonder, uh, do you have any convictions for this yet? Has it done anything? That's my question there. Anyway, um, thanks for taking my call. Thank you for your comment. Our next caller is phone number ending in 4844. You can press star six to unmute yourself. Ready? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, this is interesting to me because I remember when the, we actually had a weak but more effective than uh, an auditor, a citizen's police review board from uh, in the 90s. And this was, this was eliminated by a conservative council, but it had far more power than the, the current uh, uh, IPA. It had, and, and what you have here, I mean, I would echo the concerns of Lee Brockow, Reggie Meisler, uh, regarding the fact that, uh, you know, you should be sure dotting your I's and crossing your T's instead of dealing with basic stuff, which has to do with accountability and transparency by the police department. And without the information, there can't be that. This is the first year, as uh, one of the IPA people has said, that this report has been made public. Well, I'd like to see uh, how, the, how the money was spent from 2003 to 2021, when you had a so-called independent police auditor who gave the city council secret reports, and the public didn't get to view them. So that, I think, is something that needs to be made public as it reveals really the extent of ongoing abuses that have been ignored, how likely the police department is to respond to concerns. I mean, once you get people being shot dead in national publicity and it being clearly a racial situation, then you get uh, temporarily action. People hustle to do a little whitewashing and cover things up. And that's Santa Cruz's police department is, is really no exception. Police uh, folks, the blue folks, def defend their own, understandably, sort of a guild defense. Anyway, uh, the IPA has not met with any uh, homeless civil rights organizations, and they're often the people, homeless folks, who get the most flack. And I would invite the two of them to get in touch with the Union of the Homeless, Food Not Bombs, and with Huff, Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom. But again, what power does the IPA have other than to make suggestions? A lot of these suggestions are good suggestions. But they have no force. And by the way, that horrible bell that you ring with is very offensive, Mayor Brunner. It is rude to people who are on the phone. It discourages them. I know you want to shut us up, you know, and the time limit, even though there's plenty of time for people to finish their sentences, even their paragraphs. So I will leave it at that. And I will say that unless you've got the power 
It is uh, a pointless exercise. It is a pantomime. It is the appearance of action rather than action, and it's uh, not good. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public is the name Io. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, uh, can everyone hear me? Yes, welcome. Hi, welcome, y'all. Um, yes, my name is Ayo Banjo, um, and I'm the California Hawaii NAACP uh, Vice President, uh, speaking on behalf of myself today. Um, I just wanted to call in about this uh, auditor report. Now, uh, Michael Ganako, uh, it's good to see you as well. Um, we all had a conversation uh, a few years ago about the police auditor's role and the fact that we felt like the role was very toothless, um, that they had very little power, that they were really just there to um, make suggestions. And I do want to see um, a more comprehensive conversation that goes on between um, the auditor's role um, as well as uh, uh, Chief Escalante around ways to expand the uh, power and authority of the uh, police auditor's role. Um, I just feel that um, if we gave them more investigatory powers and we're able to uh, give them and equip them with more resources um, and a little bit more authority, um, that these recommendations can really be stipulations. And um, I think it's kind of weird that the police, ex that we expect the police to police themselves when they're the ones that make those mistakes and expect for those investigations to like, you know, somehow come out on time. Um, we, we cannot continue the same system um, and expecting the people who, you know, you know, a lot of times have fraternities called the Brotherhood Fraternity um, of Police. Um, how we expect them to also, you know, hold hold each other accountable. It's a little bit difficult for me to, to understand that. So um, I do think that we need to have a much more stronger police utterance role. Um, I do um, respect um, Michael Ganako's leadership, um, and I think that he is doing a good job, and I think that we should continue to equip his office with the resources that they need um, to really uh, tackle these issues. I also believe um, that uh, Chief Escalante um, really does need to sit down with other um, groups and organizations across the community um, to understand how to reduce the, um, the violence that we see done to low poverty uh, folks. Um, we know that police don't even want to police um, homeless folks, and we know that we need to have another separate system. Um, I think it was mentioned a 988 system um, to address mental health issues. Um, I'd love to see the status update about those conversations um, with, um, around trying to bring in more behavioral health liaisons um, and basically create a whole new um, emergency response um, agency within the Department of Health and Human Services to be able to respond to those issues um, instead of it being a partnership between them and police. Um, so I would love to see that kind of idea built out. And ultimately, honestly, I just want to see more research and data-driven approaches to understanding how to really um, lower crime. Um, I just feel like we feel we continue the same traditions of trying to address criminality, um, and we don't really we see that it fails a lot of times, and I don't feel like we're data-driven around the outcomes. So those are just things I want us to consider. Um, and thank you for the time. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember Cummings, for your uh, comments. Um, I do hope to see a more comprehensive um, report very, very soon. Thank you so much for your comment. Our next member of the public is the name Sabina Holber. Go ahead and unmute. Um. Um, thank you for bringing this up to council. I think it's really, really important to make sure that we are auditing the police and we are looking at these things. I want to encourage anyone listening to go read the full report. It's really worth your time, but, um, you know, it's 35 pages. It's not as dense as it looks. Um, but I wanted to read one paragraph straight from the report because it really struck me as honestly just like very sad and something that we we should be looking at our police to be helping our community. Um, so this was the case in which the detainee did end up dying. Um, so just quote, another topic for department consideration involves the officer's initial view that the detainee was faking his medical distress. When the officers pulled the non-responsive detainee out of the patrol vehicle, they attempted to have him stand upright and he collapsed onto his knees. They continued to assume the detainee was fading his symptoms, report, repeatedly ordering him to stand up. One officer told him, stop, you were fine five minutes ago, stand up. To their credit, they summoned medical assistance. However, when the jail nurse arrived, they told her he's pretending to be unresponsive and explained that he had been screaming the whole way to the jail until they opened the door to remove him from the patrol car. 
The IPA recommends that the department debrief with the involved officers about this case, including their incorrect assumption that the detainee was feigning his medical distress as well as the other issues raised by the department's and IPA's review. Um, honestly, if you read that paragraph and you don't get sad about it, I, I just don't know what to say. It's truly depressing that this officer would not take the medical situation seriously in this case. Again, they died shortly after this. Um, and I really just hope that there's more empathy from the police about the community members that they're interacting with, that they stop making assumptions that people aren't in medical distress or don't have problems to be taken seriously. Um, and again, I would recommend that everybody read this report in its full length. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I'm not seeing any other hands raised for uh, agenda item number 18. This is a report on the independent from the independent police auditor. Um, so seeing no further public comment, I will bring it back to council for action and deliberation. Council member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to thank everyone who's called in and again, thank our police chief and our uh, city police officers and staff and our independent auditor um, for increasing transparency around this topic. Um, it's obviously something that's very important. And again, this is the first time we've had this report um, presented in public. And I think um, a lot of folks have been able to acknowledge some really good work that's been done and then opportunities for improvement. Um, so, and given the that there's been some concerns coming up around um, responses to the recommendations, um, I've prepared a motion um, and I've sent it over to Bonnie. Um, the motion would be to accept the report and direct staff to bring back a response to the recommendations provided by the police auditor by no later than the first meeting in February 2023. Um, I think it, like this kind of forum and having these responses presented at the city council meeting just provides our full council with an opportunity to see what's going on and, and be able to make some decisions and work with um, law enforcement in case there's an opportunity for us to create a subcommittee to further investigate some of these items. And so um, just thought that this would be, you know, provide a, an adequate timeline as well, given that um, it's August and this would be almost six months before this would come back. And then after the motion, I have a couple comments I wanted to make as well. Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? And then we can go to discussion. Uh, yeah, I will second that. And if I could just say, um, I, I want to thank the, um, the police chief for suggesting uh, taking this through the Public Safety Committee, and I, I do think that's a space to have those conversations and and really kind of work through how to um, how to make this process effective, more effective than um, you know, and just continuous improvement in that spirit. Um, but I do think that the it would be great given where we're at for the for the council to have uh, an update as well and have that on our public agenda. Um, but in general, I do think the Public Safety Committee can be a space for, for that ongoing conversation. So that's why I'm supporting this motion now. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Brown. So we have a first by Council Member, a motion by Council Member Cummings, seconded by Council Member Brown. And um, I will uh, open it up for any further questions or comments. Um, but I did have a question. There were a couple of uh, uh, comments brought up from the members of the public um, and and that kind of res revolved around adding additional responses and I'd like to invite the independent auditor to speak to how that process uh, works on your end um, for adding additional data to the report. Thank you for the question, Mayor. Um, there are some restrictions um, as a result of state law confidentiality provisions that limit what we can talk about. And I think it's important to educate your public on those. Um, 832.7 of the Penal Code, which has been around for 50 years, um, does not allow auditors or anyone else, quite frankly, uh, to disclose the names of individuals who are the subjects of internal investigations as part of the Peace Officer Bill of Rights. 
confidentiality provisions. Um, so that information uh, is intentionally not included, uh, otherwise the city would be in violation of state law. We do a legal review, we send our confidential draft to the city attorney to make sure we're not violating any confidentiality provisions, but it is a balance between uh, an interest in transparency and then the state law privacy protections that currently, at least, um, police officers have. And so that's the challenge and the tension that we're continually trying to maneuver and, and navigate. But we, you know, we appreciate um, the opportunity to at least tell the story. Um, this is what was, you know, a, a, a community member was complaining about. This is how uh, the department handled it. And this is uh, the outcome. So that for the first time in ever, probably, your community at least has an opportunity to see these are the kinds of things that came in over this one year period. And this is how the department handled it, good, bad, or ugly. Thank you, appreciate that clarification and information. Um, I, and there was another question. Um, um, well, I, I also am in agreement with Council Member Brown and, and Chief Escalante brought up the Public Safety Committee as a, a, a location that would continue and um, hear the report and the recommendations. When does that, do you know offhand when that next meets? I, um, I'll invite Chief Escalante to the podium. I actually was just trying to look it up on my calendar and I can't seem to find, it, they're scheduled out every month for emergency reasons, so, but typically we meet quarterly, so I was trying to figure out which one was set in stone, so I it's apologize, I don't have that, yeah, yes, yes. Okay. I believe we meet in January and then in February, but I apologize, but don't quote me on that, I can find out though. Great, and so with the motion that's on the table, um, would it be helpful to kind of arrange it that our council hears um, a report back after the Public Safety Committee has had a chance to review? Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll do what, what you would prefer, but in my mind, uh, as much as I understand process for all of you, if we can, uh, do the first step with the Public Safety Committee, and maybe there's additional questions or clarifying uh, issues that they want answered before it comes to, to all of you. Okay. That might be um, just as far as process, but. Great, I appreciate that, thank you. Um, let's see, are there uh, other council members with any questions or comments? This is, um, okay. So we, you have a comment? Yeah. I, Council I, member coming? Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to get through making the motion before I made my comments. Um, one thing I did want to add, one of the members of the public uh, was asking about kind of tracking calls, like non-emergency calls and how those are handled. And one thing I will point out is that this year, through the work that's being done with the Criminal Justice Council and trying to assess how many calls are being made, their mental behavioral health and the outcomes of those calls. Um, some of those police codes have been changed with the, um, the dispatch office. And so this November, we'll get a sense of how uh, we're able to track those calls. And I think that um, if there's interest in members of the public to have us continually tracking that data, it could be an opportunity for us to have that discussion, get some feedback from the different law enforcement agencies on how tracking those calls have gone. And maybe that's something that we can continue doing continue to do moving forward and if it's in the interest of it being kind of like county level um, maybe what we can do is have that conversation with the criminal justice council get a sense of how much that would cost and maybe that could be a body that could do that ongoing work um, so just something that came to mind regarding that call and then um, i will also acknowledge there was um, some interest that's come up especially around this individual that was in medical distress but there was also interest in policies around medication and transportation policies. So if somebody is being arrested and let's say they have medication in their vehicle, ensuring that that medication can, can um, go with the individual as they're being um, booked was something that's come up as well. And so 
I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to continue to improve, um, and I'm happy to, to work with members of the public on that. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. And just for clarification for the public, the uh, Criminal Justice Council is a countywide uh, organization that meets, and the Public Safety Committee that was mentioned is a city committee. Um, and so we're happy to provide more information on those bodies as well. Okay, thank you for your comments. Thank you for the information. Uh, we have a motion uh, from Council Member Cummings, seconded by Council Member Brown. And may we have a roll call vote, please? Council Member is Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Boulder is absent. Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkin? Aye. Mayor Bruno? Aye. That motion passes unanimously with Council Member Golder absent. Thank you. Mayor, can we get a so at this time, we will take a short bio break and um, we will return at 225 to Council to continue with item number 19. Item number 19 will be the quarterly homelessness response update. Thank you. Right. Thank you. We are now resuming our August 23rd, 2002 Santa Cruz City Council meeting. Next up on our agenda is item number 19, Homelessness Response Update. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you wish to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Please note that public comment period for the below will be both for 19.1 and 19.2. Public comment will be limited to no more than a total of 30 minutes and each speaker will have two minutes. The order will be a presentation of items 19.1 and 19.2 by staff, followed by questions from council we will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. At this time, we have our presenters of this item, Larry Mwale, our city homelessness response manager is here with us in person and we will receive an update regarding council-directed homelessness response programs and services, including the Homelessness Response Action Plan and implementation details, objectives, and outcomes. Welcome, Larry. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mayor and members of the council. Can you hear me all right? Good afternoon, Larry Mwale, Homelessness Response Manager. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a two-part staff report this afternoon, the first being an update on the homelessness response services and our homelessness response action plan, and then the second item, a report on the Bench Lines Restoration Project. Um, 
which I'll turn over to Deputy City Manager Lisa Murphy. So within the quarterly updates, uh, there's four broad uh, topic areas that we'll cover. The first being uh, progress reports on the implementation of our Homelessness Response Action Plan, updates on regional collaboration related to homelessness, uh, then safe sleeping, One moment while we get screen sharing activated here. There we go. Thank you. Thank you for that. So as I was saying, there's a four parts to our agenda for the update, the quarterly update, uh, updates on the Homeless Response Action Plan, updates on the regional collaboration on homelessness, then updates on our safe sleeping and shelter programs and the camping services and standards ordinance, and then the fourth section is safe parking and other different size vehicle ordinance updates. So in the first section, um, implementation of the Homelessness Response Action Plan, just you know, for context again, back on March 8th, Council adopted our three-year Homelessness Response Action Plan that articulated five broad areas, building capacity and partnerships, permanent affordable and supportive housing, basic support services, including hygiene, sheltering, and storage, care and stewardship, and the fifth area of community safety. So through in the most two most recent quarterly updates uh, on March and in May, as we rolled out the three-year homelessness response action plan, began implementation, uh, one of the key areas was building internal capacity to be able to do this work. Um, and at the May, uh, the May meeting, uh, we outlined a number of positions uh, to build that infrastructure. Since that time, uh, we have completed recruitment and have hired and onboarded team members within this, the homeless response team for the city, uh, including a full-time uh, you know, homelessness services coordinator and three outreach and shelter specialists that equate, that are all part-time, equate two full-time equivalents. And we also hired a community relations specialist dedicated to homelessness response. In that time also, uh, the community service officers, the two positions uh, that were part of this plan, um, have been dedicated to work on homelessness-related topics. Presently, in, in the hiring process, uh, detailed in orange on your screen, are the positions related to the homeless respo homelessness response field division within public works. Um, a number of these positions were new, so we've created new job descriptions. That process has been completed, and now those positions are open for recruitment presently um, and hope to have uh, that team on board soon. Um, another key part of building internal capacity to do the city's homelessness response work is about building capacity around information systems in two key areas. First, data systems. Uh, to be able to track information on participants uh, that we're providing services to, either through the city's uh, direct programs or through contracts with partner agencies. And so in the last quarter, city staff and our contractor providers have gotten access to the Homeless uh, Management Information System, HMIS, uh, that is administered by the county. So those programs are now in that system and we're collecting client data, and that will allow us to be able to, as a system, track uh, contact, uh, connections to other service providers, and outcomes. Uh, so that's been a key um, accomplishment um, and next step in this process in the last three months. Another piece of that is a new countywide HMAS outreach module that's being piloted. And again, this is a tool uh, to use for persons uh, collecting information on persons who may be experiencing homeless who are not yet connected to a service provider. And this is sort of the opportunity to begin to gather that information 
um, get, do some initial assessment to be able to connect to uh, services and other providers. And this is being piloted as part of the Benchlands focused rehousing effort uh, that is underway in collaboration with the county and community partners. And so this is the first time it's been used. City outreach staff have been uh, integral into this implementation. Uh, they're responsible for, right now, there's about 155 persons who've been entered into the module. We're also an MH HMIS now, um, and that work's really been done uh, by the city outreach staff uh, at this point. And again, just from that, seeing who's already in HMS, what service connections they have, and that's really uh, enabling our partners, both in county programs and nonprofits, to begin to identify <coughs> where there's connections already um, where, for instance, somebody may have a voucher but doesn't have a housing navigator, so can really inform practice and work with uh, our homeless community. The other key area where we're building internal capacity is around budget and financial systems. Uh, for the first time, the city now has a new homelessness response budget division that was created for this fiscal year uh, that's really going to allow us to have an integrated budget that's cross department. <coughs> so that we can understand where our resources are going in a very holistic way um, and be able to, through the reporting structure that's being developed, to really uh, monitor costs, um, understand um, where our budget is, and be able to make those uh, analyses about where to best dedicate resources. Uh, some updates on, with respect to regional collaboration on the homelessness fronts. Uh, one broad area is on the Coral Street master planning process. Uh, the first part is uh, we've had a, we have planned a design charrette around the Coral Street that um, we identified at the last quarterly update. Uh, the RFP was released uh, and a vendor has been selected. That contract is nearing completion. It's with the Dolan Group and they uh, process for that work uh, with a consulting firm to lead this master planning design charrette will involve um, doing a number of stakeholder interviews in the community, uh, developing some alternative design and development scenarios, and then have facilitating a community um, input process around those to develop a preferred plan. So that work is uh, about to get started with the consulting firm. It's projected to be about a seven-month process, so we'd expect that to be completed uh, around the end of February. Can you just clarify the definition of the word charrette for members of the public? Um, I will do my best. Maybe somebody has a better definition. But um, it's, um, it's a facilitated process where you get input around, um, in this context, different designs and development scenarios so people can provide input and feedback. Uh, they take different forms. Some are done in a single session. Some play out over multiple days where that, you, know, you have that feedback and then new designs are developed and represented and it's sort of an iterative process. But fundamentally, it's facilitating a process of engaging and getting input from stakeholders on a design process. I hope that's sufficient. Thank you. So that will be getting underway uh, soon and should be complete in February, uh, according to the seven-month plan. Uh, the other key piece around the master planning process was the acquisition uh, of property at 125 Coral Street. This is the property immediately adjacent to the Housing Matters campus on uh, Coral Street, and it abuts the building that actually has the hygiene bay that is a city property. And what this property acquisition does is you know, it gives another piece to be included in that design process to think about what the potential uses are and what can be built out at scale at that campus through this process. So that was a key acquisition. Uh, the other element at Coral Street that's currently underway is uh, the hygiene bay remodel. Uh, that provides you know, shower services um, and hygiene services for uh, all the users at the Housing Matters campus. Uh, if you recall that that's been in much need of repair. They've been relying on portable shower trailers um, for quite some time. An RFP went out for that um, and a contract was awarded in June. 
uh, for that work and construction project is underway and that too is expected to be completed in February. So that will be a significant upgrade uh, and expand services on the Housing Matters campus there at Laurel Street. Um, other aspects of regional collaboration to give you some quick updates on first being the Housing for Health Partnership and this is the Regional Continuum of Care Organization. Uh, it launched under this new name uh, and this new governance structure back in April. Uh, the group meets the, the policy board, which is uh, responsible for high-level planning and uh, decision-making, meets quarterly. So there was a June meeting, and then we just met on August 17th last week. Um, some key actions that came, and informational updates that came out of those meetings. On June 8th, uh, the Housing for Health Partnership Board approved submission of a joint application for the Housing Homeless Assistance and Prevention Local Homelessness Action Plan to the Cal California Interagency <coughs> Council on Homelessness. Uh, that was a $6 million grant proposal, roughly. Uh, they also discussed updates um, that are being made to the coordinated entry system that are in process. So there was no action that came out of that. There is an operational committee that is working on uh, modifying and updating the uh, policies and procedures for coordinated entry. Um, and then they also shared the news, the successful home key application, uh, the grant award for the Veterans Village that took place this summer. And at last week's quarterly meeting, uh, the policy board ratified the submission of four California Emergency Solution Grant applications and also established and authorized um, a application review committee for the HUD's Continuum of Care uh, Notice of Funding Opportunity, or NOFO, applications that are due in September 30th. Most of that are the renew annual renewal grants of the existing um, HUD grant funding, but there's also a new notice of funding opportunity related to unsheltered and rural homelessness uh, for that will award up to about $300,000 a year locally. Uh, eviction prevention, um, again, back in April, um, collaboration with the county, uh, looking, at, uh, looking at efforts to be able to support and prevent, uh, prevent eviction. The city committed $150,000 uh, to support eviction prevention efforts um, and amended a contract with the Community Action Board uh, to implement that work. <coughs> that contract's been completed. The work is underway um, and do not have an update at this point in terms of how much has been spent and how many uh, families have been supported so far, but we'll bring an update on uh, the use of that $150,000 um, at the next quarterly update. Uh, we also released uh, an RFP for pre-development grant funding to support the development of permanent supportive housing, shelters, or transitional housing projects. Uh, we allocated up to $500,000 for this fund, expecting individual awards to be in the range of fifty dollars to $125,000. Uh, the application deadline was extended to September 9th. Um, and through this process, the staff has worked collaboratively with the county on developing uh, the application criteria, the rubric, and the, the partners in the review process. So um, the deadline is September 9th. We'll be reviewing those applications that come in on a quick timeline and hoping to be able to make grant awards uh, in October. Uh, and I mentioned a little bit briefly in the context of HMIS, HMIS and the new outreach module, but we also have an effort going around um, bench land service coordination, particularly with a rehousing focus related to the closure of the camp and the restoration of the park. So we're collaborating city, county, and nonprofit agencies to engage uh, everyone that is residing in uh, the bench lands uh, to do that outreach engagement, to see what service connections be made, work with them to develop their individualized rehousing plans. And so the first step is city staff is working and conducting a census of the persons uh, in the bench lands. That data is getting into the HMS outreach module. We're having weekly service coordination meetings with partner agencies to talk through this process, setting up a schedule with other uh, providers in the community, in the county programs, 
uh, will be operating and working down in the bench lands. There is a mobile office that's been placed uh, on the county property uh, right behind the county building uh, above the bench lands. That'll be a base of operations for service providers to work and meet persons to provide services and do those connections. Uh, and as I mentioned, the, the key piece about the data sort of systems integration here is identifying who's already um, in HMS, has been connected to service providers in the past, what information we have, to be able to really work and develop some individualized plans, as well as identify some strategies um, in terms of service needs. So like one I mentioned is, uh, there's a number of people that already have vouchers, housing vouchers, um, and so there's housing navigation resources, and so how do we make sure that we make those connections and uh, people are paired off so they can get that support to uh, utilize their voucher if ever possible. Uh, the other uh, piece of information, and this was presented at the uh, County Board of Supervisors uh, meeting on August 9th with the Housing for Health Division's uh, semi-annual update. Uh, it was also presented at the Housing for Health Partnership meeting last week. Uh, but the initial results from the point in time count that took place on February 28th uh, of this year. This is the HUD mandated uh, census that's required. Um, and this is the first uh, point in time count that's been completed since uh, 2019 as a result of the pandemic. Uh, more detailed uh, results will be available. The final report is going to be published in one to two months, according to the county, but um, some initial sort of broad or high level um, results uh, were shared at that meeting. So first, it shows the census showed an overall increase of homelessness in the county of 6% between 2019 and 2022. That's an increase from 2,167 to 2,299 people in Santa Cruz County. Uh, that's the overall um, population of persons experiencing homeless. Among those who are unsheltered, the increase was 4% between 2019 and 2022, from 1,700 to 1,774. Um, and then diving down a little bit into some of the findings, uh, there are some positive trends uh, based off the, the early data. Uh, there was a 59% decrease in homelessness among families with children under the age of 18. There was also a 94% decrease in unsheltered homelessness among families overall. Um, and then homelessness among youth aged 18 to 24 declined by 61% uh, overall um, and among those unsheltered. Uh, but these positive trends uh, and findings were tempered by some notable increases in other areas, specifically homelessness among veterans and people with disabilities that have experienced multiple or long episodes of homelessness. Uh, the data also indicated the number of chronically homeless people increased by 129% over the last three years from 403 to 921. Um, and the data also shows significant increases in the number of people with self-reported behavioral health and health problems that are experiencing homelessness. So more data will be available when the full report is released in a month or two, as I mentioned, and uh, we'll bring that information as part of our next quarterly report. Uh, updates on safe sleeping shelter and the CSSO. Uh, First, with transitional community camps, uh, specifically it's 1220 River Street. Again, it's been maintaining near full capacity. As soon as we have openings available, we've been able to identify people to fill those positions. So we've had uh, good enrollment and capacity uh, since we've opened this program back in January. Um, all participants have been participating in weekly case management meetings with city staff as required. Um, as I mentioned, we have this program enrolled participants enrolled in HMIS. Uh, there's access to on-site county benefit specialists that come to the 1220 River Camp. Um, and we also have weekly on-site behavioral health support for people. So those services are coming on-site for program participants. 
And just a few notable outcomes uh, since the last quarterly update. Uh, two people have obtained housing um, just a week and a half ago. Uh, one reunited uh, with family and moved out of the county in addition to that. Uh, overall, we have 10 uh, people uh, at 1220 River who have vouchers and are seeking housing. And I think one of the um, upsides of the service coordination that uh, we're in partnering with the county and uh, other nonprofit providers uh, through the Benchlands Rehousing, but having these conversations and data sharing, uh, through that conversation, we identified that we have a number of, that number of um, persons with vouchers. And so the county is going to work uh, specifically to see how to connect 1220 participants with uh, housing navigation. So that's been a, a really positive development to try to get people in a position to be able to utilize those vouchers. Uh, in addition, we've had one of the participants obtain full-time employment and two are actively seeking employment. Um, and related to that, part of that is the outcome of a lot of work and sort of getting people to have their vital documents in order and be able to make it through the employment process. Um, the, other, the other element of our uh, safe sleeping and shelter programming uh, is our programming up at the National Guard Armory, We're partnering with the Salvation Army. Uh, Paul, that the initial City Overlook program uh, was open in mid-May. That's a program that has space for 75 uh, persons. Uh, there's 24-7 program for 65 people in 10 spaces for overnight. Again, the program includes meals, transportation, um, showers, um, and uh, we reached full enrollment up at that program back in June, and it's been maintaining full enrollment since that time. Um, if you recall from the June 28th council meeting, um, authori authorized an expanded contract with Salvation Army to operate inside the armory building. The county had been operating their program uh, inside the building until, until June 30th, and when they closed that down, uh, the city started working on plans to open a program in that place. So the contract was approved. We've been working with Salvation Army uh, to get the contract signed and to get the program up and running and operational. We are getting close. Uh, we have weekly status uh, check-in meetings with Salvation Army. While we're waiting for the contract to be signed by corporate, but we've, uh, they have opened recruitment for their positions um, so that they can expand uh, this program. So that is moving forward. Um, like is the case in a lot of um, areas in the local employment sector, um, they're encountering labor supply challenges and finding sufficient qualified people um, for these positions. So that has delayed st the process a little bit as well. Uh, but they're also working with a temp agency to be able to fill positions um, and continue to move forward. So again, we hope to have that open in um, the month of September uh, in the next two to three weeks. Uh, some other updates on some of the safe sleeping and shelter expansion that we have discussed previous, in previous quarterly updates. We're continuing to work um, at shelter expansion at Housing Matters at Coral Street. Uh, we're now looking at using uh, the River Street Shelter property, uh, what has been the River Street Shelter. Uh, the condition of the building really does not make it cost effective to be able to rehabilitate it and remodel it. So the decision has been made to demo that building so that it could be utilized um, in other ways to support shelter expansion. So we're moving forward with that. Um, the process is underway. Um, uh, and then once that is completed, uh, the plan is to have Housing Matters operate a program at that site that the city will purchase uh, the uh, shelter structures, whether they be pallets or similar types of sleeping structures. The county will purchase those, and then the, uh, the city will purchase those, and the county will fund the program and operations at Housing Matters. And so that will serve up to 30 people. The specific number will really depend on the specific shelter product and uh, the configuration of that property. Um, 
again, we're, we continue to, the city continues to support the county in looking at uh, motel or hotel use through master lease options that can expand capacity. And specifically, the county is looking at uh, being able to expand uh, capacity by 80 to 100, uh, working with funding for, from the healthcare system to be able to support that program and operation at um, a local hotel. So that's in the works. And again, we continue to look at and discuss opportunities at other properties to be able to expand shelter in the city. Um, and again, as we'll report back at later times when there's something specific. Uh, the final area for updates in our quarterly update is safe parking in the oversized vehicle ordinance. And tier one is uh, operational. That is an overnight program. There are three spaces available at the Santa Cruz Police Department lot. Um, in, in operation, PD has really been making referrals to tier two um, because we have capacity there. And tier two is a 30-day program. So we still have that capacity. But while um, we have tier two space available, uh, trying to directly for, repeat refer people to a tier two where they can stay for at least 30 days on an overnight basis um, makes operational sense. So tier two is currently operating at lot four. There are six spaces at that uh, location. Uh, we do have expansion plans for other lots to be able to reach the 30 spaces that have been directed for a tier, for a tier two program by council. Um, and the locations that have been identified has the potential up to 48 spaces. Uh, some in the coastal zone, many outside the coastal zone. Um, and so uh, the final plans will depend on um, how uh, the ordinance moves through uh, the uh, Coastal Commission uh, to see what locations are available. But irrespective, we've got the ability to expand to the council director of 30. And again, presently, uh, enrollment is three persons in the Tier 2 parking, state parking program. <coughs> Uh, the Tier 3 is a full-time, 24-7 program that has case management, wraparound support services. Uh, we uh, entered into a contract with um, the Association of Faith Communities and uh, AFC in the free guide. Uh, that contract was approved by council in June. We've been working with them uh, to get that program operational. That will be operating at the Armory Building as well in the front area between the parking lot and the building. That's where the county's pavilion program was previously. Uh, so we've made infrastructure uh, modifications to bring electricity out to the front of the building, and get a mobile office placed um, to get that ready. Uh, AFC and Free Guide has hired their staff um, and has conducted their training. And they've already done outreach to identify a uh, first group of program participants. Um, there's uh, capacity in terms of their services for up to 24 vehicles. The actual number is going to be dictated by the size of the vehicles and what can fit on that space at any given time. Um, but they're ready to go and actually projected to start at the end of this week. Um, and then an update on the oversized vehicle ordinance. Coastal Development and Design Permitting process. Again, the council reviewed and approved the Coastal Development and Design Permit back on April 12th. Uh, there was an appeal to the Coastal Commission that was submitted. Most recently, the Coastal, Coastal Commission had an initial hearing on July 14th of this year, um, and they found that substantial issue exists with the Coastal Permit and that they will take action at a de novo hearing at a future date that has not yet been set. And that concludes our quarterly update, and I'll turn it over to Lisa Murphy for the second quarter. Thank you. So this is uh, Lisa Murphy, Deputy City Manager. 
and this will be an update uh, budget adjustment and refuse disposal abatement and landscape remediation contract <coughs> information good afternoon mayor council members the report I have before you is a bench sounds closure and restoration update and I'm also requesting a budget amendment the current situation in the bench land presents a significant threat uh, to the environment, to public safety, to health and welfare. We have an environmental crisis occurring in the camp. It, the degradation is along the riverbed has been immense. Uh, there's significant threat to public safety, health and welfare of the folks inside the camp, as well as in the surrounding community. Uh, despite uh, RP's best efforts, we've had rampant drug use, stolen property throughout the camp, it's, it's widespread. We've had many neighbors concerned for their safety and our employees no longer feel safe entering into the bench lands to do their work unless we have a police escort for them. Currently the cost to maintain the, the bench lands is approximately $66,000 a month and that doesn't include any of the staff time that's associated with that. Currently, our city outreach workers estimate approximately 225 campers. Bench lands, the closure proce process, key to the closure, it's contingent upon the Salvation Army opening up the shelter at the armory to create those bed spaces for those campers. Originally, the closure was targeted in July. However, the delay of has been caused by the opening of the, ar the armory. This is the additional? The inside. The inside That's additional correct. spaces. That's, OK, sorry for interrupting. No, thank you for the clarification. There's two locations up at the armory. I should have clarified. One's the, the overlook and then the inside. Okay. And the inside, as you recall, was formerly operated by the county. And it closed at the end of June. Uh, and so the, and now the city has um, entered into a contract. You approved the contract in June of this year. And as uh, uh, Larry stated, we're still waiting for them to execute the contract. But they are staffing up, and that's what we expect to open in September. Uh, again, the closure cannot begin until we have the, um, the armory open. And as you have probably seen and the members of the public have seen, we have begun some of the process of the closure. Uh, we began with fencing of the upper portion of the park that began last week, and it's expected actually to be concluded today or, or possibly tomorrow. The upper portion of the park will stay closed for the duration of the project. When the armory is open, there will be limited fencing will be installed in the lower bench lands, creating segments based on population. The closure will be a phased approach, which each of the segments closing contingent upon the offer of the alternative shelter options. If we do not have a shelter space available, we will hit the pause button and we will stop until we have identified available spaces. <coughs> Ongoing within the closure process, the city and the county, as you heard earlier, will still continue to work together to provide the services and create rehousing plans for individuals in the, in the bench lands. During the closure process, we will provide transportation services to the shelters and will provide assistance to those that may need the additional assistance. If somebody needs uh, ADA services, we will work to provide that for them. We will also provide storage facilities in the bench lands for those that might have left behind property and we'll create a process for the folks to retrieve that. And in the, while this process is going on, we will continue to maintain the existing services that are occurring in the park now. That includes uh, trash pickup, the showers, the toilets, uh, running water, the wash station, electricity. Those all will still continue. What I'm looking for today is a budget amendment in the amount of one million. The funding is from the California 14. The details of where that funding will be is contained on the screen above you there. I have it broken into two columns. We have one-time funding, and then we have the ongoing identified funding. 
And you can see for the one-time funding, includes fencing of the parks, transportation, uh, the cleanup and the abatement, which we're specifically looking for a contract approval today. Um, there is funds set aside for the a restoration project to begin, but that will not be enough, and I expect that we'll be back later to request additional funding for a restoration project in partnership with the Parks and Rec Department. The second column is the ongoing costs, including trash, the porta potties, electrical, um, the water, all of this which totals 952,000. I've asked for one million simply because we don't know what some of the unknowns might occur during this process, and uh, we want to allow ourselves some room there. With this closure, the shift will be visible. Homelessness, with the effect will uh, be across the community. Uh, while the city will continue its efforts to prevent establishment of large encampments, uh, we need more shelter. More shelter is needed. And given the staffing levels and the resources, our efforts for enforcement will be stretched thin. And staff is working, we are working to um, stand up additional temporary shelter locations in the city. That concludes my presentation. And again, the action I'm looking for today is the transfer of the $1 million and the authority for the city manager to execute a contract with the refuse company as identified in the staff report. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much for that update. At this time, I will bring it to council members for uh, any further clarifying questions before going out to public comment. Council Member Myers. I just have a couple of quick questions. Um, thank you for the update. Um, so one question I had, um, Lisa, you mentioned, you know, this will become visible as we, as people move out of the encampment. So kind of a two part question, maybe Larry, for both of you. Um, is it is there a way, so I'm getting a lot of communications, um, mostly from neighborhoods that are adjacent to the wildlands areas, to the open space areas, where, as we know, a lot of folks do end up going up into those areas to reset up camps. Um, is there any way to prioritize certain areas that may be more vulnerable to, um, for example, wildfire or other things, and is that part of your assessment? as you go in to assess an area that maybe I've, has been identified as you know, having campers come in and start to reestablish areas, just trying to get a sense for the public versus maybe someone who's on the river levee again, but you know, essentially is, is there not really a, a major uh, neighborhood issue except for access, et cetera, visual. Just wondering how do you guys look at those kinds of things? Um, Thank you for the question. We have a homeless encampment assessment team Mm -hmm. And that team is composed of members from the fire department, police department, public works, the homeless response team, and we meet weekly. And as those complaints come in, we assess, the team assesses where those encampments are and of priority is a fire danger. And that's why we have a fire representative on our committee, the, the encampment team. So they will be looking at those, when they look to clear encampments, if they, the staffing availability, the location, is it a high fire danger, um, the, the beach, the river. So trying to prioritize, but public health and safety is number one. Okay. And when people are contacted past, you know, maybe they are in these areas, they would be contacted sort of in the same manner as before, 72 hours, you know, belongings would be stored for a period of time, available, um, that kind of same protocol that we've followed for several years now, correct? That's correct. And we will also have, up at the armory, uh, some space available for uh, temporary shelter uh, for those one night offs to have, uh, offer them shelter. Great. And then um, in the homeless management information system, and congratulations, by the way, to uh, actually have staff here at the city able to actually access and manage and do that data collection, because I know in the county reports that led up to the county's three-year plan, you know, this information system is a critical piece of the puzzle that was really not functional for, for many years. So now we have a sense of where folks are, 
what issues they're facing, their needs, um, their current locations, uh, and the way they're potentially moving you know, around other shelters, et cetera. So that's amazing news that that's up and running. Um, a part of that, though, I'm curious, um, as we make contact with people, are we, are we also, so I'm, I'm assuming the county and the HMIS being kind of grown out of you know, the federal government or state government, and there's probably certain things that go in there and then other, other things we would want to collect. For example, you know, we have three, three outreach workers now, so I know I went two weeks ago and um, we have the most amazing staff. The three people who are doing that work um, are really, really critical pieces to what's happening right now and I encourage my Hello, colleagues to go out and experience with me what Jeremy and, and Chris and Monica really do in the field because it's really impressive. Um, but I would assume that we are also gathering, you know, sort of in a tangential way just through relationships, why someone may or may not want to go to a shelter or they refuse shelter or whatever other types of things that they may express as we're especially trying to move people out of an unsafe situation into the variety of shelter opportunities that you guys just evaluate, you know, just rolled out there. Um, do we keep track of that kind of also just tangentially for folks, or how are we tracking, I guess, you know, people's ability to accept services, people's ability to, because I know some people, you know, legitimately are fearful of going into, you know, more organized or more populated um, situations. So I'm just curious, how are we manage that information? Because that's definitely part of the plan to help individuals get past the severity of the situation they're in, for example, down in the Benchlands is trust, but also um, really understanding really what people can do or not do emotionally and physically. So I'm just curious, how do we, how are we tracking that, um, if we are? <laughs> Long question. <laughs> yeah, but um, I think the short answer is all of your context is correct. So first, first of all, I just want to echo that the work that our outreach team does is phenomenal on a daily basis, and uh, we're really fortunate to have them out there doing that work. Um, in terms of the data collection, you're also right that you know a, a system like HMIS that's developed for a specific purpose has limits and rules and policies in terms of what gets entered, and it's not wasn't developed specifically for the kind of work that the city's doing, so. Uh, there is some additional data collection that's underway, and I think that too, getting back to this theme of developing our internal capacity, some of that even more recently has shifted from a lot of relationship-based sort of handwritten notes, knowing people um, that our outreach team does down there and making those connections to other community partners who are providing the services where their role has really been playing that facilitator connector role and then getting them with programs then that are probably, or at least, you know, in that network that's already in HMIS. Uh, but they are collecting case notes. I think that certainly started for, definitely for the folks that are now that we are running programs like 1220 River. So we've got um, our own developing data systems to be able to maintain that, client case notes, uh, et cetera, you know, what services they're connected with, what their needs are, their efforts to connect into other services. Um, and as well, through their outreach down in the bench lands and other specifically when they're encountering folks, um, trying to do that kind of initial assessment about where they're at, what services they might need, what connections might be useful. And then specifically around, uh, particularly when we opened the Overlook to the first wave of additional shelter capacity, uh, they made contact with virtually every single person who was residing in the bench lands. I say virtually because it's, you know, there's um, some variability Persons residing down there, but through, over a course of many weeks, did that outreach to see who was interested, making those offers of shelter when that space was opening up and facilitating them. So we're collecting those, and so I think that's in development too. So we're making that transition and what information is appropriate for HMS and then what we're still collecting in our own data systems. My last question is um, Do you feel like things have changed in the last? 18 months. I know, Larry, you're new here. Lisa, you've been here but not touched this quite as much until recently, but, and maybe Matt's better. I feel like in talking with county staff and county leadership that 
feel like we're hitting our stride somewhat. Um, the resources, I just want to clarify for the public, the resources that were provided for the state really are one time, very much focused on facilities, getting programs up and running. Um, certainly is, it seems to be, you know, stretching into the areas that we needed, purchasing properties getting you know staff together putting folks into the HMIS really kind of very practical collaborative ways to really join the city um, which has an extreme problem as we all know in with a functional now revamped and much more feels like functional overall county approach to homelessness I'm just curious if I'm imagining this and I know there's probably areas of, of frustration um, especially with the county's um, focus mostly on trying to get people into housing, which we know is gonna be very difficult, and maybe not as much on emergency shelter, but overall are we seeing some pretty good collaboration as, as this is getting built out? Whoever wants to answer it. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll take an initial um, uh, effort at responding. And, um, again, I've been here, I think it's 10 months now, um, so not quite your 18 month time horizon, but I certainly feel in my time where I feel, you know, at this point we are really beginning, it feels like there's some inertia and momentum, and obviously a lot of that's connected to we've, we've been able to actually get additional shelter capacity, and I think similarly we've gotten our safe parking program set up. So it's always, um, it's, it's good when you're building capacity to meet people's needs, and so I feel like we've gotten that momentum there. You were absolutely right to, I, to point out that accomplishing a lot of this with one-time funds, and so I think the question is sustaining these programs so that we have alternatives, uh, but certainly I think we've made progress there, um, moving from our plan into actually uh, setting up and establishing programs. And I think as well, uh, I've noticed you know, our ability to work and collaborate with the county um, as, as it, I felt momentum there in my time as well, and I think, um, again, this effort around the housing focused service coordination in the bench lands where, where that's a table we're bringing a variety of partners city county and community agencies um, and really working on seeing how we can put the pieces together where they can, can identify gaps in services or those lack of connections and problem solve and so I think that's been a real and in a very operational impactful way it's just starting but seeing how working together collaboratively can really yield some, some results so that's been promising and if I may, uh, Councilmember Myers, I appreciate the question. It's hard to believe that uh, eight months have gone by as fast as they have. Uh, but I would just emphasize, I think the, the most important shift has been moving from um, focused on the impacts associated with homelessness and really investing in uh, what will be long-term solutions uh, to helping those in need get on a path towards permanent uh, supportive housing. And I want to really applaud the work of, of Larry, our homelessness response team, all of our city departments. This has been an all hands on deck effort. And I really feel uh, that they are steps in the right direction that will bear out fruit uh, over time. We'd all like it to move faster uh, than it is, but it's complex, challenging um, uh, work. So uh, more, more to come and absolutely um, encouraged by uh, the momentum that we're building uh, with lots more work to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I sent a number of questions in advance. I want to thank you for responding to those and integrating them into the presentation. Um, I do want to just draw out one of my questions I'd like you to comment um, here. And that is, so um, we know the county is focused on permanent supportive housing. And you've articulated in the presentation in the report that they are helping with operations of some of these transitional shelters. Can you speak more on um, what else do we see in the horizon and our partnership with the county in terms of standing up transitional shelters throughout the county outside the city, um, as is articulated in their three-year strategic plan? Yes, thank you, council member, for that question. Um, there's, you know, a few, a, a couple of the, the specific ways we're in the report. I think, you know, looking at the how, collaborating around Housing Matters campus. I think the work that they're doing um, in, in 
looking at master lease opportunities that are also transitional shelters. Um, I think, you know, recently too, you know, uh, entering or sort of having conversations, discussions about what potential properties they may have that could be utilized this and how we might be able to work together. So that's been part of our collaborative discussions. And so I think we're open to that um, and receptive in trying to facilitate you know, what roles each of us can play. Um, but in terms of spe other specific immediate opportunities, um, nothing at this point. Okay, thank you. I have other comments that I'll wait till after public comment. Council Member Brown and then Vice Mayor Watkins. I think I was after, but go for it. Um, okay, uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Larry and Lisa, for the update. Um, I'm going to try to just, and, and I really appreciate the, all the work that's going into this, and, and I know that um, it's a lot, and I know that it's um, uh, it's a it's a protracted <laughs> challenge that we're experiencing, and it, it you know immediate results aren't necessarily um, something that is even possible, no matter how much uh, you know goodwill and effort and real commitment is going into it. So I, I don't want anything I'm saying right now to suggest I'm not cognizant of that and appreciative of that. Um, so I, I, I wanted to, uh, most of my questions are really uh, particular to the bench lands, uh, the costs on the um, budget adjustment, and, but also just the plan in general. Um, and so, the, and, the, and the first one is kind of a, a big picture question. Actually, maybe I'll ask the detailed ones first. I'll go with the budget first and just try to keep it uh, uh, straightforward. So um, we do have in the agenda report uh, a table that lists what these costs, uh, you know, kind of allocations to, to the best of your ability for what the additional costs might be. Um, and I am, and I don't want to pick apart that table, um, but I am interested in, in just getting a better understanding of, of um, you know, what some of these costs are, where, you know, Wow, this is a lot of money, $280,000 for a cleanup, um, which is, I didn't, wasn't able to look up the costs on the um, uh, Highway 19 encampment cleanup, but I, it's, it's I, I got a little sticker shock when I looked at it. Um, and I recognize that these things are costly and the longer that we have, uh, you know, something in, in place and it becomes entrenched without a lot of services, it, you know, I get it that there's additional cost, but that's a very high number. Um, just wondering if we could get a little bit of a sense of um, what, you know, almost three hundred thousand dollars for one cleanup. What is that like? What's a part of that cleanup? Um, for that? so that's one question, and then um, another, and then the others are relatively straightforward. Um, but um, I did see that for ongoing four months for porta potties and wash stations. Um, is $100,000, which works out to about 1000 a day. Is that really what the cost? Yes, it, this? it is. In fact, okay. um, what we just experienced was that the, the company has uh, quadrupled their okay. costs. And so, so we are, and that's not just for the, the bench lands, it's actually for the, all the city. And so we're actively working with the finance department to get an RFP together quickly to try to uh, look for other bidders to provide that service. Thank you. I, I, yeah, I, it really was an open question. Like, it's just, yeah. wow. Okay, so it's good to know, that, you know, I think for our general city operations that that's a, a challenge that we're and, yeah. you know, increasing cost. And then just the, the cleanup. cleanup and abatement yeah. item. Certainly. So the cleanup, it's a very, very extensive cleanup, and it will occur afterwards. Uh, well, actually, as, as segments. But it, you can imagine if you've been down there how huge and large that it, the, the, the work is. In just one day alone, when we had to clean up uh, uh, the Water Street, took all day. We had approximately uh, 20 some odd staff members down there uh, to do the cleanup and law enforcement present for assistance and the trucks, the loaders, and the actual dumping fees at our, our landfill. It's an incredible process. Uh, we only had one bidder who was interested in actually doing this type of work and has done this work before, has done the work over in the Hell's Trail. So we, they've had experience um, in, in, in this. So the, the costs are uh, based on their experiences. It's huge. It, it, 
it's much larger than I expected, that's for sure. Thank you. And so related to, I have a couple of these, I just, I'll, I'll try to make them quick. Um, related to that, uh, I did get a, and maybe other council members, it seems like a directive to the entire council, a message about um, kind of the ongoing trash pickup there, uh, which, you know, may only play a very small role in what the costs are of a bigger post, um, uh, you know, post encampment cleanup, but um, that it was becoming more challenging for people in the on site to manage and you know, move their trash. And so I'm, I'm just wondering if, um, like, how, how does that fit, factor in here? Because I feel like sometimes the big costs come because we're not managing it on a um, as well as we could or would if we had more resources, and there's all kinds of reasons why, but I'm just trying to get a sense of how we can commit to helping, you know, giving support to people who want to be part of that cleanup, who are in that, in that space. Um, like, why is it getting harder for them, and what's that, what's that about? Well, that's a great question. So the ongoing trash issue is another very large, large issue. We had daily pickup. Uh, there's, there's the, the um, totes, if you think of your, your totes, there was 20 to 30 totes down there getting pulled up five days a week, sometimes seven days a week, and then our trash service coming through, picking it up, uh, getting people to do that. Our staff was not comfortable any longer doing that. We had a private contractor who was uh, doing that. The cost became unsustainable, and it, to the tune of a request of over almost $8,000 um, a week. And so our staff, we modified, uh, and we're still going through some growing pains of the modifications of trying to meet the trash demands, quite frankly, down there. We still have a weekly cleanup that we do every Thursday, uh, which is now we're actually going through the middle of the bench lands and then having folks throw in uh, trash into the, the trucks. We also have um, folks that live down there who have contacted who will bring the totes up to the uh, road for our, to be serviced and exchanged. They are giving gift certificates to do that. So I would say, yeah, we are limping along right now, trying to keep up with the, the amount. It's, it's a lot, um, but with the, the upcoming closure, we think that we can continue to try to at least somewhat meet the, the needs of the campers in the, in the, in the trash, but it's not, it's, not, it's not perfect, that's for sure. Um, and then a, one other question related to the budget adjustment. Um, as I read it, the funds would come um, through the, the California 14 million uh, uh, allocation and the hygiene bay will then, uh, the money that was gonna go for the hygiene bay will then be come out of the ARPA funds. And I guess I'm just, I feel a little, this may be a really silly question, but I feel a little confused because um, when we talk about those ARPA funds, we're, we're told they are all spent. <laughs> you know, we, we don't, we know when, for example, when we were, some of us were talking about it in relation to other jurisdictions having used ARPA funds for, um, you know, COVID um, uh, pay for, uh, for workers. And um, we are told it's, that's money spent, um, but now we're, now we have it again. So I guess I, I'd love to understand that a little bit better in the, funding within the very constrained <laughs> narrow funding streams that we're what we're able to use the money for how is that happening and what are we not what's not getting funded from ARPA as a result of that if anything does that make sense uh, yes it did until the end but let me explain and I think maybe it'll you know, have a clarification so so initially uh, the appropriation for the hygiene bay was part of the request that came to council on December 14th of 2021. It was included in there. Uh, at that time, it was part of a timing issue because we wanted to release the request for proposals to be able to move the work and we were still in collaborative conversations with the county to come up with an allocation plan for the California 14 million. Um, initially, it was included, the hygiene bay was all included in the California 14 million um, but um, through that process um, and looking at the array of needs um, and the flexibility of funding, the hygiene bay could be paid for out of ARPA. The California 14 is much more flexible, so the decision was made to uh, continue with the appropriation through the ARPA funds and then making available the appropriation 
out of the California 14 million for other uses related to homelessness response. Right. So, so that's clear to me, um, but what's not clear is um, how, we, how we found, and it feels like the way this is presented, we found it, 1 million more dollars in ARPA funds because we, again, have been told there's no, the ARPA money is already spent. So is that, is, am I, is this not making I, am I the only one who's confused by this? No, uh, um, we appreciate I appreciate the question, <laughs> Councilmember okay. Brown, and um, I'll I'll try to maybe rephrase um, Larry's response. So, because of the timing and the fact that we were in the process of building out the the detailed budget for the 14 million, we didn't want that to hold up the hygiene bay remodel. So there was that funding for the project was programmed. So to your point, you know the the comment around. You understand around the the, um, the ARPA funding already being spoken for. This project was built in as part of that budget, so we are we are trading the funding that was programmed into um, program for that purpose and utilizing it for these additional needs we have in the bench lens. Thank you. I, uh, Hopefully, that yeah. is more clear. It's yeah, it's still kind of a big jumble, but that I get now that. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Brown. One other question. I'm sorry, yeah. I totally forgot the big one. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, hiding back here and sorry. having this ever sinking chair also. Um, <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> still here after two years. <laughs> I know. We're, we can trade. We can trade them around. So you don't always have to. Um, so um, the, you know, this is a question that I'm, I'm going to ask. We, you know, somebody at the dais usually or in the public asks it every time. Um, but I, I feel the need, um, since you mentioned that uh, in terms of the phased approach that's being taken, um, where, um, keep, where we are not able to offer alternative shelter, um, and I, the, we, I know that's a muddy area in terms of what, whether or not people are willing to take it and whether versus whether or not they're able to take it and all of that. But that aside, um, the, we're likely to have um, given the our, our capacity, which is great that we've been able to you know build this out and in some ways or taking on something that we've said for a long time is a county's responsibility and I appreciate the collaboration and I'm glad that the city is taking a more proactive role but at the same time I feel like um, we're kind of you know we're grasping at straws a little bit here because we with even with all of this cost we have um, a significantly higher number of people who will need shelter in order to move if, if the plan as you've described it plays out in that way. So I guess I'm just asking again, where are people gonna go? <laughs> just to kinda um, keep it simple. And I know it's not an easy answer and I'm not expecting you to be able to answer that, but I just feel like it's, a, it's something that we have to keep acknowledging and talking about um, as we move forward. I think you framed that very well. We have to acknowledge that there is not enough shelter uh, in this community. And standing up the shelters that we have have made a difference, and they will help with the closure of the bench lands. We will try to augment with vouchers where we can. Uh, we're asking to see if there's other spaces and other shelters in other communities as well. But there probably won't be enough, and we'll have to pause our closure until something else comes online. Thank you. Um, some of my questions are uh, <laughs> getting addressed. Vice Mayor Watkins, and then I'll cue myself in. Great, thank you. Yeah, a lot of my questions have already been asked and answered, and I appreciate the presentation, and more importantly, the work that you and your team have been up to. Um, I think the only remaining question that I have, or maybe you know, if you can just sort of fill me in on where we're at with it, is the. And I'm excited to hear about the information system and being able to access that and be a part of that. And I know we have figures, but then also we have the complexity of the individual, right? And the cases, and you, Larry, mentioned mental health and on that, on the rise. Um, you know, there's so many diversity of needs in terms of domestic violence or somebody losing their job or, you know, co-occurring mental health and substance misuse. and. Certainly we know there's a, a deficit in terms of bed space and facility treatment. Um, but I think having access to that information is really helpful for us to know how to design the supports to meet the needs. 
and I think also helps us to understand what I think could be um, counter to different narratives out there in the community about assumptions around individuals. For example, I think when I think of homeless too, I think of all of the, the non-visible faces of homelessness that we know exist in our community, particularly families and students that we see um, who are struggling um, for housing. And they're not there, but we know they're there, right? And so I guess my question is, is um, as we move forward with our access to the information system, as we have the, P the point in time count, mm -hmm. You know, how is there um, a qualitative overlay to that to understand sort of both like the story behind the numbers, I guess, is the question. And or is there a conversation around that so that we can kind of get to some of the more complex needs of the individuals that are experiencing homelessness? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I think the data begins and having a system to be able to collect this um, allows us to begin to cultivate that narrative and to understand and then inform our conversations for, for sure. Um, I think the point in time count will be helpful seeing some of those train uh, trends. It's going to sort of you know, question our assumptions, um, provide new information. Similarly, as we begin to do this work, um, and I think about the, the services coordination around the bench lands, is we're collecting this information, seeing what connections already exist or do not exist, what the needs are, and can do that problem solving. So one, we can have new information on, you know, what percentage of uh, the persons that we're encountering experiencing homeless already have vouchers, whether they're in a shelter, whether they're in an encampment, and sort of what's, what's the solution around that. Well, having that information and then having the right resources around the table allows us to begin to problem solve around that. So we're starting to see that. So it's like, ah, we have a number of persons with vouchers. How do we, we've got uh, housing navigators that have capacity to work with new people. So how do we make those connections? And so I think all of the data systems and beginning to have that foundation will allow us to be able to be more effective in terms of the work collaboratively, city, county, and our nonprofit and community partners, but also identify where our gaps are and then inform what additional services are needed and, and potentially dictate where resources need to be deployed to make that happen. Thank you. Um, the, the next is maybe more of a comment than a question, but. I think, you know, we're not alone as we, we understand in the state of California and beyond in terms of trying to address the, you know, the, the, the impacts of, of homelessness and just the complexity of the issue. But I think um, over the years that I've been here, there's also been advocacy and connection to state lobbying around supports. And I guess I just say that to really just express my support to continue to advocate for resources from the state. Um, and I think, you know, even if looking at a different type of model in terms of a reimbursement model, I mean, we have the Medi-Cal, like, I mean, some something to help sustain this type of work because, um, you know, it's expensive, as you know, and it's something you can't turn your back to and you need to work on. So how do we, how do we kind of have a both and? And I think the state really has to play a critical role in that. And there's strength in numbers with us working with other communities in kind of the California League of Cities, et cetera. So um, I know we're a part of those conversations. I'm not sure if that was something Elizabeth was doing, but as we move forward with potentially um, looking at filling that position, I think that kind of connection to, to state advocacy is important. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'll cue myself in and welcome Council Member Golder. Thank you for joining us. Um, so let's see, I'll start maybe where you left off. You kind of touched on um, my question, I think, so homelessness response action plan, and I think one thing that I'm uh, kind of realizing is this is not a cure homelessness in our city plan. This is um, a response plan. And I think that, um, you know, we have a lot of community members that are joining and hopefully watching today that um, are have written us. I know that my email, my inbox was full of a ton of questions and kind of a, a, a perception that what are we doing to, to solve this? Uh, this entire issue of homelessness and and ha people being unhoused and so i think what might be helpful at these quarterly updates for the next one 
is really identifying um, I always visualize things in columns and <laughs> um, having columns uh, you know first of all the big picture what are the why why are people unhoused and it's a myriad of reasons right and listing out those reasons cost of living housing lost job domestic violence as that was brought up um, substance use behavioral health mental health um, systems of care failing um, and so listing out whatever obstacles people face uh, we even had city employees this morning speaking to living paycheck to paycheck and on the verge of of feeling like they're losing their housing so taking that big picture approach and then kind of narrowing down to the city's role and capacity in this in terms of land use housing um, all of the the ways that we can um, um, contribute to the overall uh, reasons why and where the county comes in and I think I think that's um, where a lot of people are trying to understand as we for the first time are stepping out into um, uh, efforts around this and not waiting for county health and human services department not waiting for the state not waiting for the federal government to build housing and facilities and funding the operations of those facilities it's now become uh, the responsibility of local jurisdictions and um, you know we have to kind of see that overall and that narrow down of where we can um, work towards uh, response how we can help our our residents right and um, showing um, I think in 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 this response plan and updates a couple of things have come up from members of the public showing um, funding anytime where that's coming from there were comments this morning from uh, city employees around labor negotiations uh, um, uh, thinking that funding for homelessness response is come is uh, n not allowing the city to give to workers and understanding there's different funding sources for example so really identifying where those funding sources are coming from when we talk about hygiene bays and and refuse and and all of that so um, that I think is really helpful and 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 where the services from the county um, come in what is that collaboration kind of just getting a little more specific um, what 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 does the word services mean I think we use that word a lot and I know I sit through meetings where then I after the meeting have a better understanding um, but our people in the community really want to make sure that people that are unhoused are cared for our environments cared for our neighborhoods are cared for our parks are cared for and we're managing funding to care for that in a responsible way so really showing that in this homelessness response plan update I think would be um, helpful I'm, and I'm just realizing that as we're having these discussions and as emails I we're even getting emails uh, <laughs> during the meeting um, so I really want to be responsive to um, kind of the community and where they're finding um, you know the gaps and under in understanding um, how to design the support that meets the needs of our community members right like here's what we've done great update here's what still needs to be done here are the obstacles 
And here's what we're working on or where each one is stopped or in progress or pending and you know beyond our scope referred to county or referred to state or you know those kinds of just simple um, updates I think would be helpful in the future um, permanent supportive housing is a big one that um, I'd love to uh, um, I think there was a question brought up and I know there was an email I believe where somebody contacted what happens when people refuse the uh, offer for shelter opportunity and you know while we say we need more shelter that's really the temporary in the minute solution to uh, you know and especially as we're talking about going into winter going into bench lens flooding um, so ultimately the goal is not more shelter ultimately the goal is more housing and with housing we need all those levels of housing right and that permanent support of housing so it might be great to have just a glimpse of we have 65 uh, units or 64 units of permanent supportive housing coming at this location and uh, housing matters has 120 coming at this look like just kind of laying out the picture and you know what we're based on outreach contacts and and work with the HMIS system and the data we're estimating we need about this much more how can council then create policies that support and reach out and work with community partners that support you know specific types of housing um, I think that data would be very helpful and um, supporting our, our outreach team um, there was a question about and it ties in with where do people go if they refuse service so you know our outreach team has done a phenomenal job out there like council Meyer, council member Myers um, I've been through the bench lines many times and um, the work that they give has been just all in committed and when they play that facilitator role and really try to get folks connected to whatever their needs are and um, they're not accepting the offer or the help that's where I find we have this gray area um, of what how do we see what that is what are those updates and where are those folks going and then we get into the issue of if they're not accepting a bed or shelter or options and they're in the Poganip and maybe it's a restricted fire area now police are there because they're refusing so then we get into the issue of you know police being involved with unhoused folks and um, so just trying to understand how what are, what challenges and how many people are do you have data on people refusing services and at our last council meeting there was a comment about um, Salvation Army staff not being nice uh, to folks and not wanting to go there because of that I don't know if that's true but those types of things that come up from the public or from um, unhoused folks that we speak to um, it would be nice to understand what's happening to those people yes right and that's a great question because I think at the end of the day none of us want a, a police interaction like we'd all like to prevent that from happening uh, and where will people go if they refuse shelter we I don't have an answer for you it depends on what happens in that moment right and will right. they go to another uh, place and camp out probably I think you're going to see those who refuse to go um, 
go to another location. And that, that's, that's the reality, right, that we all need to accept that we're going to see, that there will those who will flat out not want to go to one of the shelters or hotel voucher or accept services. There's some that just absolutely don't want to, just don't want the services at all. They don't want a government interaction. That, that's uh, another piece to it, right? Uh, so I don't have that answer, but how many people have refused services? I don't know if we're collecting that type of data. Okay. But you will see, I, I think, um, when we all do not want a police interaction, but wh what happens in that moment and where people go, it's, it's individual based. It it's really is. And it, it, can you speak to some of the county programs I know have been mentioned through different funding sources they have, like this new Healing the Streets program and how that, my understanding, is a mobile team that will be out and about. Is that another resource that can be tapped into? And Yes, Healing the Streets is one. They're part of the group that meets with us weekly okay. around the, the services coordination. And their focus is, is behavioral health support. Um, they work both countywide, but I mean specifically the city of Santa Cruz and the city of Watsonville. So they've got their team connected, and so that's part of part of the work that's happening in terms of when we identify persons um, who have behavioral health needs uh, through the work down there to be able to connect them to Healing the Streets, a case manager or behavioral behavioral health uh, worker. Um, so they're they're involved there. We brought in DV. So there's a variety of services that are at that table. Um, that particular program, Healing in the Streets, as well, I mean, there is an open referral mechanism. It does, it's not necessarily focused to, um, uh, to, to people living in encampments, so there's an ability to do that. But, um, yeah, certainly trying to find the right services, and that's part of the conversation. We already have some of those um, service providers around the table. But as we hear other needs and other needs are identified, it becomes an opportunity to see what other resources in the community need to be brought to the conversation to support people. Great. Can I just add to that? I wanted to bring it up as part of my comments, but it's relevant to your question and your comments. Um, there are other um, grants that the county has gotten that are just getting started. The CAFES program, which is a partnership with probation, public defender, DA, and the courts. They're going to have folks who are roaming and doing outreach for individuals who have mental health substance use um, challenges and are um, unhoused. So that's, we just got word from BSCC that we awarded six million dollars. That's going to be in our community. Um, I know that um, Health Services Agency and their Behavioral Health Department has brought in over 10 million. Um, a lot of different programs, a part of it is crisis response with people who are having mental health challenges. And then as Vice Mayor Watkins um, just noted, there's a lot happening at the state level and one of them is CalAIM and um, the shift in how folks will get served and have health benefits through the CalAIM program. All of this is gonna roll out in the next six months and it's a real opportunity for us to leverage what's coming down the pikes from the state and with the county so that we can augment. I mean, to Councilmember Brown's point, um, health and human services isn't within the purview of the county and we can no longer do this. It's your responsibility, it's your responsibility. We have to all pitch in, um, invest, and partner so that we can leverage the resources that we have. So I was going to save that for my comments, but it's relevant to the question that you brought up. So. Thank you. Yeah, and I guess that falls in line with just, you know, in our future update, having that overview of here's state, here's county, here's what's happening, and now here's city, here's what we've done, here's what we're still doing and need to work on. So um, thank you. That's good to hear. Um, I had one more question and now I, I, oh, the funding for the four new positions in public works, can you remind me where that's coming from? That's coming out of the California 14 million. Okay, thank you. Thank you, I think those are my questions. Thank you, and just I wanted to say thank you for the feedback on the report, it gives us information on how, you know, this is the, I think the second report we've come back since we've started doing this on a routine basis, so getting feedback on the kinds of information and the structure of that is really helpful. So we'll work to integrate that into future reports. Thank you so much. Council Member Cummings. Thank you, and thank you for that report. Um, I have a, a few questions. I'll try to keep it short. I have a lot. Some of what I'm interested in has been answered. Um, 
the one question in particular that I've been getting from folks um, since I've been on the council, the Benjamins has been used on a number of different occasions as a homeless encampment, and people have been moved, and then they go to block it off, and then it gets ends up being used again. And here we are, you know, allocating a million dollars towards restoration of the site, which has, like I said, historically been used. And I think one of the big concerns people are having is, are we just throwing our money away by investing a million dollars into this, only to see it be, be reverted back into a homeless encampment? In the future, and so I'm just wanting to get some sense of clarity around, you know, what the future of the Benchlands is going to look like. I'll speak to that if you don't mind, and uh, Larry and Lisa may have some follow-up thoughts. Uh, Councilmember Cummings, I appreciate the question. Um, our goal is for this to be a permanent shift away from using the Benchlands for purposes of temporary shelter. Um, and move through a full restoration so that the park can be available to our community members again for its intended purpose. Um, that requires that we continue making progress on standing up alternative shelter, as we've uh, emphasized and continue to speak to this afternoon, and that work will be ongoing. We know it's a major investment uh, to move into a restoration. Um, that's our goal. That's our goal. Okay, thanks. Um, another question that's come up, um, I believe this came before us maybe last year, but there was uh, 121 units of, I believe, is transitional housing over at the Housing Matters campus. There's been some discussion that there's some funding issues with that, with that project moving forward. Um, that or, I mean, we haven't really ha heard any kind of update on what's happening with that project as it relates to providing more beds for homelessness. And so I'm wondering if you all have heard any information so that we can, you know, give the community a clear sense of what where that project is going so that we can have, because that's 121 new beds um, that could help us address this issue. All right, thank you for the question, council member. Um, the project is still moving forward in terms of recent funding. Um, they are still waiting to hear um, responses back on a um, no, play, no Place Like Home grant. I'm trying to, I think that's the right name. Um, so that's out um, for consideration as well as a Project Home Key grant application as well. So they're waiting responses on that. And then recently, um, they received an $8 million earmark to be able to support that project as well. So my understanding, they're still targeting to be breaking ground on that project um, in spring, in March. Um, and that's the latest update I have. But we can continue to bring updates on that um, to at future council meetings. Yeah, that'd be great. since. It really goes hand in hand with kind of our ability to get more beds online. And I think people are just interested in hearing about these different projects, what's happening. Because once we stop hearing, then all the hearsay starts coming up around, it's not moving forward, they lost all their money, the city could have put funds in, but they didn't, you know. So I think for us to just kind of have a sense of where those kinds of projects are moving and getting updates will be helpful for us to communicate that to the public. Um, the next question I had um, was when I when I first got on council, and I believe back between 2019 and 2020, um, initially um, there wasn't an interest of the state allowing us access to the armory because they had planned renovations for the armory. Now it seems like we're moving into that, you know, a longer term use of that facility. I'm just kind of wondering, you know, what's the timeline on us being able to use that, or is the the U.S. Army, are they going to plan on doing the renovations and eventually kind of taking that facility back over? Uh, my understanding is that they aren't interested in renovating that property. I think one of, is, and again, my, my limited understanding is they, um, they need to have another property in another place to have the, the operations at some point before they relinquish a property. But in terms of making additional investments in the use of that property, it seems that the, the, that building doesn't meet the purposes for what they're trying to use that, have this detachment, detachment's mission accomplished. So in terms of our conversations, they've been open to having a longer term lease. So that is still in process, trying to work through the details with the California military department. Um, but uh, it does not seem that they have a long term interest in operationalizing that property. Great, thank you. Um, I'll leave my questions there, and um, I have a few comments when we come back after public comment. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Has everyone had an opportunity to ask questions? 
Council Member Golder. I just have one question. Um, has there been any thought about using kind of that SB 35 lens and doing any redevelopment and having the city build housing, either permanent supportive housing or housing that will accept vouchers? Um, and or even looking at existing multifamily residential properties that are for sale in the city or those kinds of things. And I don't know if there'll be grant or funding for this, but just like, I know Santa Cruz City Schools is working um, on trying to build some um, employee housing in the future. And so just thinking along those lines, if there was a way for us to build or redevelop some housing, um, you know, spread it throughout the city so it's not so dense, right, at housing that are for the people. It's only one question that I thought, has anybody thought about that as a potential opportunity? Maybe for the next update, we can have... And if it's like, that's a terrible idea, I'm, I'm okay with that too. I just was curious. <laughs> Uh, not a terrible idea, and I see we have Lee Butler jumping on. Um, I'll let I'll let him take a first crack at it, um, but appreciate the question. Thanks for the question, Councilmember Golder, Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development. And um, as the council is aware, uh, this is one of the things that our um, economic development housing team in collaboration with many of our city departments is working on carefully um, with, for example, the Pacific Station North and South, where we have approximately 200 units of affordable housing in the works um, with Pacific Station South having broken ground. And um, that's providing 70 units with 25% of permanent supportive housing mm -hmm. that um, caters specifically to individuals who are um, either homeless or um, recently homeless or at risk of becoming homeless. Same thing with Pacific Station North um, of those 120, 130 units, uh, close to 130 units, 25% of those are permanent supportive housing units. And um, I think as we proceed with, I, I know you were talking about other areas outside of just the Coral Street, but I'll, I'll mention that um, you know, that'll be one of the things that we uh, take into consideration as we're looking at the Coral Street Master Plan Design Charette and working with the community and the various stakeholders to understand what are those needs. We've been um, talking about from the uh, council and the community, the need for a navigation center out in that area, expanded services because Housing Matters does offer those types of services at their, their current campus there but also um, how can we expand that and potentially go up with um, additional permanent supportive housing as, as folks have mentioned, as other council members have mentioned, you know, that permanent supportive housing is really critical to having people transition from homelessness into a uh, more permanent housing situation. So we are looking at those opportunities and um, we will continue to explore those um, both with additional property acquisitions um, and um, with working with the resources we have. And I would just add, I think uh, Lee framed it well, but we also have a couple other very specific, exciting opportunities in front of us. One of those is uh, moving forward with uh, the downtown library and affordable housing project. That'll move forward 125 desperately needed uh, housing units in our downtown area, as well as redevelopment of the central home supply property uh, at Highway 1 and 9. So. Uh, both Lee and our economic development team really have been pulling out all the stops to look for those opportunities and uh, more to come. Thank you. This was exactly the kind of overview I think would be great for our next update, just to give the full picture. Uh, thanks for that question. I One more came up quickly. Running water at the Benchlands, has that been resolved? Um, that is an ongoing um, uh, issue that uh, requires attention and city staff is there every day to make sure that that's not running um, from the spigot into um, towards the river. I mean access to... Oh, so there is access, I'm sorry. To ...water for uh, people there. Um, the, the sinks, the pump sinks to wash your hands and... Um, so I guess that's not running water, but the what I'm not sure what what you call those. The, the washing. Those are hand, the hand washing, washing stations, stations. Yes. 
we were down there. Yeah. I was there last we, week, and they were all dry. They were all right. So they get serviced every day. But what we found out is that um, the campers will open up the underneath and take the water jugs, the, the water containers, or others will just use it and bathe in it rather than go use the shower. So they're using it up, but we are servicing them. They are getting filled, but okay. they're, they're empty before very early. Okay. Yeah, that's seven days a week service. Okay, thank you. I'm going to at this time take it out to public comment. If you are um, a member of the public and you'd like to comment on agenda item number 19, homelessness response update, uh, now is the time to call in using instructions on your screen. Uh, you can raise your hand by dialing star nine. And um, if you're joining us here in the public, please line up to the right of the dais and you can sign in at the front and I will call on you when we reach that point. We also have approved for extra time. Serge Cagno with Stepping Up Santa Cruz, Reggie Meisler with Santa Cruz Cares, and Robert Norse, Homelessness, Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom, Huff. They requested extra time today. So when they speak, they will be granted extra time. Okay, I am not seeing any members in, in person here, so I will take it out to our virtual attendees. And um, our first hand raised is Leslie Wooding. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. I hope you can hear me now. Yes. Welcome. Hi. I'm Leslie Wooding. I live on Dakota Avenue, two blocks away from San Lorenzo Park. Um, my life for the last two and a half years has been continuously impacted by the encampment in San Lorenzo Park. I have spent many hours listening, reading, writing letters, and organizing for change. Uh, San Lorenzo River and Park should be the most natural and pure river in a city anywhere on this earth. It's our common jewel that everyone should have access to with a safe and clean environment. By now, I think everyone knows about the conditions of the people living in San Lorenzo Park and the conditions of the riverbank. I have been impacted almost daily, checking to see if someone has overdosed or picking up trash or reporting waste, needles, theft. I've found illicit drugs several times and um, unfortunately watched bodies being taken from the bench lamp, not, out, not because I'm looking for it, but because I'm walking through the park. I've also seen tents burned down. Um, San Lorenzo Park was designed by the Army Corps of Engineers as a floodplain, and so there was and there will be flooding there. It is not suitable for an encampment. I have talked with neighbors, businesses, and homeless advocates, and I've started to get to know some people who live in the park. Uh, I've organized to keep the park clean. Last night I attended the meeting where several people who live in the bench land speak. It was mind opening and I empathize with them. The meeting was also very strongly biased toward resistance and defending the encampment to stay in the bench lands. And there's also criminal activity that negatively affects the people in the bench lands and certainly the neighborhoods as well. The um, criminal activities need to be removed from the bench lands. Meanwhile, I've listened to the city plan and I am strongly in favor of the park restoration plan. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Our next uh, hand raised is Reggie Meisler. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. And this is uh, extra time. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. 
All right, thanks. Uh, we as Santa Cruz Cares have a number of questions about the city's homelessness response, as well as the coming eviction of hundreds of people from the bench lands. We request that you please address these during the council members' discussion. While we know that the council members' questions are limited per the rules of Mayor Bruner, we believe that the public has a right to know these answers. We've also emailed these questions directly to city council and staff. First, we see that the public response for these two items is limited to 30 minutes. We'd like to know why a topic of such significant consequences for those affected is only afforded half an hour. We hope you'll reconsider and give these issues the time they deserve. So a few questions we have from the report. What exactly is the plan to be able to provide an alternative sheltering option to anyone in the park who wants it? What wraparound services will be provided to people? Do people need to explicitly request shelter in order to have options provided? Has the city consulted with people on the ground about what they actually need? Where in the city and or county will there be shelter for 300 to 400 people? Um, can the city provide photos of what the shelters or beds actually look like to the public? Will the city commit to providing, um, uh, to publicizing the options of where people can relocate to? What transparency will be provided after this eviction regarding how many people were sheltered as part of the city's efforts? The city continues to close programs and evict residents at the armory only to announce new shelter also opening at the armory. This feels like a shell game by the city. Even with a phased approach to increasing shelter capacity, it is hard to see how there will be enough shelter beds for those who need them. We also must ask, what is the plan for people for whom the shelter options do not work, such as those with physical disabilities, history of trauma, and people who have pets? When people are displaced and threatened with arrest or citation if they don't accept limited shelter offerings that may not work for them, people will seek more isolated locations in order to hide and survive, which will directly increase the risk of fire. Some of our proposed suggestions and solutions are money toward mobile services, showers, bathrooms, black and gray water pickup, finding space for agreement camps, programming decisions that involve heavy input from people who live outside to ensure the program are what people actually need and will use, coordination with local organizations and volunteers in the community that want to help, a more impactful harm reduction strategy, putting more money towards building public housing and rehabbing old motels, which it sounds like you might be doing, expanding housing programs that directly provide shelter. We are very excited that the parking programs opening, uh, about the parking programs opening, we applaud the city for signing a contract with AFC and the free guide. Um, more of this, please. Thank you for listening to our comment. We look forward to your response. Thank you for your comment. Our next hand raised is also extra time, Serge Cagno. Good afternoon again, Mayor and City Council. My name is Serge Cagno, I'm Stepping Up Santa Cruz relating to advocacy and resource referral. I'm the co-chair of the Mental Health Advisory Board and was a contractor with the county for setting up the Vets Hall shelters and the ongoing training of staff. My thanks for Larry and his team's report and their work for our community's residents who live on the streets and in our shelters. I'd also like to thank his team in their efforts to support an overlook resident with mobility issues for whom I advocate. Today, I have four requests which incorporate both advocacy and service delivery. The first regards data collection. In some ways, it relates to Councilmember Watkins' question about relevant data and Mayor Bruner's comments. Now that the city has its own services at 1220, the SCPD parking lot, and I believe lot four, and has a voice in shelter contracts at the Armory and the Overlook, as a member of the Mental Health Advisory Board, I would ask that to ensure diversity inclusion in our services, the data be collected in each of our programs, which help fund, which we help fund regarding two types of exit de demographic data or behavioral demographic data, which is not collected in HMIS for any of the programs in our county. The first is of program residents told to leave a city run or city funded program. Where suggested data points could measure diversity for protected classes, including race, disabilities, including mental health and substance use disorder diagnosis, or from behaviors resulting from such. Second data point relates to incident data, which does not result in the resident being exited to include demographics as well. And the third data topic would relate to grievances, including number of 
complaints in each of our programs, the demographics, and how they were resolved. None of these data points are collected in HMIS. My second request regards training, and in some ways relates to Council Member Brown's re comments regarding making our programs more welcoming to those living on the streets, and relates to Council Member Myers and Mayor Bruner's question of why do people choose or not choose to go into our shelters. Because participants often have significant trauma histories and may be more affected by staff skills and experience, for the sake of transparency and ensuring quality service delivery, I'd ask the City Council to direct staff to report on the training given to those working in the shelters and the city's safe parking programs. I would also ask the City Council to please consider creating a shared training program between the city funded programs, including the Downtown Streets Team, AFC, Salvation Army, and the Free Guide. Such a program would have a shared calendar or monthly email to include any of these programs to invite city staff and the other city funded programs to invite and city staff to participate in the training. The cost would be minimal, but the trainings, the improved services, the improved collaboration and referrals between programs and the outcomes for participants most likely would be significant. A future report of training. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. Our next hand raised is the name Abby Samuels. You can press star six. Can you hear me? Hi, yes, welcome. Thank you. Um, I am calling um, basically to talk about, I probably could spend about three hours with facts that were said or supposed alternative facts that were said that are not true. For instance, I'll just give you a couple. As mentioned um, at 1220 River Street, the people miss, meet with their caseworkers once a week. That's not true. It was mentioned um, that people, um, let's see, sorry, I'm not feeling well. <laughs> people at 1220, were um are finding transitional housing and are being transitioned out um i spoke to probably around 15 people there and no one knows of anyone who's received housing from there um uh, someone just made a comment that someone's taking out the water out of the wash bins and instead of using the showers what showers i know there used to be some shower once a week on Fridays or something like that. So what showers are you speaking about? But more than that, I'd like to talk to you about um, the trash. This is a uh, something that has been going on for a while. They take away the trash that the city's been picking up. They did it Highway 1. They did it at um, many places at um, Camp Street can't think right now <laughs> they did it at the at ross camp they did it at the upper san lorenzo park they did it at poganup they did it at sycamore grove and now we're doing it at Benchman. and then you call it an emergency environmental hazard this is something that you have created and i've spoken to the contractors they are not the ones who have stopped going there or the staff. Ron Paragino, who used to do it over at Highway 1, Your time he claimed has... that you told him that you no longer want him to pick things up. That was at Highway 1. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, my Our next, it looks like it's a phone number, our next member of the public, it's phone number ending in 3599. And you can go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, this is Grant Dentremont. I am the general manager with the Hotel Paradox. I am here speaking uh, as a private citizen. Uh, you just muted. Uh, press star six to unmute yourself. All right, how about that? There we go. Okay, 
Um, so again, I'm Grant Dentremont. I'm the general manager with the Hotel Paradox, but I'm here as a private citizen. Um, I work in a business that is largely affected by the bench lands encampment. Um, you know, second, some of the thoughts that have been put out before council today, there are multiple impacts to our area regarding criminal activity, drug use, um, impacts to patrons of local businesses. Um, and in particular, our tourist community, uh, we are a tourist based economy. We thrive off of the tax dollars that are uh, provided to us by the tourists who visit our local economy. And one of our largest impacted areas is our downtown area due to the bench lands encampment. Um, all that being said, I want to applaud this council and I want to applaud Larry and his team for what they have done. Uh, I think it's incredible to see the work that has been going on over there and incredible to see the progress that has been made. Uh, too often you guys are subjected to people calling in to complain about criminal activity, complain about drug use, complain about trash or services or lack of fairness to the homeless run house, but uh, what this city council has done and what the city has done in response to homelessness has been a monumental undertaking under very challenging circumstances. As a business leader, uh, we want you to know that we support you. Um, as a local employer, we want you to know that we support you. Um, as a private citizen, we want you to know that we support you and we appreciate all that you're doing. And we know it's not easy, we recognize that. Um, it's a very complicated issue and it requires a lot of thought and a lot of data, uh, but you guys have gone above it. Thank you for your comment. Our next hand raised is Mark Wentzler. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm glad I was able to make it. I had to get, take a break from my training. I'm a, I am live and I own a condo in the Villanueva condos on 180 Dakota Avenue. And um, I have been impacted by the encampment in the bench lands quite a bit over the last two years. Um, I've lived there for over nine years and actually lived there for a few years in the past. And in the last two years, um, you know, there's just been a lot of people walking right inside of like my backyard and frequently we've had things stolen and um, it's just been difficult. I have a 10 year old son and you know, he's afraid to go to the park. A lot of the time I have two adult sons with autism and frequently uh, my, we, we bought the condo so that they would be able to walk because they aren't able to drive. And so it's just difficult. They uh, frankly don't even want to go in the park. <laughs> That being said, I am really supportive of the city's plan. I think they're being very thoughtful and strategic and trying to provide services for the people there as they close the encampment in the bench lands. Um, my wife and I and some other members of our community have actually worked with Parks and Rec to do um, some park cleanups and support in whatever way we can. And I just really want to get out there that it's been difficult, but you know, I really hope that that this plan is going to be effective and it's going to both help our park but also help the people living there over the last few months the encampment has clearly taken a turn for the worse when it first started there was like clear you know tent spaces and whatnot and it wasn't too bad actually at our events we've had several of the people living there come and help us do cleanups with the tools provided by parks and rec so i definitely you know wish them well but i'm really ready for there to be a change and supportive of the city. So I think that's all I got to say. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. It looks like that uh, concludes the public comment for item number 19, homelessness response update. And so at this time, I will bring it back to council for action and deliberation. Uh, and council member Kalantari Johnson, you had your hand raised. I wanted to clarify, is the motion um, separate for 19.1 and 19.2 or is it one motion? I don't think there's a motion in 19.1. Oh, okay, so uh, yeah. I see, just 19.2, okay. 19.2. So um, I'll move 19.2, uh, want me to read them? Okay, I'll read, I'll move 19.2, Benjamin's closure and restoration budget adjustment and refuse disposal abatement and landscape remediation contract approval. Motion to adopt a resolution amending the fiscal year 2023 budget to transfer a million from Safe Sleeping Hygiene Bay Project 
C102205 to the Benchlands Restoration Project C102304 and authorize the city manager to execute an emergency procurement agreement in a form to be approved by the city attorney between the city of Santa Cruz and Clean Team Associates in the amount of 280,000 to remove encampment debris in the San Lorenzo Park Benchlands. And then I have some comments. Okay, we have a first by council member Kalantari Johnson. I'll go ahead and second that. And a second by Vice Mayor Watkins. And um, are there any other questions? Uh, comments okay great. so go ahead with your comments and then council member Myers great um, I want to thank um, Larry and Lisa for your presentation today the whole entire homeless response team and all of city staff because I know it's it's not just one department not just a few staff it's across the board and it's been a very very heavy lift so thank you all for the hard work that you do every day to get us to where we are um, I want to pull out one data that was brought up today, and that's the 61% decrease in homelessness in transition age youth. Um, in 2019, this age group made up a third of our unhoused population, 30% in 2019. And we've seen a significant change in three years. Um, let's move backwards in time. 2017, our county was one in 10 across the nation to secure a very competitive um, HUD grant. Um, we spent a year doing strategic planning to outline very specific strategies for this population. 2019, we launched the implementation of these seven strategies that were outlined. We were, you know, sidetracked by COVID and fire, um, but we kept working. And here we are in 2022 with a 61% decrease. This is young people under the age of 24 unaccompanied. So that's a success in our community. And that wasn't just the county, it wasn't just the city, it wasn't just nonprofits, it was all of us together. And I think it's important as we look towards all the work there is left to do, because we did see a 6% increase, and we did see a 129% increase in chronic homelessness, those are significant numbers. And um, we're not gonna be able to solve alone. We don't have the capacity, we don't have the resources, we don't have the expertise as a city. But we can look to some of the successes that we've seen. Um, and I, in that particular example, there's investment, there's collaboration, there's partnership, and then there's outcomes. So, and, and it takes time. I mean, actually, I think three years is pretty incredible, not that much time, but it takes time. So I think I'll, I mean, I could keep talking about this for a long time. Um, I'm, I've been really invested in the transition age group myself with my, the work that I do. Um, but I think as we continue to this work and it continues to be hard and we continue to question what we're doing and what our role is, let's look to some of these positive outcomes that we've seen in the community as a source of inspiration for us to um, chip away, do our piece, continue to bring in county, other jurisdictions. This TAVE proposal, the HUD grant that we got, it brought in two other federal grants and two other state grants all within a year's time frame. And we partnered with San Jose and we partnered with San Francisco. So that's what it's gonna take. It's gonna take regional, state, all of us together. Um, I'll, just, I'll just stop there, but I'm, I'm really, really grateful for the work that's being done. Um, and I understand there's a lot more work to, do, to be done and, and I'm here to support it. Thank you, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Council Member just, Myers. Just a quick, a couple of quick um, final comments. Um, the county did an assessment um, through a group called Focus Strategies, which is a nationally recognized group. And I wrote down this one sentence out of that report and it was published in 2019. And that sentence was, funding, functioning, and the size of the homeless crisis response system are not at all, are not at the scale or level of alignment and coordination needed to begin to reverse current trends. So that was in 2019. And we look at what we have now, which is a one-time um, allocation from the state, which is also, I'm assuming, helped really elevate Santa Cruz because we finally have told our story that per capita, we have the, one of the highest populations of homeless individuals in the state of California, if not in the nation. All of this is part of telling this story and reversing, really reversing the current trends. And that's really what we're focused on now 
adding to that over time, we hope that those success models will begin to show themselves in the other populations of homeless individuals who unfortunately are here, finding themselves here. But also on the other side of it is really building out a system that has accountability for the individuals also who are becoming part of our investment, right? And I look at the 1220 River Street um, uh, shelter. I did go and visit that and, you know, it's, it's a functional system where we're getting contact with folks. Folks are able to go to work. They feel safe. They're able to participate within that camp environment for positive outcomes there on the property. They have their kids there. They have their pets there. They have their belongings there. And so little by little, we're going to have to build out these various options for people because frankly, our population is something that most cities would be struggling with and probably would have given up on. And we, we were sort of giving up. We were just moving people around, hoping that maybe they would eventually leave town. They don't. But I also will say along with that accountability is that we build this trust and we build this network of care and we build this network of, of really getting people access to the things that they need and hopefully we'll take advantage of. Um, I really appreciated the, the commenters about um, the compliments of our staff and the recognition of what we're doing for those businesses and homeowners right in that immediate area in the benchlands. We were failing tremendously in 2020. There was, we were, we were not managing. Another camp got started, the county pulled out. There was really no activity going on and on, on there. And then we called a meeting with state leaders and we, we told our story and we continued to work with the state and we brought resources to Santa Cruz. Now, I think the public would all like for us to be spending our limited resources in a lot of different ways right now, but right now, this is an acute issue that needs um, attention and it needs purposeful and well-designed systems change, and that's what our staff is working on, so we should be proud of that um, and not doubt ourselves. But of course, these investments will go on for a while. Hopefully, we will gain investment mostly from state and federal sources and not have to use our own resources. But if we don't turn back and, and sort of address this issue, it will continue to grow here in Santa Cruz and we will not really be able to succeed. But it will take probably close to a decade for all of this to sort its way out. And this is a disinvestment in society that we did not create. This are disinvestments that are now coming to light here and in, in, unfortunately in individuals and their success in life or, or non-success. And their struggles with behavioral health and mental health and addiction, and everything else that's rolled in, as well as domestic violence. So it's a super complicated issue. I am very, very pleased with the report today. Um, there's more work to do. Um, and I agree with the callers and some of the letters we've got today. The Benchlands is a place that belongs to our community. It doesn't belong to what's going on down there now. It's not acceptable to me that it's an open air drug market, that in my visit there, People basically were short of just sort of, you know, I won't say it, but really disinterested in committing or contributing to anything to our community down there. Really very much so looking at that as a place that they had to take a stand. So if you want to pitch in, you want to do good by us, you want to help share our resources, then we can, we can lend a hand. But when you're treating a piece of property that is a public park in the, some of the lowest income neighborhoods in Santa Cruz next to seniors, and people who need to transit through that area. We need that park back for our community. Anyone's welcome to spend the day there and use it um, reasonably, but right now that is not what's happening. So I agree, let's get that park closed. I know it's gonna take some time, but let's keep moving. Let's not kind of divulge back into debating about what's happening. We're housing people, we're feeding people, we're keep taking care of some of the most needed people in the community right now. Let's keep doing that, but also let's always remember that there is a level of accountability that is perfectly reasonable for a small city like us to ask of anyone who is who is participating in our programs. And I just never want to lose track of that particular piece of what we're trying to do as well. So thank you to the staff. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, before I move on to the next council member, it was um, brought to my attention that we do have a uh, a hand came up that was one of the groups so they came up a little late but I'm gonna let them speak they were allowed extra time uh, for phone number ending in four eight four four um, go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself can you hear me 
Yes, welcome. Thank you for taking the time, uh, Sonia. Um, okay, well, we've heard uh, suggestions of augmented vouchers. We've heard suggestions of send them elsewhere. Uh, there can be a secret discussions, but not with the real clients. Uh, we can have a council member wander through the council, through the, uh, the, the bench lands and attempt to, uh, has any attempt really been made to talk to the people who live there about what's going on? I haven't heard much of that in this discussion. The council has shown its real colors. This is about enforcement of ordinances. Uh, so you can first, of course, to clear the bench lands, but then to enforce ordinances and doing so in ways that you will not be held accountable legally for essentially disrupting people's lives. Um, and by the way, please don't ding me until it's three minutes. I've noticed you've been a little premature in that. Uh, that can happen, I guess. I tend to agree with Reggie's questions, which I haven't heard anyone answer, really. I'm glad that neighbors did show up at this meeting, uh, the meeting that's again going to be happening at the Resource Center for Nonviolence on successive Mondays. The next one is the 29th at 6 o'clock. I think the community needs to come and talk about real solutions because the council is not. The council is relying upon simply uh, sort of these claims about what's going to be done with no clarity about where the places are that people are going to go, how many people need to go there. Those basic questions are not being asked. So it's nicely phrased and phased. That's part of the, the, the rhetoric that's being used. The real problem here is a false narrative. The, the false narrative that you have is somehow the belief that you're dealing with uh, people who aren't people, that these are, uh, these are skunks, punks, and drunks. These are uh, crazies and bums. And what you have are people who are desperately living together in a situation where they have created their own community as best they can. You are now about to disperse it. And you're not providing any real alternatives for the entire group, much less homeless people in the, in the broader community. Until you have that power, and you have the power actually, until you have that determination and you're willing to devote that kind of funding, even for alternate camps, then you can't do this legally and fairly. But I would encourage people interested in finding real solutions to come on Monday night, 612 Ocean Street, Resource Center for Nonviolence. That includes critics. That includes people who, who, don't, uh, who don't agree with me or with uh, the other speakers who feel there should be basic rights allowed, folks, and basic services allowed before you destroy the services as they exist. And thank you for giving me time. Thank you for your comment. That uh, concludes our public comment. Uh, and I will bring it back to council. Um, I think there were several uh, questions brought up by some of the callers. Um, and I hope that um, we can have staff um, go back and listen to the video and try and uh, get some of those questions answered and available on the uh, homelessness website or accessible somehow for folks to get their questions answered um, to have that available. There was questions about showing what the shelters look like, maybe a couple photos um, if that's um, possible. I took notes about are we accommodating people with disabilities and their pets and from the last um, meeting, my understanding is yes. Um, so really kind of calling that out and I think in any future updates that would be helpful. Uh, money towards mobile services and showers, gray water dumping, which I understand is happening up at the National Guard Armory location um, where the tier three safe parking is and anywhere else that that service, those types of services are offered. Um, building more housing and rehabbing hotels, that was also brought up and briefly mentioned um, through our planning and community development director and our economic development team working on that aspect of um, housing and having housing updates in future updates 
as part of these updates. Um, there was also a, a recommendations on data collection and um, incident data, grievances data. Um, I think all of those are great uh, points to consider. Um, so I hope that as we step into these efforts that we continue to work on improving and doing what we can. Thank you um, for all the work every day um, thus far. I know it's been a tremendous, uh, tremendous load and it's been a huge team effort and I hope um, we can continue working with our uh, partners and county staff to continue um, making progress and really addressing the successes. There, were, there was a caller who um, said that they didn't, they spoke to 15 folks at 1220 River Street and nobody knew of anybody who transitioned out of housing. So how can we do a better job really um, talking about those successes? Because my understanding is there are people who have transitioned and have received employment and those obstacles removed, whatever someone's barrier is, is definitely a success to, even if it's one person, that's one person less. So um, I will hand it over to Council Member Brown. I know you've had your hand up and then Council Member Cummings, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I am, I, I find myself in a, um, pretty cynical place right now <laughs> um, with respect to this item. And I could make a big speech about um, the concerns I have and why I support um, other ways of um, approaching this. Um, but I'm not going to do that. I just want to really paraphrase where my concerns continue to lie as I explain that I'm, I'm afraid this is not going to be a unanimous vote in support of this today. I'm just at a point where I feel like we are, um, we are, it, it, it's not clear to me that we aren't repeating what we have already done. And I, and I say that with all due respect and, and recognition of the tremendous amount of effort you all are putting in. I do not mean to say that I don't have confidence in you, um, but I, I, I have very, very significant concerns about the overall approach that this body has taken. Um, and I have concerns about the, um, what I see is, you know, for me, and it's a matter of perspective, so you can disagree, but this is my perspective, and I share it with, I think, a lot of people in the community who have spoken with me over the years on all sides of this issue, whether or not they, um, you know, are, believe that enforcement is important and the way to deal with this, or compassionate approaches and resistance, all the way to resistance. It's across the board that people feel like for all of our efforts, we're not making progress. And um, and so I'm just gonna talk about the, the areas that I see here and just very high level, and I'm, I'm sorry if this offends people, um, but I have to say it. Um, one, I, what I see, and, uh, and again, lots of work going on, but what I see is that the city has been thus far successful in building out a bureaucracy around um, how to address this issue. Um, and not actually providing services. Um, I know that's coming, um, or you know, in, in kind of a fits and starts, and there's a lot of challenges associated with that. I'm not placing blame any, on anyone or any group at all here. I'm just saying this is where we're at. Um, we have, uh, we're building out a bureaucracy where s that's gonna cost a significant amount of money, um, and um, I would like for that to be an effective and efficacious of costs. Data, I feel, um, I recognize everybody loves data. I'm a social scientist who, you know, got a degree um, based on, you know, having to do really rigorous data collection and analysis. I understand the significance and importance of it. Um, but I feel like in, in some ways, at least based upon my own experience, the conversations I'm having, um, it sort of feels like data is the end goal in itself and not what we're gonna do with the data. So some of the things that I heard Serge uh, talking about earlier, um, to me, th that's data that can be really useful. Um, you know, a lot of people are, are terrified of ending up in, you know, 
on the radar. Um, and that's not just because they're, um, you know, uh, it's not because they don't want to comply with some norms that everybody else, you know, that, that we all are able to comply with. It's because they have legitimate challenges um, that aren't getting, and their needs are not getting met. Um, I worry about um, the, the risk of dispersing, you know, dispersing people. We know, we, we've, we've been through that many a time. We know what happens, right? And the, I, I don't want to see that happen. <laughs> I don't want people, I mean, I, I get it that we need to do something and that p there is an impact on that, um, San Lorenzo Park and the Benchlands and people are struggling and, and quality of life for people in the neighborhood is a concern of mine and we're going to have um, people, we're just going to hear it from all sides. You know, you've done this before. How is it different? I want to see it be different. And I don't see that in what um, we're getting in terms of, of updates. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is um, I, I believe what I would really like to see, and I'm not even going to attempt to make a motion about it because I, there's just no way this is going anywhere. Um, but we talk a lot. We talk about accountability and you know measurement and metrics. We got to we got to surveil the individuals in these programs. Um, we are not applying the same standards of accountability to ourselves. And until we do that, I'm going to remain pretty skeptical. Um, and so that was a little longer than I intended. I'm sorry, but I just wanted to lay out the, my rationale. And I'm I'm not doing this to be combative. I'm not suggesting um, you know we need to. Um, blow it all up and, and do something different, but I, I just feel like there's a lot more that needs to be done um, internally and in, in our conversations with the community. So that's all I got for now. Thank you, Councilmember Brown. <laughs> Councilmember Cummings and then Vice Mayor Watkins. Thank you, and I want to thank the staff for their work on this. I have a couple things to say, but then I'd want to get to, I have a couple more kind of questions and something, some um, questions I want to get to. Um, you know, since my time on the council, there's been a number of different ways that we've tried to approach this issue. Um, some of what is being implemented now was even mentioned back in 2019 around um, having less managed and low barrier, uh, barrier um, transitional encampments. Um, we did a lot of work during 2020 up standing up. Um, Hand washing stations, porta potties. We stood up multiple, um, you know, VFW hall locations, multiple encampments, the armory. There's been a lot of work over the years, 1220 River Street, and we've. And I want to appreciate everything that's been done because I think we've been able to see different types of models, how they work, what are their limitations, and now we're moving forward with, um, you know, hopefully some longer term services will be offered by the city. Um, I do want to share that some of what I've heard over the years, um, like because we see these large encampments that pop up and we do hear about some of the negatives, but one of the positives I will say is that I had people who were saying, you know, when the Ross camp was open, although it had impacts throughout other parts of the city, we didn't see those impacts and we didn't feel them. And right now it's similar. I know that there's the neighborhoods that are adjacent to the Benchlands are feeling impacts. I know that it's having impacts on our river, but one thing that people are saying is that but we're not seeing as much. Um, camping being distributed throughout the entire city. And, um, you know, there's the high likelihood that we're going to see that when the bench lens is closed. And so my hope is that we can just continue working on finding places where people can go. Um, and in addition to that, you know, really starting to address these issues around the cost of living. I mean, we are the second most expensive county in the United States. And in 2017, we were labeled as the fourth most expensive city in the world when you looked at median home price to median income. And, um, you know, we have staff that are ready to go on strike and, um, you know, we don't see any relief in terms of the cost of housing. We're doing a lot to address affordable housing and that's going to come up later today. But, you know, the fact that we have 129 increase, 29 percent increase in chronically homeless um, since 2019, that's something that's very concerning. Because although we're making big steps, we're also seeing people who are on the streets for longer periods of time. Um, so that's got kind of the what I wanted to state around like the situation of homelessness and my hope that we can try to address some of these issues. Um, but I did want to get to something that's a little bit more substan substantive about um, the, the, um, the proposal that's here before us. So I, I do want to just express my, uh, similarly my concerns that Mayor Bruner brought up. I think that when these 
um, reports come forward, it would be really good for us to have tables on if we're going to shift allocations of funding where that money goes. Because just sitting here today, I was very confused about the hygiene bay. I actually thought that we were reducing our funding towards that project. Ba like after really hearing from staff and having this conversation, it, it makes sense to me now that you know there was the um, there was the ARPA funds. 1.9 million was allocated towards the hygiene bay from that source of funding. But then there's also 1.7 million from the state of California funds. And now we've reached a contract at one. Uh, 1,359,860 that's going to go towards that project. And in the report, it listed that, that you know, this is 540,140 under the projected cost for that work. And then from that source of funding, um, which was the ARPA funds, another $76,935 um, has been allocated towards um, the infrastructure costs associated with Public Works Homeless Response Field Division. What that means is that there's $463,205 from that pool that isn't allocated. Additionally, um, since there were two pools of funding for that, $1.7 million from the California state funds has now been freed up. And today the decision we're making is taking a million dollars of that and shifting it to the parks restoration. But what that means is that there's another $700,000 that is completely unaccounted for. And so, um, so that means between the two sources of funding, there's about one million, one hundred sixty-three thousand two hundred five dollars. It's kind of sitting out there that's not being accounted for, and, and so, um, so that's why it would help if we had these these tables because then you know when we're in these situations where there's more money available, we can start having those conversations around how we're going to spend that money, and it can be clear to the community that there is now actually more money available for us to use on this, and so. Um, I wanted to make um, a friendly amendment, um, or it could be a, an amendment, but that, you know, given that there's over a million dollars left toward the, that could be allocated towards other things, that we bring back an item to consider the reallocation of the remaining ARPA and California state funds initially allocated for the hygiene bay for service that include but are not limited to a vehicle for downtown outreach workers, ADA accessible transport van, winter warming center, ongoing parks cleanup, cost study for the implementation of a 24-7 non-law enforcement response, non-law enforcement alternative emergency crisis response, pilot program by no later than the second meeting in October. And again, these are, these are items that have come up before us. Um, we've spoken with our downtown outreach workers and they've said, we're more than happy to transport someone downtown to one of these facilities, but I'm not gonna use my personal vehicle. Um, we've heard from Surge and other people called in saying that the Salvation Army doesn't have an ADA accessible van to transport people from the downtown or anywhere in the community up to the armory. Um, we've heard, recently I've heard a communication that uh, Brent Adams is potentially uh, not going to continue his services with the storage program and the winter warming and I don't know if anybody is going to step up to do that work, but that's something um, that we really need to have when the temperature gets below 35 degrees. Um, the parks cleanup is going to be an issue because, as we know, if we're going to displace some people from the Vengelands, they're going to be going to other places, likely into the Poganip, and funding to help with that cleanup is going to be something that we might want to consider. There's been discussion about 24-7 non-law enforcement crisis response, and if we want to move forward with that, we should. it was recommended back in 2020, we do some kind of pilot study to understand what those costs would be. And I know there's other, um, you know, considerations by city staff on how that one point, one point one roughly million dollars could be spent, and so, you know, since it's unclear in this in these proposals where that um, additional money is going to go, I think that'd be good that we have something come back so we can direct where that money can be spent on these types of services. Second. Yeah, uh, I just wanted you threw a lot of numbers out, and without looking at it on on. Um, in front of me, does staff have have any, uh, without going too deep into this right now, do you have any comment on those figures and has this been a discussion with the funding already on the staff level? If, no. Is there an additional 1.1 million? Um, 
I'll take a I first crack at that. <laughs> just, I'll take a first crack at that if I if I can, Mayor Bruner. And I appreciate the comments, uh, Councilmember Cummings. Um, first and foremost, uh, both the ARPA funding as well as the 14 million has been iterative as we respond to shifting needs and opportunities and project costs comes into focus. We've had savings in some areas, um, and we've had some areas as we've seen today that have uh, exceeded our original estimates. And so I. I understand and appreciate the request for us to bring some clear tables that would allow us to uh, illustrate that in full transparency for the council and the community. Um, and we will certainly do that going forward. Um, I am in the process of working with Elizabeth Cabell, our uh, new finance director to um, update all the ARPA numbers as well as our long-term forecast. And so the council can have a good understanding of where that's all pacing, uh, including these ongoing updates that I anticipate we will continue to make to the 14 million uh, as, we, as we move through this process. And we, of course, want to strive to do that in as clear and transparent a way as possible. Um, with regards to the motion, there's a lot to unpack there. So there's, there's several moving parts, some of which I'm sure um, Larry and Lisa can speak to. Um, as far as the vehicles is concerned, we actually have two vans that are already on order and, and in the pipeline for purposes of assisting with outreach and transportation. Uh, Larry and the homelessness response team have been working through creative solutions to providing for ADA transportation um, as uh, based on the current needs of the population we're serving, that, that work is also already underway. Um, this week, or excuse me, last week, we had a meeting with a consultant that has worked with another uh, number of other communities to stand up 24-7 mobile crisis response units. Um, Petaluma, Santa Rosa has been a couple of uh, successful examples, and we do plan on engaging him to uh, help us with a feasibility study uh, to bring a pilot forward. We think Santa Cruz is an ideal fit for the model that they've successfully rolled out in other communities, and that is something we're currently working on we won't have that ready uh, by October. That's something we would likely bring forward after the new year. Um, as the team has mentioned today, the bench lens, restoration, and standing up shelter are our most immediate urgent priorities. Uh, and that's that's why we've brought forward the budget recommendations you have in front of, in front of you today. So those are just my initial thoughts. Sorry that's so long-winded, but uh, Larry and uh, Lisa may have some additional. Well, I was just gonna say, we have our eyes on trying to provide additional shelters uh, that we don't have identified in the budget, uh, additional transitional shelters similar to 1220, um, that we don't have identified funding. So those those needs, as the uh, city manager identified, are emerging, and we're seeing where we need them. Um, and that's, I, I think I've spent the money 10 times over. But having said that, uh, do you have anything else to add to the, the shelter piece? No, I mean, I think Matt and Lisa spoke to really the dynamic nature and some of the other plans and sort of what's in place, uh, but certainly we can we can come back with detailed information about what those moving pieces are so that you can see it in future updates. I think it's the other one thing I would add is I think just, you know, I think Matt addressed it a little bit, um, but specifically around, you know, um, an additional cost was the contract for Salvation Army. We utilized 1.3 that was for Housing Matters, um, expansion because the county is going to fund operations. Uh, the cost differential for that program was a little bit more. I think it was detailed in the, the staff report for that contract. So I want to say there was about a potential $400,000 difference depending on whether they fully expended that contract. So that's another little bit of a dynamic piece that we're, um, these services are over budgeted for what was originally in the plan. So accounting for all those pieces um, is important, but we can report back. Uh, one just last comment on the ARPA, because you specifically asked about additional availability and programming of those funds. Those decisions will come back to you all, um, and we, we intend to do so um, in a way that also gives you an update on fund, funding spent to date. And so that's those are conversations that both uh, Laura, our assistant city manager, as well as uh, our finance director um, are currently working on. So um, again, as uh, Larry pointed out, this has um, um, been somewhat dynamic. Uh, I understand that the need to want to get a firm understanding as to where those numbers are, and we, we, we will be bringing those back as there's opportunities to reprogram funding that may, that may come available. And, I, and I'd really just bring this up because, you know, in the absence of having that table where we can see what money is still available, and if there is money that's still available, and there's an explanation to the council that, you know, we do want to acknowledge that there's this leftover money, and we're considering, you know, putting it towards X, Y, and Z. 
um, that's helpful because in the absence of that, you know, I'm looking at what's what's on, you know, what's in our report, and it's like, well, there's over a million dollars just floating out there, and we have no idea how it's being being used. And so, I think, you know, personally, for the pr purposes of transparency, that's really what this is trying to get at, especially since there's been concerns raised over these types of items, and there's been interest expressed by city staff in wanting to, you know, explore these kinds of options around, you know, vans and and um, vehicles for outreach workers but then you know unless like this is the first time i've heard that oh that's being worked on and this is our you know opportunity to hear about homelessness response and what's happening around that today and so for me it's if, if i'm not hearing this information then it makes me want to say oh if there's money left over and we've heard that there's interest in these items you know let's bring back an opportunity for us to discuss this so that's that's the intention of the motion and i don't you know if we want to, I mean, that's why I also said including but not limited to, because if a report comes back and it's like, we're working on this, we're working on this, we have these other funds, we need to set aside some buffer, that's something we can make a decision on. Um, but in the absence of having that this report, I think many people would be concerned with there's a million dollars out there and we don't know what's happening with it. Yeah, I agree. I think in the next um, update that we need to give you a full financial update on, on all the, the various projects, the fundings, the sources. And, you may recall back when you uh, did program those funds, and it was this really comprehensive table, and it said where it was funding and what year the funding ran out. And it's really time to bring that back to really make sure that we all acknowledge that these are limited funds, and this is when these fundings for some of these things that we would like to be ongoing, but there isn't the funding for it. So I, I think a full um, amount of uh, report back with a, a lot of time spent on it, I think is really important. It might be also good to include um um, funding applied for as as um, another column. I'm visualizing columns. I see it too. <laughs> I like tables. Um, does that does anything change with your motion? I guess when is this coming? Like when is the schedule to come back to council? In terms of the next quarterly. Next quarterly would be on track either for late November, early December. And if it comes back with that, yeah. I'd be amenable. Because I think that these are questions that we all want to have answered. And if we're going to get an update on um, kind of you know, where we are financially, we've also heard that you know there might be um, new options for transportation. There's obviously some discussion about 24-7 crisis response. And if we can just get an update on like if we're going to do a pilot study, not even the pilot program just the study itself like how much does that cost and because these funds can go towards these types of things that we've been hearing for years the community is interested in and so and if there's other things like let's let's hear about them but um so yeah uh, council member cummings we could certainly uh cover all of that in the next quarterly update um i would caution about some of the specifics that are being that must be included because many of these have been budgeted for and, and included in the budget already uh, but i hear i hear the request for getting a fuller understanding around where those opportunities may be, what funding's been spent to date, uh, what changes have been made along the way, and we can certainly bring a more comprehensive um, discussion around that at the next quarterly update. Um, did you have a question? I just wanted to add, the county is doing a pilot crisis response, so let's talk to them, coordinate with them, see what they're doing, get information from them as we're exploring this as well. So, Okay. Sorry, I just have one comment too. Is, is that it was a community member came up to Councilmember Watkins and Cummings and I after a um, safety event at the Civic, and he had mentioned that the city of Petaluma and Ronard Park had set up a system like this um, that was separate from the county. And so, out of curiosity, um, I met with partners up in Petaluma during the break, and so did um, Chief Escalante, and then the two of us met with. Matt and gave um, the information that we got from them on how they were able to stand it up in about six months without the county. And so we have different situations here, but the first step was talking to this consultant. And so right away, I just want to acknowledge like Matt was on it. Matt was already ready to start um, that work. And so this was, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago. So I'm just super excited. I know the full council would probably be on board with something like that. But um, so I just want to say thanks to Matt for you know, getting that ball rolling on our behalf in the community. 
All right. Well, we have. Do you still have a motion on the floor? I do, and I'll just change the the date to coincide with the next quarterly update. Sorry. Yeah. Well. Yeah. There's a there's a friendly amendment. There's a, uh, it's a friendly amendment. Yeah. 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 May be available. Is the point to get an updated budget table, or is it to to basically um, say that we're going to pay for all these things? So I'm confused no. now. It is not. It's not to say that we're going to pay for these things. Okay. It's really to Just coming that. back with that updated table and right. Okay. And if they had, like, for example, if there's already, you know, alternatives for ADA transportation, if that's already in the works, then we can see what that costs. And okay, that's great. You know, but um, yeah, this is just to get information on you know costs for these services or anything else um, where this remaining kind of 1.1 million dollars could go, so that we're being you know transparent up front with where this money is going to get spent and if it doesn't go to these things that's fine but if but i think it's good that we're understanding where it's going to go and and starting to think and just about that. just for clarification the 1.1 million we don't even have that definite amount no. i'm understanding there have been shifts so if i'm if i may the um so we just heard today that the um the 1.7 million that was allocated towards the hygiene bay from the California state funds, mm -hmm. we're not going to use for that. And so we just shifted um, 1 million of that to the parks cleanup, which leaves $700,000 unaccounted for. And then similarly for the ARPA funds, we had 1.9 million from the American Rescue Plan allocated towards the hygiene bay. We're spending roughly 1.3 on that on the hygiene bay, which is the final contract. And then of the remaining roughly 500,000, 540,000, we took roughly 77,000 and allocated that towards the pu Public Works Homeless Response Field Division. And so what's remaining there is about 463,000. So that's, that's where these numbers are coming from. Mayor, if, I'm, if I may. Yes. Um, in, in terms of the language in the motion, Bonnie, do you mind putting it back up for a second? Because I think it reads a little bit confusing. If you were to put potentially um, instead of direct staff to bring back an item, I think direct staff to, um, to at the next quarterly update to bring back considerations for the reallocation. I think that reads more which accurately. Could include. Yeah. yeah. In which case, I'm happy to, as the seconder, yeah. to agree. Um, and, and then just one I note. Um, yeah, I think that that provides some clarity, and then maybe we can add. Um, can we, before you say that, is that the change you made? Bring it. Yeah. Yeah. Make an extra. And I don't even know if it needs to be an item, just consideration as part of the presentation, I guess, maybe? A consideration, it's not a separate... delete an item. Yeah. No, it's an item, right? Delete that, I think is what she's saying. I don't know. If, if, if I think if we're all on the same page, I, I guess it doesn't really matter. But I wasn't thinking of it as a separate item. I was thinking as an integrated component of the update for consideration, potentially. And I'm sure we'll have more to include in there, such as the restoration. Yeah. I didn't even budget the, you know, the little a drop in the bucket for the actual restoration of the project because I don't have that information. But my eyes were on what was remaining to, to go towards that as well. Great. Does that um, still fit with your motion and tension? Is not limited to. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, is the maker of the motion uh, that was Cal Council Member Calentari Johnson and seconded by Vice Mayor Watkins amenable yeah, to, I'm to the friendly I'm, amendment? I'm fine with this. I do have a question about Warming Center um, and just our RFP process. We've had an RFP process for the spectrum of services that we like in our community. Um, was the Warming Center part of that RFP process? Should it have been? Um, there was not a response submitted through that RFP process for that type of program. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So um, not as part of the motion, but I think let's work with our community organizations that are doing these services to encourage them to go through the process that we've set up, which is the RFP process. So, um, but I'm good with the motion. And the seconder as mm -hmm. well? I am too. Okay. Yeah. And I just have a few brief comments. Okay. I know that we're over time, so I'll keep them really short, but I just, I wanna thank again the staff for the work and I wanna thank the conversation. And I think having been on the council now, I've seen um, with really well-intentioned reports and recommendations and summaries and ad hoc committees formed to really look at how we can continue to make progress with this really complex issue. And um, over the past year and a half or so, I think we've really seen action and it's to Councilmember Kalantari Johnson's point, it's not perfect, but it's progress and we have to keep moving and it takes time. And so I just, I hold hope that moving forward, we can continue to make progress, not only for those who are unhoused in our community, but for the surrounding area. And I talk to parents who go to school with our kids that have kids that can't access that park. And we heard from neighbors there too. So it's more than just those living there. It's all of the, those impacted. And then frankly, I think having any um, unmanaged encampment is, uh, is not the way to go, one, but two, to have it right next to our river when we're seeing thousand year floods all of a sudden occur because of climate change is a complete liability for so many lives. So there, it's not perfect, but it's progress. And I think we have to remember that as we make these decisions and we're, we're seeing that and we're seeing the investment and we're seeing people do the work. So um, in the interest of time, I'll keep my comments there and I'm happy to, to support the mo motion and continue moving in this direction. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor Watkins. All right, I think uh, that concludes our comments and we're ready for a roll call vote. This is on agenda item 19, homelessness response update. Councilmember Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Holder? Aye. Cumming? Aye. Brown? No. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Bruno? Aye. That motion passes with council member Brown, one no and six yes. Thank you. Um, we have one more item before uh, oral communications and a break. So our next item is item number 20, revised fiscal impact report for the empty home tax initiative petition. For members of the community who would like to comment on this item, now would be the time to call in using the instructions on your screen the order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. And then we will take public comment and return to council for deliberation and action. If you are joining us here in person, if you'd like to comment on item number 20, revised fiscal impact report for the empty home tax initiative petition, you can line up here on the right of the dais and sign in at the podium. So at this time, I would like to welcome presenter Marisol Gomez, Assistant Director of Finance. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the council and members of the public. It's my pleasure to be back here with you today to present the update to the Empty Homes Tax Fiscal Analysis. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. You see the PowerPoint, okay. All right, just wanna make sure you guys can see the PowerPoint. Yes, okay. we can, thank the you. Slide. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. Um, so uh, an agenda.
agenda of the presentation would be just some background on MP Homes tax, um, the recap of council and public concerns, and a revised fiscal impact report. So what is the empty homes tax, um, parcel tax on vacant homes? Uh, vacant uh, means less than 120 days per year in use and revenue use is supportable to affordable housing initiatives. Uh, this is a citizen based initiative. Some of the concerns and um, the public comment from the previous meeting and also emails that we have um, that we have um, uh, received and, and reviewed. Um, some of the concerns are startup costs, website costs, um, legal costs, committee costs, um, use of the SCMU utility data, revenue estimates and data collection. So we'll try to address these concerns and recap here in the PowerPoint and we also have them um, addressed in the uh, attached agenda report. So starting off with IT startup and website costs. I know there was a lot of comparison between um, what we have listed and what was listed in the Oakland um, uh, uh, fiscal impact for their measure. Um, in talking with consultants of the, the city of Oakland, the consultants that do the work for the city of Oakland for their vacant tax, um, the estimate that was on their fiscal in impact for startup costs was 100000 and in talking with the consultants, the actual costs were, were more like 850000 Um, What Oakland had to do was um, build a custom, a, um, a custom database uh, and web portal for, for their customers. So those estimates in comparison were just um, underestimated as, you know, this was a new tax and that was the best estimate they had at, at that point in time. Um, and speaking with our IT team, um, I know there was a lot of concerns about um, having costs in there for, for um, you know, startup costs, website costs related to if this measure was to pass related to the MC Homes Tax um, Initiative. Uh, after talking with our IT department, um, they um, were saying that the, you know, the estimates um, that we have uh, seemed fair and that they would caution that if, if this measure is passed and we do, um, move forward with it that it just depends on what's available if we might require a new database for for this uh, data set a SQL license virtual server and of course um, additional staff um, time from them and that um, in the attachments as well shows the the hours there um, and you know in our RT team there um, we have a lot of professionals that work for us and um, our IT directors um, fabulous so they walk us through the process of, you know, um, anything new, they have a system. Um, their process for implementing anything um, includes uh, steps in the process and they work with all the stakeholders uh, to prepare, design, build, test the point, sustain um, these changes. For litigation costs, I know there was some concern about um, having some uh, litigation costs in the startup section. So. Uh, litigation costs are difficult to predict um, and after reviewing with city staff we agreed uh, to keep this estimate in. Um, even with successful litigation uh, with our legal counsel we will incur costs by the city. Um, um, there is other costs involved in, in not just uh, an issue over the ordinance but also about protest and exemption and small claims for tax collection and unpaid taxes. For committee costs, um, I did do some research and met with the um, SCCRTC Measure D Taxpayer Oversight Committee Administrators, um, and we did scale back some of the um, some of the hours that we put towards uh, meetings. In the new estimate, you'll see three to four regular committee meetings per year, and estimating one to two community meetings per year. Um, and we did uh, separate the cost for regular and community meetings out in our attachment um, for the for the cost so that way you can see which one is allocated for which type of meeting. Um, just just to note that the Measure D Oversight Committee, uh, they have a five member committee and uh, the empty homes tax is staying up to nine uh, members. So also to note the Measure D Committee, they, they meet twice a year uh, for a minimum of two hours 
um, and they're slated to meet three, but they've normally uh, met two so far since they, they started. So uh, they have some fluctuation there as well, which is why we've provided an estimate um, for three to four meetings. Okay. <clears throat> uh, next slide, we're just talking about the revenue estimates. Um, there was some concern uh, about the revenue estimates. We saw concerns on both sides, either the estimates were high or the estimates were low. I did speak with the county. Um, they had done some preliminary analysis for a similar tax measure. Uh, they decided to not bring it forward this year, but in talking with them and how they sort of broke down the analysis, we saw that our, our range that we use for the estimate and also the exemption range seemed in line with what what they had used for some of their calculations. Um, it, it's not all the same, but um, in meeting with them and getting outside view on on how um, better to estimate this, they felt like it was a fair estimate. Um, so for the Santa Cruz um, Municipal Utilities data, some of the concerns were that, um, you know, that we could utilize this data in order to provide a better, um, a, a better idea of vacant properties. So right now, um, as we had discussed before, we know that consumption data is private. Um, and in speaking with our um, SEMU department, um, you know, they, they warned us that zero consumption does not indicate vacancy. There's a slew of things that could be happening. You have stuck meters or meters that are not reading right. You have closed and open meter um, because of closed and open accounts. And also just to know that um, they have a meter project that will be finalized um, next year. And so, you know, these are things in our estimate currently, um, you know, we use based on the information we have. And then down the road, if this measure does move forward, there could be a possibility of utilizing some form, um, but we don't know at this time. So uh, this is the, um, declaration process that was also a concern from some of the public uh, during the last meeting just uh, saying that if we left it up to um, to property owners to um, property owners to uh, declare their vacancy status um, but we just wanted to make it clear from how the ordinance uh, how the proposed uh, ordinance is written that this is what the declaration declaration process was um, property owner must declare vacancy status by April 15. Um, also going back the fiscal year 24, 25 would be the, the first year this would be uh, implemented for the for the full, for the prior full calendar year. Um, owner exemptions would be verified by the city and the city may audit prop properties annually. So as mentioned throughout the proposed measure, uh, the final process for for uh, doing these items um, is up to the city. So uh, right now, these are just estimates um, allocated in the, um, the fiscal impact report from what we have. And then if this measure goes forward, uh, the city will address the best way to, to um, satisfy all the processes of the ordinance. Um, so here we have the summary of changes, of cost changes. Uh, this first column here is the June 28th uh, original estimate and then the revised estimate and also this is listed in the agenda report, um, more descriptions on the section. Um, you can see that the total startup cost we did reduce um, after looking at some of the um, sections there. Um, and then total ongoing committee, um, as mentioned, we did reduce by the number of um, by some of the the information there and by reducing the the number of committee meetings and and what's tied to that some legal costs there were reduced um so to total ongoing administrative um this did increase because we added in um a key element of uh administrative costs that wasn't included prior and that was actually uh coming from the housing and economic development uh, department of um, project management once these funds are assigned um, uh, a purpose uh, to manage that project going forward. So that wasn't included previously. And so we added that as well. Um, and so when we're looking at total uh, first year, um, 
what we did here is just clarify what, what that should mean. So startup cost plus half of the ongoing, half of the administrative. As we know, in any startup year, it's not going to be a full um, full ongoing cost. There's, we're ramping up in that first year. So that's, um, that's the comparison there between this new estimate and the last. And then total ongoing would be uh, these two total uh, going forward. Again, the estimates uh, in the fiscal impact reports are, are just estimates put forward. If the measure is passed, uh, the city will um, will uh, address uh, the actual processes and what's used for for um, addressing the, the vacant lots and then the processes of who would be working on what. So I just wanted to add as well that um, we knew that within the measure, administrative costs are capped at 15% of revenue. Um, and so for the range that we estimated, uh, 2.5 to 4 million in revenue, that would be between 375,000 and 600,000. So our estimate estimate of ongoing administrative is below uh, the 15% at this time. And that's um, the presentation. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, for the presentation and the updated estimate and analysis on those costs. I would like to um, bring back uh, questions to the council. Um, if anybody has any questions on those updates for Mighty Soul. Council Member Brown. I do have a couple of questions um, and I'm, I may have more depending on <laughs> what I hear um, in response. But um, I guess I um, will say I'm glad to have received the revised report and really appreciate the work that you all, have, that staff has invested in Marisol. Thank you um, for trying to get, doing your best to get a handle on a, a, an approach that has um, some pretty significant unknowns. Um, but I guess I'm 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 still um, feeling like the administrative cost projections make assumptions that um, it's not clear to me why those assumptions are being made. So, for example, um, what what when you decided for meetings to cost out um, the um, and at on admin. What do you anticipate happening at those meetings? I mean, measure, the Measure D Committee meets twice a year over a, a much more complex uh, administrative, um, you know, well, not the collection system per se, but um, certainly on how those funds are spent and a significantly uh, higher um, revenue stream. And so I guess I'm, and, and they somehow managed to do it in one or two meetings. And so I guess I'm just wondering what you anticipate would be happening and why we those so many meetings would have to happen um, for one and then um, another question I have is related to, it's, it's it, it may be more of a question for Tony um, but I'll, I'll wait to hear uh, our response on that thanks Sure, thank you. So I know um, as the proposed measures written currently that the commission, uh, the committee could have some proposed changes to policy and ordinance and in regards to um, land use and things of that nature. Um, and so in speaking with uh, the planning department, it felt that some of those changes, if they were to come about, may require additional follow-up meetings. So that was one of the reasons. The other reasons is because this is um, a new tax measure, uh, we, we did make the assumption that we're going to be meeting um, more often the first few years until we get this under our belt and, and things sort of um, have a normal, um, you know, fluctuation to them or less of a fluctuation to what we need to meet about originally. So that's also something to take into account. The, the estimates in the fiscal impact are not um, like over a five-year span. Let's say uh, we're just talking about the startup and the first year, and um, you know, possibly these uh, could be reduced um, as we know exactly what we're getting into. 
Okay, um, so just as a follow-up then, um, I, I'm, I'm not sure how much of a cost was allocated to the potential for the planning department being involved in some of this, um, and how much of the additional was a, a tr would be attributed to economic development, because I, I didn't see those breakdowns, and I don't want to micromanage or scrutinize. Um, but it, it does seem like a lot of money um, for something that may or may not happen. And I guess that gets me to my um, a, a clarifying question that I think um, a Cindy Dawson from the Empty Home Tax campaign was trying to get resolved through your office, Tony. And I have um, like threads of emails and I tried to pull out what I thought was relevant here. Um, <coughs> So, so our understanding is that when we wrote this, the, the scope of work for this oversight committee was defined as meeting once per year, publishing an annual report, and reviewing financial and operational reports produced by staff. Um, and that some other things may occur. Um, and um, having had a conversation recently with a reporter who seemed bound and determined to and vision and lay out uh, the, the, you know, a, a very a aggressive scenario for this <laughs> committee, um, where they're meeting all the time, demanding the staff time, and you know, I mean, it, there's there's nothing in this that says the staff has to over, has to administer um, meetings on demand for a committee, um, and there's nothing in here that so even if a committee was formed and, and wanted to talk about some of those things. There's nothing that guarantees them staff support for that. Um, and, um, and so I guess, um, and, and it, it just keeps, you know, it, it keeps sounding like, well, the language isn't clear, or the language, um, I think the, what the reporter told me was, you've got a big giant loophole in here. And, um, and so I know there was some additional communication about um, the ability of the city to, the city council making cl clarifying that and um, and if that's the case, is that something that we can do here? Because I just feel like it's a. Can you do that here this evening? I mean, not here this evening, but can the city council do it? Can can we do that? Yes, and then in I, I believe that you were copied on my correspondence with Ms. Dawson. There's a provision yeah. in the empty homes text that allows the city council to amend the ordinance, and I want to get it correct, so I'm just going to. Um, says the ordinance may only be amended by a vote of the people if the amendment would result in the special tax being imposed, extended, increased, uh, decreased, or imposed, extended, decreased, or increased in a manner not authorized by the ordinance, but the city council is authorized to amend Chapter 338 um, in a manner that, that does not increase or decrease the tax rates or otherwise constitute a tax increase. So. As written, there may be argument about the scope of the authority of the, of the committee, but the council could, if it passes, curb that by ordinance. And, so, and that would have to happen after it was yes. adopted. Okay, I just wanted to make sure, and, and that I didn't, I wasn't totally clear about, but I'll confess that occasionally I ask a question for the benefit of the public when I already know the answer, because I feel like this is a really important one. <laughs> So uh, I, I wasn't I'm aware, to, and I just wanted to make sure it was very clear for everybody. I wasn't trying to put you on the spot about that, but I understand. I was just mostly happy to answer any other questions you might have. Uh, okay. Um, so I'll, I think I'll leave it there for now. Um, I do have a few comments that I'll save for later. And Mayor, if, if I could, um, I could respond to one of the questions yes. that Councilmember Brown uh, mentioned. Um, it, you had asked uh, Council Member Brown about the um, specific time um, that was allocated to planning and housing and community development or uh, uh, economic development staff. And um, we, um, there is a table at the back of the um, report that has the specific number of hours that is fit, that are identified. Um, and um, so, um, it's, uh, the last, it's the last page of the report, and that has the, the hours broken down. 
And then um, there was, um, in, in terms of the um, need to support the committee, um, part of that was, you know, the need to dedicate staff hours towards that committee if they chose to pursue things like um, uh, policy options related to affordable housing. There's a provision in the uh, the measure that says um, this is. Let me get the section number for you. Uh, 3.38.70 uh, I. And it says the city manager or designee shall provide clerical assistance, administrative support, and technical assistance to the committee and shall be present at the committee meetings. And so when we were having those conversations with finance about um, would there be support provided to the committee um, if there are um, technical questions related to affordable housing and development issues, we um, uh, look to that provision to say that both um, the planning department, planning community development department, and the economic development and housing department would both be providing that support and in some instances both be attending um, those meetings. And so that's where um, I just wanted to, to respond directly to some of those comments about um, some of the uh, assumptions that went in, notwithstanding the issues that you mentioned about the council being future councils being able to shift those. Just wanted to provide a little bit more context. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I, if I could just get, um, because I, I, and I appreciate you mentioning that we do have access to that information. It, it passed me by. And so I'm just wondering, you said it's on the last page um, and I'm scanning the line items. There's 58 here. Do you have any, happen to know where oh, I can find I'm, that? I'm sorry. I was just looking at the, um, it's the revised impact report. So um, it's it's what's posted with the packet here, and um, that's one of page one of six, or excuse me, page six of six. Right. There's a table that that's a big table on page six, and so I'm just wondering yes. which line item. I, I'm just trying. I oh, can't find oh, the I'm planning sorry. cost versus economic um, development cost I, because now I do want to know. Now I'm curious. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So um, if you look, it's actually um, in line items thirty. Six has the community meetings, and then um, 35 has the um, attend the committee meetings three to four a year. And so that that's planning. That's uh, planning. well. That that actually, if you if you look across the top, it has finance, planning, and gotcha. economic development, IT, gotcha. um, and city manager's office, and then um, there are additional breakdowns there. Um, with the specific hours. And so that's where Marisol uh, reached out to myself and to uh, Bonnie Lipscomb and economic development and um, plugged in some estimates for the time that we would spend if we were um, looking at um, three or four meetings per year. And I can tell you from my perspective, I just said, all right, well, what kind of time estimates do we spend on an item that goes to the planning commission? or you know a single planning commission meeting and a couple of those items yeah thank thank you i i and i don't want to cut you off but i i i'm i get it now what what you're where the i get it so i'm i'm just going with the column and the row and so now i see that it was not about a specific set of tasks but related to how you know if it were this many meetings what would it cost and i appreciate that thank you uh lee butler all right. Are there any other questions, Council Member Brown? Nope. Okay. Any other council members with questions before I take it out to public comment? Okay. So at this time, uh, for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you wish to comment on, this is agenda item number 20, revised fiscal impact report for the empty home tax initiative petition. Please uh, raise your hand. You can call in with instructions on your screen. They should be coming up. And then you can raise your hand by pressing star nine on your phone or selecting the raise hand feature in the webinar controls on your computer. When it's your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted and the timer will be set to two minutes. 
If you're a member of the public joining us here in chambers and want to comment on this item, please line up to the right of the dais and you will have two minutes to speak as well. I will look to see if there are any virtual attendees that would like to speak. And if we can get the instructions up on the screen for those calling in, please, thank you. I have uh, four hands raised virtually. So I'll go ahead and start and they'll alternate. Uh, the first name is Cindy Dawson, yes on measure N. And go ahead and press star six to unmute. Hello, uh, good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, good afternoon council member Cindy Dawson with the Yes on Measure M campaign. I just wanna thank staff for their additional work on the revised report. I'm here representing um, thousands of residents that are supporting Measure N who believe there still remains uh, a few misrepresentations sh that should be fixed um, and, and um, some costs that are unwarranted. I submitted my written comments, but I just wanna call out a, a couple things really quickly. Um, first, I wanna just again point out and take a pause to say that the, the city's report says that this will raise 2.5 to $4 million a year for affordable housing. And this is a revenue positive program. So that is important to emphasize. And um, I think it should be highlighted better in the report. I want to say that by design, the empty home tax took great care um, to make sure that there weren't um, fixed administrative costs and that the, the meaning that the city can scale their administrative costs based on the revenue. Again, keeping this revenue positive. Um, Sandy mentioned, uh, Council Member Brown mentioned a $100,000 line item for legal. Um, that is unwarranted and unprecedented and needs to be removed. Um, the scurrible work of the tax committee is to meet one time a year unless the city a council approves meeting more than that. Um, I encourage you, I, I included some language that you could amend um, if this passes. So um, that would be really clear again. And those costs should be significantly scaled back to one meeting a year, which would bring the cost around $15,000 a year. Details are in my comments. Um, and I also just want to say that, you know, if you make these appropriate adjustments um, that, you know, we're talking about, again, a net positive program. And I want to just uh, mention what staff said, which is their, your current estimate, not adjusted, of $344,000 of the admin a year is under the low end revenue estimate, again, making this a net positive program. So I think it's important for the, the public and council to understand that we're bringing millions of dollars for affordable housing. This is a straightforward, fair approach. Um, and we really hope that you will um, make the adjustments to the report. And we will look forward to continuing to connect with Santa Cruzans um, and add to the thousands of residents who are already supporting Measure M and are ready to take action to create more affordable housing in our community. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for your comment. I will invite the next uh, public comment here in person. Thank you for waiting. Welcome. Um, I'm gonna take down my mask, which I don't like doing, and I appreciate that um, the mayor and um, Councilwoman Myers is wearing one. I think everybody in here should, because we have high spikes in our county. It's not just about getting COVID, it's about not spreading it to others. So I um, apologize for this. Um, I'm speaking really more to the community. I think um, Council Member Brown kind of pointed out some, some biases, and so did the last caller in the staff report. But I have to say, this is a comment I saw on Nextdoor. I've been monitoring this open empty house tax. And one person said on their neighborhood street, because of Airbnb and vacation homing or second, you know, a person who has money to have a, a beach house, that he's the only one living in his house full time on his street, which all these empty houses create um, a potential for criminal action. Because if nobody's looking out for their neighbor, there's gonna be break-ins and other things like people working out of these houses. So the criminal, the criminal issue, when I grew up in the suburbs of LA, 
every house was occupied. And I want to point out, not only should we pass this empty tax, because there's so many empty houses, and there's so many people without housing here, that we should also make sure that every Airbnb person, it, since they're running a business out of their house, that they have to um, have business licenses from the city, and they have to report all income. So the city can get the tax money from that, um, including with all the vacation homes. And I also want to point out, when you talk about affordable housing, you're not talking about real affordable. Almost all the housing that you've approved so far is not affordable. Um, I don't even think one homeless person will get a unit out of this. If at most, there'll be a dozen. So it's not affordable. It's affordable for a tech person, like a young person just starting out in tech to get a lower rent. AMI is not low income. Let's give an example. I lived in a project big section eight, and my rent on my income, because my income was $1,000, was $350 a month. For me, that was affordable, even though it took up a fairly good chunk of my money. But with the AMI, if I was 30% of an AMI, which my unit was owned by the city, so it would go to the AMI, it would have been 600 plus, um, even 800. That was not affordable, and it never will be. I wish I could say more, but that's it. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public, I'll take virtually phone number ending in 0249. Hi there, welcome. Hi, thank you for taking my comments and for all your work. This is Carol Polhamus, and I would like to thank the staff for um, re-examining the city costs. Um, but I have to say I was very disappointed that the revenue estimates were not reanalyzed as well. I've done my own calculations uh, extensively, and when I take the total homes and I take out the the ones in the rental inspection program, the homeowner's exemption, the vacation rentals, which are exempt, by the way, those on the market, those under construction, and the general exemption rate um, from other cities, I found that in, in my estimate, the high is 150 homes and the low is 100. So why does this matter? Um, I think it matters greatly for two reasons. One, you know, I just heard that at the higher estimate, of the city's um, empty homes, which is 705, the city costs do come under the 15%. But at the city's lower estimate, they do not. It will cost the city money every year from the general fund to run this program because it will cost $450,000 a year to run it. And at the lower end, it will be 340 some uh, brought in. <laughs> so the reason it matters is that the city voters need to understand than an accurate number because they need to know whether it's worth it to vote for this or not. I think if people understand that it's going to cost money from the general fund every year and city services every year to bring in a diminishing um, no, amount of money for affordable housing, which we do badly need, um, they're not going to vote for it. And I think we owe the voters an accurate description of that. So even though the water information, as I just heard, is private, there's no reason it has to be done individually. It could be done on the aggregate to come up with an accurate number. I think the voters need to know that this proposal, even though it may sound great at first glance, is actually going to cost the city money every year. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your comment. I'd like to invite the next person here in person. Hi there, welcome. Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Jack Ryan Rodriguez, and good evening, Council. I want to let you uh, thank you guys for you guys' dedication to this community. Um, <clears throat> I actually um, I want to speak on this, this last matter that just um, we just went through. Kind of nervous speaking to you guys, um, um, but I also want to in include, if I can, um, the one right before it about the bench lands. I think we're actually speaking on item 20, the fiscal impact report for the empty home tax initiative right now. So I think um, well, the reason why I brought that one up is because I, I feel like they, some, they, they could go hand in hand in a sense of um, a solution from the bench land for some of the vacant homes 
um, if there are vacant homes or properties that, um, like she said, that there's a, a mem member of the community who is the only person on the street throughout the week, um, and she was uh, 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 concerned by the risk of criminal activities, um, I know some of the people in this community might blame the bench lands for some of those community uh, criminal activities, which can be very, very well um, accurate, but I'm not sure. I mean, I don't know. Um, but I know for a fact that um, those homes that are vacant, um, there's people there in the bench land who are willing to work, who lost their homes and stuff like that from the, the pandemic who are ready to work. And so some of those houses, I'm sure, need maintenance or um, maintaining or security or some of those houses are, are too big for uh, uh, someone to purchase, we can make them into boarding homes. I used to run recovery homes. Um, I was um, was part of Victory Outreach for about 10 years, and we went to uh, communities all throughout the United States and throughout the world, and we targeted, you know, gang-infested, drug-infested, and we planted recovery homes and training centers. And vacant buildings or vacant homes like this would, were ideal for, uh, you know, a recovery home. Um, I think this town really needs something like that, where um, we're not just fighting homeless against the community because we're all one, we're all one, um, but coming up with a solution. And so um, I'm living there for the last two years um, because of um, um, the pandemic and um, um, the fire and stuff like that. I kind of found myself you know, right there in the middle. And since um, kind of having that, not as an occupation, but as a lifestyle of you know, bringing recovery or bringing um, hope back to people. Um, that's kind of what I've been doing for the last two years. And it's been, you know, slow but surely, um, um, baby steps, but uh, people are picking up their own trash right now. When la last two years ago, they, they just were laying in their own filth. Um, now that's not every individual, but it, it's one out of 10. And when, you know, that's, that's, that's remarkable to, for me to look at. Um, so um, I was just trying to address if there are some vacant homes that are, you know, about to be foreclosed or whatever, maybe we can get them donated or, or I mean, there's, there's, I'm sure we all can come up with some solutions and I'm just gonna let you guys know that I can be an applicant or an avenue um, um, because there are people, um, I can have at least 150 people backing me that, um, that are trustworthy, um, that can help, you know, um, bring this community back to where it's supposed to be. We're, we're a strong community. We have a lot of tourists that come and, and we're in the public eye, so, um, we can we can show them that you know it, uh, it can be it's possible and there's lots of opportunity. Thank you so much. Our next member of the public is virtual. Phone number ending in one seven zero five. Go ahead and press star six. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi there. Great. Um, well, this is Eric Ryberg, and I uh, appreciate. Staff's hard work and the fiscal impact report. I also appreciate Councilmember Brown's um, desire to get more accurate cost estimate. But I, like um, Carol Polamis, I'm disappointed that staff didn't re-examine the revenue estimate. But I think we need accurate information on both costs and revenues. And um, there's some confusion between uh, what an exemption means and what uh, a house is doesn't have to pay the tax if it's occupied or in use for at least 120 days. Exemptions are for houses that are not in use for 120 days, but they still qualify for some sort of exemption. So what staff did, they started out with um, all the homeowners exemptions. They looked at the residential rental inspection program. They looked at the short-term short -term rental registry. And that they from that, they got a number of a potential of 1,069 houses that were uh, not in use for 120 days. And from that, they said, well, they estimated arbitrarily, in my view, 34% to 66% um, would qualify for one of the exemptions, even though they weren't in use for 120 days. Now, the problem with that is 1,069 homes, there, there are not, by, by their methodology, there's going to be a lot more homes that are actually in use for 120 days that aren't captured. They, they, for one reason or another, the homeowner didn't take the exemption. They're rentals, but they're not actually on the rental inspection program. Um, <clears throat> whatever. There's a whole bunch of different reasons. In my limited time, I can't go through them. I did write you a pretty extensive 
uh, letter. So I hope you can look at that. I think it's really important that the public and council understand numbers accurately. And I, I get that the proponents want to get, they don't want excessive costs in the fiscal impact report. And that's, that's good, that's appropriate, but we also don't wanna have, we wanna have a realistic estimate of both costs and revenues. And I really feel like you got, maybe council got <laughs> a little bit on staff's case because some, you know, the proponents really wanted to lower that cost number down, but I think it's really important that you look at both of them, both the cost and the revenues. So um, one point of comparison is Vancouver, a city, a major international city that has a population 10 times the size of Santa Cruz. The last year, their official report, they had about 1,600 homes that were paying their tax. I think it's really unrealistic that, you know, we're going to have anywhere near the number. I mean, we're a tenth the size of Vancouver, and we don't have the international traffic that Vancouver does. So just that as a benchmark, if we were anything like Vancouver, we'd have 160 empty homes. Uh, so, you know, I, I really Thank you. urge the, the, the to timer ask, has ask rung. to take a closer look at the revenue side as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your comment. Are there any other members in person that would like to speak to the empty, the revised fiscal impact report for the empty home? tax initiative petition okay we have one more hand virtually uh i see the name i am watching you go ahead and press star yes, six. Uh, the odious empty homes tax seeks to impose a so-called tax actually a huge fine by the approval of a majority of people who aren't affected by it imposed on a tiny minority that hasn't done anything wrong in a democratic republic, minority rights should be protected against the unaffected majority. But the backers of this aren't really Democrats. They seem like socialists and want to be communists who didn't get the message of the people when that other vicious attack on private property measure M miserably failed. The sure sign of a bad government is that it is more concerned with politics than running a city delivering quality efficient service to the people. That a city council member is involved is a stain on the city and a betrayal of American principles. As I said in my letter to the Sentinel, Oakland is regarded as the seventh worst run city in America, and this measure is more extreme, read a wannabe bully totalitarian state than theirs. Whatever you write as a financial analysis, be sure to make it crystal clear this can cost the city in perpetuity, for sure if when revenue doesn't provide 85% of the cost. I suspect uh, these few second home people aren't that dumb and will figure out ways to avoid paying an astronomic $6,000 fine. Even if the properties are rented out, I suspect it won't be to a single proponent of this measure because I doubt any of them can afford the rent on these types of second homes. And those who can have choices that are not exactly street walking. Any money generated will benefit the few, probably subsidizing, attracting poverty, and increase the government dependence trap, which is always a trade-off downside of a welfare state. It's communist in nature, a system that has always led to misery and more poverty. It is also pure theft. I don't take the homeowner exemption myself. Your revenue estimates for sure, I suspect, are off by one home anyway. Thanks. Thank you for your comment. Uh, our next, th there's a phone number ending in 6959. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hi there. Hi, this is Lynn Renshaw with SantaCruzTogether.com. We are running the campaign to oppose Measure N. Please go to our website to get a yard sign and learn more about this. I want to talk broadly about this uh, um, Measure N. It's intrusive, extreme, and punitive. It creates new bureaucracy and costs. It won't lower rent or reduce homelessness. Measure N will invade the privacy of every homeowner. It requires every homeowner to register with a government agency. Measure N creates a public registry of every homeowner. 
and enables random audits. Only by registering and proving that you live in your home can you avoid a 6,000 per household tax. Even residents living at home will face penalties if they mistakenly register late or fail to comply with random audits by the new requirements. Every day you're late, you're liable for a misdemeanor and a thousand dollar fine. These criminal penalties are extreme and wrong. Addressing affordable housing in Santa Cruz needs to be done and it isn't easy. This divisive measure won't build meaningful new housing and will saddle us forever with something that won't work. Please, everyone listening, vote no on this poorly conceived household tax. It creates more problems than it could ever solve. Uh, thank you. Okay, it looks like that concludes our public comment for this report. I'm just making sure those are all the attendees with their hands raised. Yes, okay. Um, so at this time, thank you. In addition to the public comment we heard just now, five emails were sent to city council at cityofsantacruz.com on this item. And uh, thank you to Marisol Gomez, Assistant Director of Finance. Um, we received the revised fiscal impact report that was presented and uh, are there any other comments uh, from council? Go ahead, sure. council member Brown. Uh, so I had a question. Are we at being asked to take action to receive this report? There's no action. There's no action, okay. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that because I, I think that, as I've said, the um, numbers on the costs could be reduced considerably and realistically, um, but I, I, I want to ask a question now because this keeps coming up and it's not actually um, wasn't on the agenda but because a member of the public spoke to it and I've heard that argument made um, in, in the next door universe and in the Santa Cruz together universe um, about the um, public registry the invasive public registry and so I wanted to try to get a sense um, I know that wasn't really this was a fiscal report um, but based upon your, and maybe Tony, this is a question for you, sorry to put you on the spot. Um, nothing in this ordinance, the way it was written, um, suggests the establishment of a registry. And so I'm just wondering if you can help me understand where that, that um, concern that's being expressed or asserted as fact is coming from. My understanding is that there's an annual report that um, homeowners are required to submit. I'm not sure what the registry reference is to. Well, a, a member of the public said this will create an invasive, expensive, um, inappropriate, I can't remember the term, standard words she uses, um, registry. Um, and there's no registry. I mean, I was involved in writing this, um, and I'm very proud to have done that because I tried to make it happen through the city council, and if that had happened, some of you all may have had more of a chance to be involved in the crafting of it, um, but that didn't happen, and so we went out to the community. Um, and sorry, I just had to say that, um, but I want to get clear about this now with the, I mean, while we have an opportunity to speak about it on the public agenda, um, because my understanding was a registry, you know, when, when uh, and I'm also, I'm very much supportive of that, but that's not what we're talking about here. And when uh, two council members, current council members um, in previous councils were trying to work on a registry, the costs were considerably higher than that. So I guess I'm just really trying to understand um, if we, if you could, if that not, is your interpretation or not. I'm not familiar of, with a, with a registry component of the measure. There's an annual declaration generally right. maintained on file by the city in some database, but um, not, not nope. to my knowledge, a publicly available registry. And I think we would consider that um, similar to the way we consider sales tax data and other data that Thank would you. generally not be available. Thank you. Just wanted to make that clear. 
I will just say it's six o'clock. We have a time certain oral communications. So um, we can um, wrap up this item and okay. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, report again. And I see Marisol, I don't know if you're still there. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. Thank okay. Good evening and welcome to our 6 p.m. session of the August 23rd, 2022 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call roll. Um, Councilmember Calentari Johnson. Aye. Oh, here. Here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Aye, I'm here. <laughs> Golder. Here. Cummings. Here. Brown. Here. Myers. Here. Vice Mayor Watkins. Here. And Mayor Bernard. Present. Thank you. Uh, okay, so at this time, uh, we will go into oral communications and then we will have a short break before our final item. So oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on today's agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you wish to comment during oral communications, now is the time to call in and instructions should be coming up on your screen. Oral communication is an opportunity to speak to us on items not listed on today's agenda and you can raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting the raise hand feature in the webinar controls on your computer. You will then have two minutes to speak. Members of the public who are joining us here in person today, please line up to the right side of the dais. You will have two minutes to speak and we ask that you sign in to ensure correct spelling of your name at the front of the podium However, it's not required. Please remember this is a time for council to hear from the public. We are not able to engage in dialogue with each member of the public, but when we are able, we will address questions after oral communications. At this time, I will look to our virtual attendees if there are any hands raised. And I'm not seeing any i see one okay i will go ahead and start with the name i am watching you okay the uh the statements council made justifying the proposed higher hotel and vacation rental taxes last meeting when re-examined are not just weak but they're lame like two broken legs you said the city's taxes have always followed the county taxes of course, this is irrelevant as hotel taxes vary by city from three to 14% around the state, vary within the county, and the rates in reality are paired with what the market can bear without burdening businesses pricing in a competitive landscape. Who takes the risk? Not you, but our businesses do if it turns away any tourist customers whatsoever. Uh, no to you saying it's only tourists that will pay. Also, would you be lowering rates if the county did? insert the laugh track here you said it's needed to make a level playing field whose playing field our hotels could be enjoying a competitive advantage over the county with relatively lower rates and installing a permanent tax disadvantage to short-term vacation rentals compared to hotels at the highest rate in the state is the opposite of a level playing field you said it's been 10 years since hotel taxes were raised Taxes and fees based on price, unlike many forms of revenue, are 100% inflation protected. When sales and prices go up, tax revenue goes up, and it has a lot. How nice for you, meaning the city. I ask, how often do you think taxes should go up? What, like every couple of years? Perhaps the socialists and communists would say yes, because for them, the government's never big enough or expensive enough. Thanks. Thank you. I will alternate here and um, invite the next person here in person to come to the podium. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, I'm Pat Colby. Um, I got a legal from the senior lead attorney at the National Law Center on Homelessness 
She's like one of the experts that gets quoted in big media. Her name is Tristia Bauman. I work closely with her and I've talked. In fact, my brother and I got her connected with Lily Graham of Disability Rights and the Northern California ACLU. So I'm sure you're gonna be hearing from them soon. Um, the reading of Martin versus Boise, which too bad the um, city attorney isn't here because he's giving you improper information, says that it has to be legal indoor shelter to be exempt from, being, from violating Martin versus Boise. It has to have proper facilities that does not include porta potties. Um, and then the next word I'm gonna say that I haven't, well, two words, that I haven't heard anybody bring up because I don't play in the local arena here. I go to the feds and I go to the big media and I go to agencies like Tristia Bauman's National Law Center on Homelessness because they actually have the right data and they actually have the facts. Um, civil rights, those camps that you're proposing violate so many civil rights, I can't even list them. Um, locking people in and not allowing them the right to move freely is a major civil right. I know that people that are in housing would never allow you to do that to them. That's one civil right, that's an example. Um, also, locking people, there should be different camps for different levels of people. Unlike um, Ms. Myers said, not every homeless person, and I'm so tired of reading this, is a drug addict or a mentally ill person. Those are the minority of the homeless population. I was homeless from 2016 to um, 2019, and I saw what the homeless population made up of, and my facts and my observations go hand in hand with the National Law Center on Homelessness. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public has phone number ending in 1705. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, Council. This is Eric Rodberg again. I'm, um, I wanted to address the issue of the Hilltop Apartments. I am a uh, named party to the 2008 Comprehensive Settlement Agreement, which settled all litigation between the city, the county, and private citizens against the UCSC regarding the long range, the 2005 long range development program. One of the provisions of that settlement agreement was that the university was required to notify the city and county before purchasing any in town properties. Um, <clears throat> and apparently with the regents purchase of the Hilltop Apartments, they failed to do that. So I believe they're likely in violation of the 2008 CSA. Also, it looks like they're violating the tenants' rights in various ways, such as um, constructive evictions, and uh, which you could ask the city attorney what that means, but uh, they're not, they're effectively forcing people out by you know, making unreasonable demands on them, um, potentially violating the city's relocation ordinance, violating the tenants' right to um, the quiet entitlement and various other things. Also, I'd like to say the university as a whole, all this controversy, you know, like kind of the infighting within the community um, about the high cost of housing, the high cost of rental housing, nothing the city can do is going to actually move the needle significantly. The only thing that can move the needle is getting UCSE to drastically lower its rental prices on campus. And what they've effectively done is divide the city divert attention away from their own culpability. For example, if you look at the current housing prices on campus for apartments, not dorms, so this is housing only, not food, they're currently charging $1,256 per person per month for four students to share a room in an apartment. So it's $5,000 for a single room in an apartment that has more rooms. It's outrageous. So I want you to, I'd like the city council to actually take action so that um, number one, whatever Hilltop UC has violated with Hilltop, get your legal department to look into that. And also, Eric, I think the thank focus you. Your really timer is up. 
Our next member of the public is here in person. Go ahead and speak. Yeah, uh, my name's Keith McHenry, and I just got done visiting with uh, people waiting for the van to go up to the armory and to um, Overlook or whatever the new name is. And um, they say there's virtually no room there already right now. Um, that makes sense. Uh, as Pat had said, the really Martin versus Boise makes it clear that it should be indoor space. Paul Lee pointed out to me, Paul Lee of the Paul Lee Loft, if in case you had heard of that place, um, the, uh, says that really all of the 5,000 people living outside in Santa Cruz County um, would be required to, be, to not be in violation of Martin versus Boise, to be placed inside shelter space, adequate shelter space. The uh, other thing that I hear constantly is people um, are kicked out of the shelters. Uh, one friend, Paula, she, uh, I was hoping she would make it here, but she's not feeling well. She lost all of her belongings when she went to help her mom. She came back, the uh, shelter threw everything away. We had to give her a new tent and everything to set her back up. I just ran into a woman about two hours ago at New Leaf who asked me where the women's shelter was. She wanted uh, to move in and go inside to a shelter. You call the number that you have provided uh, uh, in your letter to the community. Um, there was no shelter space there. There never is any shelter space. So I gave her another, I gave her a pup tent and I sent her to the, you know, like to try to camp somewhere safely near the levee. But as you know, the police will move her to the bench lands, which is now, it's, it's incredibly uh, beautiful community there, but it is also at least 350 people, maybe up to 500. And so there, uh, um, you know, any plans to do any, we've had two years to house everybody Nothing has happened in those two years, and we have millions and millions of dollars that just got pissed away into space. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next uh, member of the public is here in person. Welcome. Hello. Um, my name is Jack Ryan Rodriguez, and I uh, just wanted to address, um, uh, in March of 2020, I was in Austin, Texas, um, I had moved there two years prior to get away from a, a toxic relationship that kind of followed me and bit me in the butt because uh, the person I was getting away from falsely accused me of something and it was because it was domestic, um, the charges uh, were dropped but the case stayed and the domestic, or um, the department, or uh, uh, the, the district attorney came and got me, I guess, pretty much. They, they, they ran with the district attorney, yeah, they went with it. So I had a two year old warrant um, that came on March of 2000. 20, I guess there was an uh, um, uh, upgrade. Anyways, I get a knock on my door. They served me a warrant that was two years old. They housed me in Austin in t uh, Travis County uh, just to send me um, for 14 days. And they extradited me to Santa Clara just to release me homeless, transient. So they took me and they made me homeless. And then that was a Monday and that Saturday it was shelter in place. So for, for a whole week I tried to comply and then, then there was this pandemic and I was forced outside, nowhere to go, no one answering the phone. And they told me to build a shelter. So I came home. I came to Santa Cruz and I uh, built a shelter and then I got it bulldozed and, and lost a little bit of remains of, of, um, of what I had that was I mean, brought w to, with me to, to California, but everything went out the door. The other day, um, we were fortunate enough to have electricity down at, in the bench land um, and sometimes we have to run uh, extension cords, which are very expensive. I've seen um, uh, four uh, members in uniform, whether they, police or fire department, I, I believe it was police. But they uh, they cut um, our extension cord, saying it, um, it was a fire safety because it was in the fire um, lane. But then they left exposed wires. Um, again, I'm not trying to fight back and forth. I'm trying to come up with a solution. Um, those vacant houses, um, the, the UCSC students, um, um, we can have. Um, I mean, the clubhouse itself and the place in, in Capitola, we can have hostels, you know, and still um, um, uh, offer. Um, uh, we, other uh, sources to the homeless to like work on board and stuff like that. I mean, it, I mean, there's lots. I mean, I have lots of ideas on what's going on. It's been two years I've been sitting here at home and then making a home with this in this community. And I mean, I know you guys are eager and they're eager. So I just thank think, you. You know, thank you. Our next member of the public here in person. Hi, welcome. My name is Elise Cosby. I'm here today to speak about the 
really um, sad and quite tragic um, consequences of um, the extreme measures that the elites are imposing on our economy and our republic. Here in Santa Cruz, the situation is really grave. Um, we have almost nothing left of our democracy. We have a situation where a sizable number of our long-term residents are being impoverished. They're being hunted down by police. They're being left to die outside. Um, something just happened to my mic, but this is this is a very serious time for those who are concerned about things like the slavery trade that happened, this, the um, the eventual uh, well, the situation that happened for decades and years and years and years that led to the Holocaust. We are watching the same thing happen. We have people who are very very poor without wages that can sustain any kind of rental housing, really, any kind of stability. And we are watching the elites essentially dance on these people's bodies and graves. I have been watching it at this city council for so long. The shutdown of the democracy is not just things like the legal but illicit recall that took a fairly elected progressive majority and, and eradicated it and supplanted it with a far-right group. But the use of big money, the use of lies, such as were used against our fairly elected people, and the vicious use of demonizing poor people is what is leading this country to ruin. And you all are part of that problem. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public here in person members of the community, including the city council, but most particularly, the people who bothered to show up here today. Thank you for showing up. And I thank you for being concerned about the folks who can't show up in the Benchlands who are there. Um, I'm, I spoke earlier about the Benchlands issue, and I hope other people will pick up from where I left off or just give your own feelings about, well, what you think should be happening and what isn't happening, and how the council can help. This is a different item than an agenda item if you're looking for resources that people in the bench lands need. What do they need? What should this council be giving them that they aren't doing and that hasn't been passed this afternoon? That's the question I have, and I think that uh, perhaps people might want to talk about it, particularly people who live in the bench lands. This is the body that can make those decisions. If not today, then in two weeks, or they can authorize the city manager to take action, or perhaps he's sitting right there, he's the fellow next to the man in the business suit, he can make those decisions. He seems to be interested in essentially deporting the entire bench lands segment by segment without providing any specifics about where people are supposed to be able to go or how many people are actually there now. We've heard estimates from Keith, but no estimates specifically, clearly, from any kind of census in the bench lands. So that's a concern I have, and I hope that people will talk about it because I'm pretty much talked out. I've distributed a flyer, which I'll give the city council, which has to do with their policing, or shall we say they're uh, unleashing the police, which you're gonna be finding happening in the bench lands soon, if only in a very controlled way, because I'm told by uh, Mark Eveleth, our, uh, our good bailiff here, that uh, the police department is understaffed. Uh, if, if that helps to stop the bench lands removal, I say that's a good thing. Bad, bad way. Uh, thank you for listening, everybody, if you did, and uh, my apologies for subjecting this to you if you already know about it. Okay, um, our, hold on one second, please. Our next member of the public for oral communications is virtual. And I see phone number ending in 6871. Go ahead and uh, press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Okay. Uh, Darius Mosanin here, just a couple of quick things. Um, as a landlord, particularly one that rents to a lot of Section 8 tenants, 
I'm pretty concerned about the, what I consider re, uh, redundant or duplicitous excessive application fees that tenants uh, have to pay to various property management companies for basically the same credit report or background uh, report. Uh, I, I, I'm voicing a concern. I don't have a crisp solution. I just think that there should be some kind of clearinghouse. We should look at perhaps with the county, some type of means of, for anybody that has, has college, um, kids that apply to college, there's something called the common app for college. I'd like to see something like a common app for a rental application to reduce these, you know, make these fees more manageable. Some of these folks are spending $200, $300 in pursuit of an apartment. And like, again, for lower income section eight folks, that's just, just that's just um, out of reach. Uh, second, unrelated uh, to this is, I, was, I just recently became aware of a program called CAT, C-A-T-T, that's an Oakland community um, assessment and transport team. I think this is a very similar program to the CAHOOTS in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, one of my tenants, uh, is, is took a job as an EMT in Oakland, and she has relayed some of the successes of this program. There's basically a EMT with a social worker, a crisis worker, and they travel around the city in, in these nimble little SUVs to respond to um, suicide crisis, alcohol. I mean, a lot of the, a, a lot of these various problems that we have in this town. I'd love to see something like that established. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next member here in person, thank you for your patience. Hi, my name is Lee Myers. I'm a 45 year resident, give or take a year or so. Um, working poor most of the time. I, I wanna speak because Keith McHenry brought up the fact that he was uh, speaking to people waiting for the bus to go up to De La Viega Park in the shelter. Um, I wanna speak to that because I've been working poor. I've done a lot of camping. I've consistently and forever been unable to use any of your shelters. The idea of getting people to line up at three o'clock in the afternoon, giving up their lives, giving up what maybe the only part-time job they have is obscene. And in the original Bell versus Boise case that became Martin versus Boise, the Department of Justice issued a friend of the court brief on behalf of the uh, plaintiff homeless people. Part of the document basically reiterated what um, the plaintiffs were saying that Dude, you don't have any place for us to sleep. It's a human need. We got to sleep sometime. And the second part of the document, which is what really trashed everybody's camping laws, was they spelled out exactly what a shelter isn't. And one of the specific things that they listed was special access is unacceptable. I come from New York originally. New York, at least in the Bowery, has real shelters. You can walk in 24-7, 365. There's a bed waiting for you, maybe a meal or something like that. The idea of having to give up your life to go to a shelter panders to institutionalization, and I resent it. Yay! Thank you for your comments. Our next member of the public is here in person for oral communications. Welcome. I'd like to say that I second the, um, the caller before that you brought up the excessive fees for lease renewal. I personally paid $125 to renew my lease this year. <clears throat> I paid $125 just to renew my lease this year, which I thought was excessive. I can't really see how they can justify that amount. My reason for being here today is I'd like to just support KSC Radio that's given me a lot of, um, as an older adult, it's been like a second family to me, having the, the friendship of the hosts at the radio station, the company of AM Radio, their 
night and day, including news and current events and shows that I can call into and participate with. Um, it's really meant a lot to me. Um, I just don't know what I'd do with that, to be honest, uh, living alone, being being single person. And um, I know that they're up for consideration because they're having problems regarding this extended um, patio, concrete patio around their building that is imp impending, impeding on the natural wildlife, and that's up for consideration about being removed. Uh, I just want to support. I'm hoping the city council will perhaps make the right decision, allow leniency in this, their decision making, and consider um, the great service this radio station offers to us, and hopefully it won't terminate um, our enjoyment of them in the future. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next uh, member of the public um, is here in person. Welcome. Um, um, hello, my name is Angela Flynn, and I um, uh, have been homeless over the years quite a few times. I've been homeless for environmental reasons, which um, I am electrosensitive. I have a very hard time if there's a lot of wireless radiation. Many people, well, it's estimated anywhere 3 to 30% of the population have this condition. Many of them are homeless because we cannot tolerate living in houses that have too much wireless. Shelters also are not an option for us because of this. I've also been homeless because of dangerous living situations, very nice neighborhoods, nice homes, but very unstable people on drugs. I've had to flee those situations and been homeless because of that. Um, I have not lived at the bench lens. I do walk by there, and it seems like a pretty calm, safe location. I have one homeless friend back in um, Venice Beach, and he calls the typical government response to homelessness whack-a-mole. Basically, a homeless camp opens up, it gets whacked down, opens up over here, gets whacked down, opens up over here, gets whacked down. I mean, having the bench lands is not an ideal situation, but it has provided a lot of stability for a lot of homeless people and given them opportunities to have community and relationships. I would love to see more services provided. I mean, showers there at site is so crucial for people to be able to get clean every day. You can't go to a job interview if you're not clean. It's just you're not presentable. There's so many blocks for being homeless, and you know I've had to struggle through many of these. Um, I'm not here to really offer the solution because I don't have it, but there is one thing that I borrowed this sign <laughs> that I saw on the windowsill, do you feel loved? And I feel like the bench lens provides that feeling for many homeless people. That is not something that most is most common for homeless people. I hope that it can be. Thank you for your comment. Okay, we are moving through oral communications, and oral communications is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us on any items that were not on today's agenda. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. Okay, my name is Amberly, and I've been living here for about six, seven years now. Um, I uh, was born up north in Mendocino, and I've been homeless off and on for the last 15 years. Um, I'm also a resident over at the Benchlands, and since I've been here in Santa Cruz, I've had many, many different homes that have been either bulldozed, I have to move constantly, and it's really nice to have a stable place, you know? And I think for anybody, a stable place to get up in the morning and have your things is, I mean, throughout the whole day, it, it I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time. Take your time. Words. It provides a, a means for the whole day to be productive. If you don't have a stable spot, you know, you're not as productive. And right now at the Benchlands, 
Every single day, I'm worried that I'm going to get kicked out within a day or two. I'm a gardener, you know, and so I like to plant and things like this. And I've done that at each of my homes. And um, and it's, I'm sorry. It's OK. I just want to mention as well that, you know, no matter if the people, you know, the homeless community are many. There are drug addicts, there are non-drug addicts, there are, you know, people that have mental illness and not. I think I would just really appreciate you guys if you could maybe um, have a place for us to stay, you know? And um, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have, uh, oh, okay. Thank you. Hi My there, welcome. My name is Mike Whiteside, and I'm originally from Lodi. I own four pieces of property in Lodi, and I'm a landlord. But here in Santa Cruz, I don't think a police officer could afford a home in this, this area. I mean, a new police officer comes to work in Santa Cruz, he can't afford a home. I don't know if all of you can afford a home. I know I'm not able to, but the reason I'm here is a, is a horrible divorce. The bench lands gives me some type of uh, Security. I mean, I know there's bad people down here, good, but in probably every one of your guys' neighbors, excuse me, one of your, every one of your guys' neighborhood, there's a bad person around. I mean, I might have a few more neighbors than, you know, bad than you do, but um, it's really all we, I have right now, and I'm sure most of these people here too. Um, you got to open your eyes to nobody, not too many, and within 10 years, I don't think there are going to be too many people from this, maybe even country, owning in Santa Cruz because of the price. You guys' is Price is like, I looked in the paper the other day and it was like 1.6 for a house that's probably worth five where I'm at. I mean, it's outrageously priced. How are we ever supposed to get ahead? And then this, go to a camp and you can't go, you can't leave for more than three days a month. How are we supposed to get a job? A job, what am I supposed to work two hours and then get back to this camp because I can maybe get a hot dog or something? You know, that's just, you're being unfair, you're being unrealistic. I mean, if you're your own policemen can't afford a home in our area. How are one of us going to? That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Um, so that concludes oral communications. And um, council members, um, we can respond to um, or ask questions at this time. Um, there were a couple comments brought up. Um, that were related to an earlier report on the agenda. Um, some of those questions were answered. And um, uh, for the, um, the, the person who spoke from Mendocino, um, hopefully there's connection. We have outreach workers out. Uh, we received a report. And there are outreach workers out there connecting. County has a mobile office out there connecting with everyone for an individualized rehousing plan. So I hope that you're able to make those connections and feel free to contact our homelessness response team if those connections are not happening. Um, but we do have shelter spaces that already people have been um, offered and are occupying. And um, we have more that are coming um, up at the armory in addition to what's already there. Do they have a job in Mendocino? Because you're not understanding how this does not work. So um, are there any council members, that, were there any other items, uh, council member coming? Just to pretend like the reality is not what reality is, doesn't help anybody. I did have a question. Um, one, I'm just curious, for, and I should have asked this earlier, but um, since we were more talking about financials, that I have been getting contacted by another person who's experiencing homelessness and they want to know like what's the best way for them to get connected to resources because they do have access There's to There's no resources. What the hell? Can you stop your outburst, please? There's no resources. You've had your time it's to speak. Like wasting everybody's time talking about some fantasy that doesn't exist. You know? I, I spend every day trying to get somebody into the shelter. I call this no place. It's not your time to speak. Workers are like a waste of time. 
Not. You're silencing my voice, and I don't appreciate that. What you've got to say about Please leave. It's time for you to leave. I'm asking. I'm asking you to leave. Can you please remove him? Thank you. Okay, so can you rephrase your question, please? I was just wondering what resources we can. Yeah, thank you for the question, yeah, Councilmember Cummings. Okay, thank you. We will be taking a break, but I'm trying to get this question answered, and then we will, we've been in city business since uh, 10 a.m. this morning. I understand there are folks here for the next item, so, but we do need to take a 20-minute break um, before the next item. So that information is available on our city's website through the free guide, as well as contacting uh, Larry and Wally, our homelessness response team, and we also have an outreach team that's on the ground every day and available uh, to, to help connect folks with resources. Thank you for the question. Thank you. It's not an answer. And, I do have one more question. Go ahead. And it's, it's not related to that, but a member of the public, and Tony, you, were, um, you stepped out at the moment, mentioned that um, in the 2008 uh, comprehensive settlement agreement, the UCSC, was supposed to notify the city and county when purchasing any new properties in the city. And I don't know if that happened or if there's any way we can kind of look into that as a possible violation of the comprehensive settlement agreement. I can look into that. My gut reaction to that question is that the, the comprehensive settlement agreement was superseded by the adoption of the 2021 LRDP, and so it's no longer in effect. But I can double check in on that and report back to the council. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, at this time, we will take a recess and we'll be back here at 7 o'clock. Thank you.
Okay. Is the city clerk ready? Thank you. Okay, we are back from a short break. Thank you for your patience and waiting. We are now on agenda item number 21, objective standards. For members of the public, For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you wish to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from council. We will then take public comments and return to council for deliberation. If you are here in person, when public time for public comment is, you can line up to the right of the dais. In addition to the public comment, we will hear on this item, 149 emails were sent to city council at cityofsantacruz.com. And at this time, I would like to welcome uh, to the podium, uh, Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development. I have Sarah Noisy and Matt Van Hua also listed, who I believe will be joining us virtually. That's correct. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much, and good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development, and I'm very pleased to provide an introduction tonight to our package of objective standards for multifamily development including changes from planning, public works, and parks and recreation, along with rezonings consistent with the general plan and some additional miscellaneous zoning code updates, such as fence and accessory building regulations. The long-awaited objective standards represent the culmination of nearly three years of work. Council authorized staff to seek grant funding for this in October of 2019. We secured that grant funding through the state, selected a consultant, and kicked off the project itself two years ago. We've done a significant community outreach for this project, which increased the amount of time the project took, but made for a more inclusive process and better outcomes in terms of modifications that we made to the standards along the way in response to that community feedback. The planning profession is changing rapidly right now, and for good reason. Inequities created and exacerbated by historic zoning principles have been known for decades, and changes at the local and state levels, bolstered by recognition of the issues at the national level, are attempting to address those issues. And while the challenges associated with inadequate housing production have been acute in California for some time, the rest of the country is unfortunately seeing many of the same problems that we've been experiencing across our state and Looking at the planning profession, you don't have to go far to see that the national focus has shifted. Here are some of the national headlines from the American Planning Association just in the last month. Housing underproduction impacts majority of the US. Planners can lead the zoning reform movement. How state judiciaries battled exclusionary zoning, and the list goes on. Tonight, our team presents a step in the right direction for addressing these issues. The zoning reforms respond to recent state law changes. They help ensure that we can maintain a high quality urban form as we grow. They provide more certainty for the community, developers, staff, and decision makers. They promote more housing production and more housing choice through that higher degree of certainty without increasing density above what is currently and I'm gonna dwell here on that and a couple of comments that we have heard from the community that um, were um, in the materials that the council received. So first, I wanna repeat the statement that I made a moment ago. The proposed changes allow no more development intensity than what is currently allowed. This was commonly misunderstood in many of the comments that we received. I realize this is a really confusing point for the community, and that's very understandable. 
um, someone can easily look at our zoning ordinance and say, the zoning ordinance says that only 40 feet are allowed here, and these changes are saying, for example, 55 feet. So how is that the case that we're not increasing density as part of these proposals? And the answer is that state law requires cities to allow development intensity that's called for in the general plan. And our zoning standards don't allow for that intensity. So developers right now can disregard those standards. They can come in and propose a height limit that is substantially taller than that 40 feet, even though the zoning ordinance says 40 feet is the max. So right now, developers actually have broad discretion to make the standards fit their projects instead of the other way around the projects fitting our standards. As an example, a developer can propose a project at the maximum intensity allowed by the general plan and show that they need, for example, 65 feet in height to accomplish the project, and the city could have a hard time denying that project or reducing its size. And one thing that these objective standards do is it sets our standards to where the building heights and setbacks are consistent with what is allowed by the current general plan based on careful analyses of hypothetical development projects. Those are the test fits that the Planning Commission discussed multiple times starting back on January 7th of 2021 and that were discussed with the Council um, at the November 30th, 2021 study session. Adding zoning standards that match what is actually allowed for a project <coughs> increases transparency for all stakeholders. The standards also provide the city with the ability to require varied roof forms, building recesses, high quality materials, and various other design improvements, things that we only have limited abilities to do under our current codes and regulations. The proposed standards also incentivize conformance with the rules through a more streamlined process for fully conforming projects. And I want to dwell on this for a moment as well because there was a lot of confusion in the community related to this. Notably, multifamily residential projects of any size have this exact same permit process right now, administrative approvals in the RL and RM multifamily zoning districts. That process has been in place since at least 1985. The proposal would apply the same process to mixed use and multifamily projects in commercial districts. Nothing in these changes would allow for or suggest a ministerial process. A ministerial process is one that does not require a discretionary panel, one that only requires a building permit, and one that does not have the California Environmental Quality Act apply. What we have suggested is a administrative approval, which is very different from a ministerial approval. So I wanted to make that point clear as well. And a small subset of projects could potentially have that administrative discretionary approval if they are fully conforming with the standards and if they don't meet one of the many other triggers for a public hearing. Those public those public hearing triggers include density bonus requests, which nearly every single large project is proposing a density bonus. Why? Because just by the fact of meeting our inclusionary affordable housing standards that they have to meet, they already qualify for a density bonus. So nearly every single large project already is going to trigger a public hearing just by virtue of that density bonus request. But there are other triggers as well. Um, a map, any for sale units would trigger a public hearing. Also, public hearing triggers include coastal permits, land development permits, historic alteration permits, variances, slope development permits, and various other permit triggers. So while this is an important piece to our work, the procedural change associated with the administrative process is not really a large change. And I want to also point out that even in that process, if someone does choose to pursue that administrative process, the community meeting procedures remain in place. And that is a 
better forum, frankly, for getting community feedback and having community dialogue than uh, a public hearing process where you've got uh, a limited ability to have some of those um, conversations. I'll also note that appeal opportunities remain in place. So any administratively approved project can still be appealed to the Planning Commission and their decision can be appealed to the City Council, just as is the case with our current process in the RL and RM multifamily zoning districts. The council and some community members may recall that we had this exact scenario play out at um, 418 Pennsylvania, where we had an administrative, administratively approved project. It was appealed to the Planning Commission and then those three units ultimately were appealed to the city council. So taking a step back again, these changes represent one of many steps that are needed and many more are, are forthcoming. We have zoning reforms called for as part of the Climate Action Plan that the Council will consider next month, and we'll be doing a deeper dive into how we can affirmatively further fair housing as part of our housing element update process that will, that's kicking off now, and that will certainly call for many additional policy reforms. I also wanna point out that just about every recommendation we have in this package tonight was supported by the Planning Commission, with all commissioners expressing support for almost the entire package of changes. As was done in the staff report, our team will detail in their presentation the few items where the staff recommendation differs from that of the Planning Commission. So at this point, I will turn it over to our team who will walk you through the process we went through and some of the key standards that were developed. Our senior planner, Sarah Noisy, was the project manager for the objective standards, and she did an excellent job working with the community and our consultants on this. I wanna send out a special thanks to her and our consultants, urban planning partners, who will be represented tonight by Alyssa Chung and Lynette Diaz, and our consulting urban designer, Kristen Hall, who all did really great work on this project. They'll also be joined by Travis Beck from Parks and Recreation and Nathan Wynn from Public Works, who will, be who will be presenting objective standards related to their respective roles. And Senior Planner Catherine Donovan will also present a series of minor zoning ordinance amendments that we're incorporating into the same package. Um, our Principal Planner Matt Benoit is here, as well as various other staff members who are available for questions. Um, we have a lot of information to cover. Um, there are 80 slides. Please get comfortable. We have, <laughs> we have this, this is going to be over an hour of presentation from this point so that we can cover all of the information that is included in this package. So I will turn it over to Sarah. Thank Hi, you. Everyone. Thank you, Lee. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes, thank you. Wonderful. Okay, I will go ahead and share my screen. Right over here. So Lee just did a great job introducing our team um, that's going to be presenting. We're all going to be sharing the presentation to some degree tonight. So um, I'll start off by going through this agenda of our 80-ish slides. Um, we'll start off with some background talking about the state law, the council direction that brought us here today, existing condition with the city's general plan and zoning ordinance that Lee already sort of introduced for you. Then we'll get into the design and development standards for multifamily housing, which really is the core and uh, the heart of this project, what really um, drove us to bring all of these things together. Um, then we'll talk about the development review process amendments, um, which Lee introduced as well, and um, really go through the details of how, um, what is changing and what is not changing um, as part of the recommended proposal. Then we'll run through the mixed use zonings, zoning districts and um, other zone district amendments that are included um, as well to the, to the districts themselves that sort of to incorporate the objective design standards. We'll address the planning commission recommendation. Then you'll hear from um, Nathan and public works and then Travis about street trees. Um, then Catherine will talk about our other zoning ordinance, miscellaneous zoning ordinance updates um, and address environmental review. And then I'll come back to wrap up with a conclusion, talk about next steps and um, present our staff recommendation. 
So starting off with background. So um, just broadly speaking, this project was initiated so that our zoning ordinance, the city could comply with the state law for housing development review, which has greatly curtailed um, the subjective process that we're, we've been accustomed to using with our design permit. Um, so our design review process that we have in place now just really can't function under the current state law in the way that it was designed and intended to. So um, the goal of this project was to bring our ordinance in line with the way that we're allowed to review projects and make sure that we can still have design standards in place. We also have direction from the council to reconcile this mismatch between the general plan and the zoning ordinance. And I'll explain more about that in a little minute. We also have direction to not alter the pattern, the land use pattern at this point in time. Um, our last direction from the council was to um, proceed with the zoning ordinance amendments and consider if there was any utility after this, of, after we have these, these amendments, these zoning amendments in place, if there was still um, need or utility in pursuing an amendment to the general plan land use pattern. Um, and then, you know, have objective review standards rather than relying on our subjective development review findings that we've had in the past. So just to remind everyone, the council direction to which we are responding at this point comes from October of 2019 to move forward with establishing mixed use zone districts and objective design standards for housing and embark on a very broad public outreach process. And then in August of 2020, we also got direction to contract with Urban Planning Partners, UPP, to create these objective development standards, and then to invite the Planning Commission to outreach events and incorporate updates to the Planning Commission. So now I'm gonna to talk to you about how um, the state law, I'm sorry, my cat is joining me. Um, I'm gonna talk <laughs> about the state law um, that brings us here to, to sort of needing that direction. And then I'm gonna go through the, our um, community engagement process and our outreach process and show you um, how that worked. So um, Lee mentioned that there had been some changes to state law. So they are, there are two main bills that create the Housing Crisis Act and the Housing Accountability Act. Um, and these have been updated, they have been updated even at the beginning of 2022 and I think there and there's some more legislation in the pipeline that would make some further additional amendments to these um, to these sections of the state government code so essentially um, cities all over the state must allow the development of housing so parcels where housing is, is an allowed use they must allow housing to be developed the standards that we apply to that housing must allow for that full capacity of the property to be developed and that capacity is locked in as of January 1st of 2018. So whatever the planned capacity was on January 1st of 2018, that's the capacity, the number of units that we have to accommodate on that site. So um, the state also addresses when there is a mismatch of zoning or general plan. And in some cases, the zoning might allow slightly more development or the in our case, locally, it's the general plan allows more development on certain parcels than the existing zoning. Um, whichever is greater is the one that we have to accommodate. So um, subjective standards can't be used to limit the amount of housing, um, shall not reduce the intensity of land use. And that reduction of intensity of land use would, would include reductions to height, density, a floor area ratio, which is a measure of total building volume or square footage relative to the square footage of a piece of property. Um, or lot coverage, or they could also, reductions to intensity could include increases in setbacks or open space or minimum parcel size. So all of those things um, you can see would kind of have an effect on how much housing could be built. The state is saying, if you're doing anything like that, you're gonna need to show us how you're increasing something else um, on the parcel to ensure that we're still accommodating the planned amount of housing. So that, um, Responding to all of that state law is really a big part of our purpose with this project. So um, what you see here in the purple box is the pull, um, a quote from the government code about the definition of an objective standard that includes no personal or subjective judgment. It's verifiable to a reference to an external and uniform benchmark. Um, and it's available and knowable by both the development applicant, the public, and the public official prior to submittal. So it's important that we have these published. It's important that they be measurable and it's important that they be as objective as we possibly can make them. Um, and I think we've done a pretty good job, but as you will see, there is some, um, there's some trade-offs when you try to make things truly objective. 
uh, it's hard to make them site specific. And that's one of the challenges that we've been kind of grappling with. So broadly speaking, our purpose here is to provide a clear objective and measurable measurable standards for multifamily and mixed use residential development that's consistent with the character of Santa Cruz while also ensuring that new housing development is economically feasible. So um, we are interested in ensuring that new residential development contributes positively to the urban environment, to the built environment. And at the same time, we understand that there are um, certain things that we could impose on projects that would really make it so hard to build housing that we could fall behind in terms of actually meeting our obligations under RENA and meeting the needs in our community for housing at all income levels. Um, so our community outreach um, process, which I'll get into next, really prioritized sustainability, affordability, eclectic architectural character and high quality materials and details. And so this, this process of these objective standards really focuses on the physical form and style of development um, rather than specifically on the density because that's really established already in our general plan. And as Lee mentioned, we are not doing anything here that changes those densities or development allowances that are already established and in place based on the general plan land use designations. Um, so what we're really talking about are, is design. We have a lot of standards that already exist in our code that apply already to all development. And the place where we haven't had written objective detailed standards is really around design because we've relied on this design review process with a set of 10 findings that we just can't use in the same way that we intended to when we created them. So going back to fall of 2020, when we sort of kicked off with our consultants, we started this project with um, a zoning and economic analysis. We did um, some technical analysis, which are called test fits. And Kristen's going to talk about those in a little bit, where we basically take, um, you know, some examples of some existing real physical sites and try to fit the development capacity that's allowed onto them and just see how it how it works out. Can we meet the parking ratio? You know, can we fit this number of units? How tall does the building have to be in order to make this work? Um, so that kind of analysis. Then we got started getting into our community engagement process, which my next slide goes into more detail on that. And then based on that community engagement process and combined with the test fits, we started to develop these objective standards and draft them together. And then um, we released the public draft in November of last year. We came to your council with a presentation at the end of November uh, of 2021. You may remember that. We also went to the Planning Commission and received input from them, both at that time and at the with the test fits. And we had presented also the um, community outreach approach to the city, to the Planning Commission and got some feedback and insight from them on that as well. So in November of last year, we brought the draft standards to your council, to the planning commission and to the public and started gathering input and feedback and reactions to those standards and got a lot of really great um, comments and um, requests and you know information from folks. And we were able to incorporate many of those things. There were also many of those things that are already addressed by state law, by other sections of our code. You know, we had a lot of folks sending us comments, you know, they're really concerned about health and safety. And yes, we are also concerned about health and safety. And that is all very heavily regulated and, and um, taken care of by our building codes and our fire codes, which are not being changed at all by anything we could do here with zoning. So um, we did put together a, a set of responses to all of the comments. So folks could you know, see their comment and see where um, where we either made an adjustment to a standard or where it was already covered by a, an existing standard or where, you know, some of these standards, some of the suggested standards we got just really um, wouldn't fit in given the other goals that we have of our project. So if that was the case, we explained why that wasn't going to work. Um, and so that was, uh, we, we presented that to the Planning Commission when we went to them with this package in June. So that was an attachment to that letter of June 2nd or agenda report. Um, so after we got this feedback, we've refined these standards and now here we are doing public hearings. So just to zoom in a little bit on community engagement, because um, I did, excuse me, I did um, read all the correspondence that came in and I do um, hear people that they are 
um, didn't feel like they had a chance to get involved or really understand this huge packet of information. And I do understand that this is a large amount of information and it is very technical. And so we really did what we could to provide lots of opportunities for the community to ask questions, provide input, and um, you know, really get involved and get into these standards because they they are quite technical and they are quite detailed. Um, that was something that came out of our community engagement is that um, Santa Cruz really wants to preserve that eclectic style and um, they like to, um, what am I trying to say here? We have a community that's very interested in details, I think is what I'm trying to say. And so there are a lot of details that are in this package. So um, starting back in winter of 2021, um, we launched our project website. We um, you know, also had our two meetings at the Planning Commission, first with the engagement strategy and then with our first set of test fit analysis. Um, and then in the winter to the early spring, we had um, a webinar, our first um, outreach event was at a webinar called Designing Santa Cruz for All, where we really helped people understand a lot of the history of zoning, which is um, not all of it very pretty. I mean, there's a lot of our existing land use patterns that um, really entrench a worldview that I don't think suits Santa Cruz very much anymore. And so we wanted to help people kind of understand that history so that they could understand why is, why is planning staff always pushing for multifamily housing? Why do I only hear planning staff talk about needing sites for multifamily housing and pursuing density? A lot of that has to do with the history of zoning and what we understand about the ramifications of creating exclusionary zoning in so many neighborhoods across the nation. So we provided that, that webinar in both English and Spanish in the spring. We created that content, it's on our website. Um, following, sorry, following that um, event, our next big outreach event um, effort was a survey to define community character. And um, we got over 800 responses to that survey. It was a really phenomenal response rate. And, and it was like, it was not a short survey. This was not a five minute survey. This was really something where we asked people to really pause and think about what do they want their urban environment to look like and what are things they care about when they're walking down the street. And we got really fantastic, robust feedback from that tool. And it um, really helped us put together with our technical analysis and start writing some drafts of standards. And then be, because um, we collected demographic information in, as part of that survey to make sure we were getting a representative um, response from our community and that we were hearing from all of our various demographic groups. And then we filled in the gaps with focus groups where we hadn't heard from enough students, young adults under 30, um, low income households, our Latinx, Chicanx community um, renters specifically we wanted to hear from, and then also East Side residents. So uh, we had initially scoped three focus groups, but um, as we were looking at the responses, it seemed clear that we wanted to really make sure we were hearing from people who were likely to live in new housing that gets built. So that was renters and then um, and young adults. And then also um, we wanted to make sure we were hearing from folks who are going to be living close to some of the more intense changes. And so that was East Side residents. So we made sure we had a focus group with those folks as well. And that provided us with really like more detailed and nuanced information and feedback that could really help us like shape those standards that we had kind of started putting together based on our technical analysis and the survey information. Um, <clears throat> so then as we were further refining, we had um, when we were releasing our draft standards to the public, we also held a focus group with um, housing developers. They're the ones that are going to have to respond and use these standards. So we want to make sure that they're clear, that they understand what's being asked for with the various standards. And so that was really helpful in, in helping us clarify some of the language that we had proposed or like the way that we were requiring certain things. Um, also, we knew that that was a, a big amount of information. And I, I heard this from folks in the... Um, in the correspondence that it's just so much information. Yes, it is so much information. And that's why we wanted to hold a, you know, a community meeting, a launch event to launch the draft standards. They were available for public comment. We had a public comment um, 
web survey available on our website for four weeks. Uh, and during that, those four weeks, we held office hours twice to make sure that people had a chance to look at the standards, get confused, come ask for help, ask to understand why we would be proposing something or what the end goal was and like how they should respond. Um, and do all of that and collect all of that feedback before we went to public hearings. So um, following the, the office hours in the winter of 2022, then we have spent the, um, the spring and the summer really refining things, making sure it's consistent throughout our zoning code, bringing in these other sections from parks related to street trees, from public works relating to sidewalk and public realm and underground utilities, just making sure that all of that can be consistent and integrated throughout the code. And now here we are at public hearings. We went to the planning commission um, and it, in two different packages. We split this package so that the planning commission could really take a deep dive into each of them. And so we had one hearing at the beginning of June and another hearing at the end of June, that, that one at the end of June ended in tie votes, since it was actually continued, we had a third hearing in July um, with the Planning Commission. And I'll talk about the recommendations that came out of that um, a little later. Sarah, just one quick clarification. The office hours, I believe, were winter of 2021, not 2022. You're right, sorry, yes, winter of 2021. Because they were, yes, they were before the end of the year. You're right. Thank you. But yeah, so we wanted to make sure we did that twice, different times of the week, different times of the day, so that folks could check in, um, you know, sort of regardless of what their um, family and work needs were. <clears throat> so um, a little more detail here in getting into the um, various phases of community engagement. I mentioned our first phase was this educational component. So we provided this in English and Spanish. The recordings are available on our website and sort of introduced the project, explained the need for it, and then provided a lot of historic and our current context for housing policy and zoning. And talked about this concept about racial and economic segregation that can really result from zoning and the zoning patterns that we have created over the last, you know, 100 years. Suburbs and single family homes are a big piece of that. And um, I won't give you a whole <laughs> a whole explanation of redlining and white flight. And we did kind of go into that with the community. So you can link housing to long-term health outcomes as your council is well aware. And so there have been lots of bills recently in California specifically relating to increasing housing production and then also affordable units. And those are related but separate issues. So I just wanna show you a couple of the slides that we had used in that presentation. So when we're talking about um, zoning patterns and um, land use patterns in Santa Cruz, um, we want to talk about our general plan, which in 2012 was adopted and intended to focus development into certain areas based on those areas being close to transportation choices, um, existing jobs, and existing um, commercial corridors with services for residents. So those areas are shown here on this map. This is These are the areas when we say there's a mismatch between the general plan and the zoning code, we are referring to these highlighted parcels on this map. Um, and then we're also looking at um, standards through the objective design standards that would apply to all multifamily housing. And there is um, low density residential RL and mid density residential, multifamily residential RM throughout the city. And the state law has really reduced our discretion, as we've mentioned. And then we're also thinking in everything we do about equity and social justice. And uh, zoning can seem very neutral. We talk about it in a very detached and analytical kind of way, but history can, history shows there's really a disparate impact of how zoning has affected different um, populations. So I just wanna show these two maps. You have seen these before. Um, this is a generalized zoning map of the city of Santa Cruz. The areas shown in yellow are single family neighborhoods. The areas shown in brown are multifamily, both our medium density multifamily and our low density multifamily. Um, the pink area is mixed use downtown. So that's our existing zoning is, um, you know, sort of that's what's identified there. And then the lighter pink color are our commercial and industrial areas. Um, and then the next map that I'm gonna show you is based on the 2010 census. We don't quite have the detail yet from the 2020 census to update this, but I would be interested to see how these patterns have shifted. Um, but this next map 
shows one dot per person of the population of Santa Cruz, and it's colored based on race. So this map is available on our website. Um, you can you can get it there and blow it up and spend some time with it because I understand this is probably really hard to see on your screen. And I'm just going to flip back and forth between them a couple times so you can see. I want you to watch lower ocean and beach flats and downtown. So here you can see that those areas are brown. They're zoned for multifamily development. And you can see that they just turn orange in this next image. So orange represents, this is the classification system that the census uses. So they use the term Hispanic. Um, that shows both that, that um, Hispanic communities are highly concentrated. They live in denser housing. And then they also are um, limited to certain neighborhoods. So being limited to certain neighborhoods, we're lucky in Santa Cruz that all of our elementary schools are great schools. And um, you can see how having patterns like this where there's highly concentrated pockets of um, uh, certain exclusive races can create um, inequities between communities and challenges for households. So um, in talking about housing, whenever we talk about housing, um, folks want to talk about the whole of housing policy. And that is um, indeed wise. And I just want to center this project and, and our every discussion about zoning within this broader context of what is complete housing policy. So complete housing policy talks about protection. So the, that's about um, protecting households and people from eviction, protecting mobile homes, enforcing fair housing law, housing vouchers, so subsidies that go to individuals and households. It's about preserving existing affordable units. Um, so that's affordability restrictions and deed restrictions that are either permanent or very long term. It's our inclusionary policies that create those deed restrictions, replacing units if they get lost, and legalizing existing units so that they can stay in the market and hopefully stay at an affordable rent. And now zoning is part of the production component of this three-piece pie. And um, permit streamlining, the density bonus, the um, regional housing needs allocation that come through our housing element, all of those are related to the production of units. So all of these things are needed to these create a complete housing policy. And what we're dealing with, with zoning and with standards for design, deals with one piece of this larger pie. Um, and the availability and affordable housing, affordability of housing are related, and we have a challenge with both. So um, California ranks 49th out of 50 um, in the nation in terms of housing units per capita, the only, we are exceeded only by New York. And housing production has to be one piece of this answer about housing availability and affordability. We have Santa Cruz residents at every income level. We need housing production at every income level. And we all know it's hardest to produce housing at those lowest affordability levels. And that's where we have to start looking for other tools to add into there because they need subsidy. They need those tenants need protections um, in those very low income households. So this project is really centered in, again, production and responding to state law that comes out of the state seeing a shortfall of uh, 1.8 million housing units between 2018 and 2025. That, that was their, their estimated production need. And, um, we are not close to meeting that at this point. And, but this, this is the number that underpins those RENA numbers that um, we're all seeing come out throughout the state. Um, and while this project does not create new development capacity or, in, or density, we do feel and believe that creating objective zoning standards can smooth the production, can shorten the development timeline and make it easier to produce the housing that we're already zoned for. So that's really the goal with this project. So in phase two, we were talking about defining and measuring community character um, and collected input through a survey to form draft standards. So we had our survey out in March. We did our focus groups in July and got really great input and feedback. So key findings were um, a desire for corridors to have active ground floors. So shops, restaurants, um, just generally activity, front door stoops for, you know, residential units that are on those corridors, 
um, if, if it's residential on the ground floor. Um, there was a big preference for architectural freedom and variety over creating like a really strict standard, like a Santa Barbara style standard where like everything has to look exactly one way. Um, people really like the mix that Santa Cruz represents. There were uh, priorities for impart apartments that we heard from people, renters and low income households, especially concerns about security, access to sunlight, and a strong preference for private open space over um, shared or you know, sort of community open space within apartment developments. And then of course, a lot of support for affordability, for livability in the housing stock and for access to nature. So I just wanna show you a couple of slides. You've seen these before too, um, some of the results from our survey. So this was a question about um, the heights of buildings that would be uh, necessary on ocean, water and SoCal. So the test fit analysis that we did that Kristen's gonna talk about in a minute, um, showed that we need at least four stories to make that development capacity really fit. So we wanted to hear from the community, what are you ready to accept in those locations? And so this blue, this blue, oh goodness, sorry. This blue segment, um, it shows folks that responded with four stories, five stories, six stories, no maximum or something else. And, and most of these something else answers were something less than four stories. Um, but so to me, when, when I look at this, I see that there is, um, you know, pretty good support for um, accommodating some additional height in those neighborhoods and in those locations in order to create the housing that we've planned for. Um, okay, um, another one of the questions we asked was about, you know, what are the most important things to include with new buildings, even if maybe that does increase the cost of them. And the two standout um, answers to that were architectural details. So variation of reform, bay windows, you know, Juliet balconies, things like that, um, or ground floor shops and restaurants. And there was really strong support for those, um, for those key components. Oh, I got these out of order, I'm sorry. Oh, I guess I added this slide twice. I'm sorry about that. So um, we got really great feedback from our surveys and it really helped us figure out what was important to folks and how do we define that community character and what are we looking for? So then we moved on to phase three, shaping and refining. So we collected feedback and responses from our public review draft. Um, we came to your council in November. We came to the planning commission in November. We got really good feedback from all of you as well. Um, we held our office hours, we had our web platform up and, and gathered input and feedback there. So that helped us really hone in on a couple of things. So we had um, some mixed feedback about active uses versus residential only buildings and commercial districts. That wasn't something that there was like really strong opinions like one way or the other. We did hear loudly and clearly from folks concerned about development impacts on neighbors. So massing and height, shadow, concerns about privacy for next door neighbors. We had a lot of comments come in specifically about dark sky lighting um, in neighborhoods and then looking at neighborhood buffers and looking for additional open space amenities. So additional things that could qualify um, to be included in the um, required open space on a project. And then um, our feedback from, from our developer focus group um, was really interested in creating some more flexibility around how we defined what an active use is for those ground floor, you know, commercial style uses, and then cleared up, helped help us clarify some language around um, some of the standards that we were proposing. And then there was some concern about the private open space ratio um, that came out of that meeting. And now I'm gonna pass it off to Kristen Hall, our urban designer to talk about um, the analysis that we did and then the standards themselves, these design standards that we wrote for um, the multifamily housing and how we responded to those community comments. Thank you so much, Sarah. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Great. Yes, thank, thank you. you so much. Uh, do you want to go ahead and go to the next slide? And the next slide. <laughs> hey, we already got through two more of the 80. Um, Thank you so much uh, again for hearing about all the work we've been doing tonight. And just to pick up from where Sarah left off, she mentioned a little bit about these test fits that we had done 
Um, and this was really a way just to understand what are the constraints that exist right now in housing production, where are the pain points, and how might we use the, these objective development standards as a way to enable more production of housing on lots that haven't seen that development. So um, we looked at two sort of, we looked at one sort of typical site, which is the one on the bottom here. Santa Cruz has a lot of these smaller lots, which are quite difficult to develop. Um, and they're constrained by the narrowness um, and also by things like parking ratios. And so we were just trying to understand when you put together parking ratios and setbacks and FAR and all these various sort of technical aspects of what's allowed to happen on a site, what might you end up with? Um, what might it look like and how might it look economically? Um, we also looked on at a larger site, which tend to be um, more economically viable to build on just because you get economies of scale on larger sites. So that's the, the image on the top there. Um, and we, you know, did all of these based on market assumptions that were given to us by our economist who did a survey of all the units that have been delivered in the last 10 years. What are typical unit sizes, um, market rate rents that are, are current in, in Santa Cruz. And then they um, analyzed a number of development scenarios looking at what could you do within the full envelope? What could you do within the height limit? And then what could you do if you met the most efficient um, building design, which might, which is typically exceeding the height limit because again, uh, uh, efficiencies of scale, economies of scale. Um, next slide. So our findings were kind of four key things. The first is just that small sites are challenging. So you know, where you have more height or FAR, those places are more likely to develop because they can provide more units, that have, but they have the same fixed cost. So the cost of land is the same, but the amount of units that you can put on it increases. Um, so that's just kind of a basic fact in development that happens in most cities that these small sites are really difficult. Um, for larger sites, um, what we found is that projects have to be at least four stories in order to achieve the 2.75 FAR that's allowed. So, you know, to summarize that, the, the existing height limit is generally lower than what the density limit would allow. So if you are able to go up to the density limit, you would need more height in order to achieve the number of units that are actually allowed um, by that density. The third point, um, mixed use is more challenging than residential only developments, and that's partially because retail re requires much higher levels of parking than other types of uses. So um, restaurant uses, for example, require eight spaces per thousand square feet, which is significantly higher than the, you know, one and a half or so spaces per thousand square feet of a unit. Um, retail also doesn't generate as much revenue as other uses. So when you are able to rent out a unit versus retail, um, you are able to get much more revenue per square foot. Um, and then the last point is just that these scenarios where we had higher density were the most financially feasible. So you'll see more developer interest in sites that um, have the 2.75 FAR plus density bonus. And this is why most of the projects that have been coming forward have been density bonus projects, because that's the thing that has actually enabled these projects to become more feasible, uh, financially feasible. Next slide, please. Go ahead. So I'm going to talk a little bit about these, um, the development standards themselves, and just a few thoughts kind of on the overarching organization and structure of them. Sarah mentioned um, that a lot of our feedback was from residents on, about how, you know, neighborhoods are in Santa Cruz are really characterized by eclecticism. <laughs> which makes it difficult to create a set of standards that really regulate the look and feel of buildings in a way that's consistent, right? Because the buildings aren't consistent. And so how do you think about regulating buildings when this sort of eclecticism is really the character of the city? So one of the things we found is that neighborhoods are distinguished by the relationships of the buildings to the street and to each other and not by specific architecture. So you'll see a lot of different architectural styles in a neighborhood. But in that neighborhood, the things like the street width or the size of the lots or the setbacks are all kind of more consistent. And that's what creates the character of those neighborhoods. And those things already exist in the zoning code. So we weren't, and that's actually what's regulated why the buildings look the way they do. And so we didn't want to touch those things, except in some cases to make it a little bit easier for uh, buildings to be built. Um, uh, 
and then there's also kind of two more specific types, if we wanted to narrow them down, of neighborhoods, which are the corridors, which are these more intense development areas. They have more height, more active uses, particularly at the ground floor, like retail, office uses, things like that. And then the residential neighborhoods, which are characterized by lower intensity, you know, smaller buildings, um, and a lot, of, a lot more landscaping. And again, that just to the point about the kind of eclectic style of Santa Cruz, throughout, um, we'll show some of these little word on the street bubbles, which were incorporated into the design standards. And this is just kind of showing a little bit of a flavor of the what we the responses we heard from individuals about what they think about um, Santa Cruz and how it should look in the focus groups and in the surveys. So we heard um, in these commercial corridors, 67% of respondents to the survey preferred an eclectic building look over a uniform one. We asked them specifically, which one do they prefer? And they said eclectic. We also heard this quote, Santa Cruz is about uniqueness and being different. Like there's nothing that's exactly the same in Santa Cruz. So again, just more to that style. Um, the way the document is organized is um, we have sort of three key points. There's the topic area, which is the title of the section. And then there's a bowl, which tells you the intent behind the standard. So if you know there's some question about how to assess the development proposal for findings, this is how you would understand the intent. And then there's the standard itself, which is kind of lays out the quantifiable or kind of clear rules about how that, that goal needs to be met. So for example, if we take neighborhood transition, the goal is to create a transition between new development and existing neighborhoods and provide privacy for current and future residents and minimize potential shading on neighboring residents. And then there's all the kind of quantifiable standards that come with that to achieve that goal, um, which is what the uh, planning staff would be reviewing when they look at a proposal. Yeah, sorry, thanks, Sarah. So this, the goals and standards themselves are broken up into two sort of categories. On, we have a list on the left and on the right. On the left are all the items related to site design. Um, and on the right are all the things related to specifically building design. So we want to think about how you site the building on the site in order to create things like walkability. Um, what are the types of uses you're creating? How are you reinforcing uh, a pedestrian environment? And then in terms of the building itself, you know, what are the specifics around the, the roof form or the material, et cetera? The things that are highlighted in orange here are things I'm going to share with you today and a little bit of detail about specifically. And I just actually, um, we didn't have a slide in here about maximum building length, but um, we did include a standard about um, maximum building length, which was specifically designed to um, encourage buildings that are more sort of uh, apartment buildings that are more house shaped um, and you don't have parking inside of them, have parking on the lot in the back, because those are a type of building that are specifically understood to be more affordable by design. And this is based on research that's been done by Opticos in California. So you can see there's a number of ways we're trying to enhance affordability just through the way the building is designed itself um, and trying to support that kind of um, building design. So going through these, we'll start with parking location and screening. And the goal here is really about minimizing the visual impact of parking. We don't want to walk around a city and see parking everywhere. So we required that parking be wrapped by habitable spaces facing sidewalks. What does that mean? That's like, for example, on the bottom image here, you can see that street is lined with shops instead of parking garages. So it's just that you have to put the parking towards the back of the building. Um, and then also surface parking has to be buffered by landscape and we have specific requirements about how deep that landscape needs to be, how dense it needs to be, things like that. And the image on the top here gives an example. The next one is landscape and buffering. And, you know, we heard from folks that landscaping is really part of the character of Santa Cruz, that it's a really green city. This is something people are proud of and wanted to see more of. And so the goal here is really to enhance the urban forest, provide shade and help soften the building massing and also just to reinforce the character that we find um, throughout Santa Cruz. So in the R districts, we're requiring landscaping the front setback. In commercial and mixed use districts, we're requiring projects to provide street trees and planted areas along the public frontages. And on the right, you can see two images of what that would look like. Um, and we also require that this landscape be compliant with WELO standards, which is about 
um, water savings. So we're trying to create landscape that's not going to be very thirsty. On the next slide, um, this is about neighborhood transition. So the goal here was to create a transition between new development and existing neighborhoods. This is something a lot of community members were interested in exploring. And um, actually, surprisingly, um, the development professionals, the developers we talked to also felt that this was a really important thing to include um, because it helps them be better neighbors and helps clarify you know, how they are going to minimize impacts on adjacent neighbors. So um, what you can see here is the diagram is hopefully pretty self-explanatory where you have a rear yard you are required to have a setback off of that shared property line and then starting from the third floor there's this 45 degree plane um, that transitions the massing back away from adjacent properties so the idea here is to minimize overlooking of adjacent properties to minimize any shadow impacts and just to have a better um, transition between kind of higher density corridors and the more residential neighborhoods um, the next slide, these are two elements that work together. So this is roof form and building modulation. And the idea with roof form is that one of the things you do see throughout Santa Cruz is a more kind of human scale pattern where you have buildings that are broken down with these different roof forms. A lot of times you'll see gabled roofs. Um, you don't see a lot of um, kind of like long uninterrupted flat roofs, for example. So. Um, the other thing that helps make a building feel more human scale is to break it up um, into a number of smaller spaces or, you know, planes. And you can see in the images here how we're, we're requiring that buildings are modulated, meaning they move in and out at a certain rhythm. Um, and these two things work together. So the roof forms align with the modulation below it to help break up these larger building scales and make them more elegant and more human scale and more appropriate to the, the character of Santa Cruz. Um, on the next slide, ground floor design. Um, we heard a lot about wanting to have walkable neighborhoods where you could go shopping for your local, you know, groceries or be able to get a haircut and maybe things like architecture firms don't need to be located on the ground floor offices. So um, wanting to really support that walkability of these local businesses and then also provide res privacy for residents. The other thing we heard is um, developers really wanted to be able to put residential uses on the ground floor in places where it was appropriate, where there may not be a lot of foot traffic because, you know, retail is struggling and to require new retail in places where it may not be successful, it may mean a retail space would sit vacant. So um, we have a couple different approaches here for different places. Where we uh, have, where we require commercial uses, we're requiring them to have a higher level of transparency. And so you can see in and see what's going on and you can have eyes on the street. Um, we're requiring those non-residential uses at the ground floor only in commercial districts where it's appropriate to maintain that commercial character. And then residential uses at the ground floor where they occur have to be set back or elevated from the sidewalk, as you can see in the lower image here, where you have these setbacks and stoops. It creates this kind of nice intermittent zone where neighbors can meet and hang out, but also it feels like a little bit more sense of privacy around your front door. You're not opening the door right out onto the sidewalk. Um, on the next slide, we uh, also had a standard about building materials. Um, and really the, the key here is that um, building materials should be high quality and durable and reflect the existing character of Santa Cruz. And this was something that was mentioned frequently in our survey free responses where we had an open areas, you know, to invite people to share any concerns. Um, this was also a big topic of conversation at the Planning Commission where there was conversation about adding a standard specifically for windows to not be vinyl. Um, but to be wood, which is a higher quality window, um, or sorry, not a requirement to be wood, just to not be vinyl. Um, so the way we approached this was to provide a list of appropriate materials. Um, so if you are you are you if you're proposing to use any of these materials, you can be approved. But if you want to use a material that's unlisted, that would require a design review permit. Um, again, prohibiting vinyl windows, and then. Uh, we also added a standard for how living walls, um, these green walls, like the one in the bottom right here, could be applied. Um, you know, this is yet another way to kind of bring more character, more of this green character into Santa Cruz. Um, 
The next slide is about lighting. We had so much outreach from folks who were really interested in dark sky standards. Um, and this is really about making sure that you don't have a, light, a lot of light pollution. And there already exists a lot of lighting standards that have been used around the country that we could pull from here. So um, really the goal is to make sure you have the balance of safety and well at public spaces, but not creating a lot of light pollution. And there's a lot of technical ways you can do that by shielding light, by shining light only on buildings, by focusing the building, the light around entries and faces rather than kind of pointed up into the sky. And so we were able to draw on that great body of existing standards for this document. The next one um, is, that's it. That's over to Sarah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Kristen. Sorry, I popped this slide into your section. I didn't tell you about it, so I'll, <laughs> I'll take this one. Um, so Kristen's just um, gone through the design standards that we developed with UPP, and there are a couple of other development standards that are included and added in your package. And these are things that came up through um, like other community comments, but they weren't specifically design related. There are also um, a couple of things that we as staff and you know and city council and public noticed in doing our first SB 35 um, development application review that we had a couple of these standards um, that were sort of not quite as objective as we had hoped or expected. So um, the package before you today also does include proposals to add um, bird safe building design um, standards and requirements. Those are things that we worked with the um, local Sierra Club chapter and um, a bird safe building design ornithologist to develop. Um, we, we're also adding a um, requirement of regarding archaeological reports. So we already had a requirement that um, or a standard that required the creation of a report and the submittal of that report. And what was missing was a standard to require compliance with the recommendations of that report. So we're adding that. Um, we also, based on a um, uh, suggestion of one of our planning commissioners, um, took a look at the way that ADUs interact with our inclusionary housing standards. So our standards, inclusionary housing, those are units that are um, expressly set aside for households that make below a certain income level. And we had in the um, in the existing code, there's a standard that allows ADUs under certain circumstances to be used as the inclusionary units on um, other types of developments and especially in subdivisions of new single family homes. We're recommending that we remove that. Um, ADUs are not equivalent to other types of housing and they should not be um, used as an inclusionary standard, you know, to meet that requirement for other types of housing. It also just creates confusion because there are certain ways that um, because ADUs have typically been associated with single family homes, um, it makes the monitoring very hard when those are the inclusionary deed restricted units. Um, so we are recommending that we delete that allowance and say that ADUs cannot be used to meet the inclusionary standard of other types of housing. We are also recommending that we add a standard for um, multifamily properties that add five or more ADUs because that's now allowed under the state law. Um, projects can add or existing multifamily um, development can add up to 25% of the total number of units in the building as ADUs. And so we're recommending that when there are five or more of those, that they are then subject to our inclusionary standard and 20% of them have to be um, deed restricted on multifamily property. We're also adding, um, coming out of the objective standards, some definitions to our code. So we're adjusting the existing definition of usable open space to allow the, um, the area underneath the canopy of any tree to count twice towards that open space requirement. And our hope is that that can add enough flexibility to a site plan so that more trees can be retained on site. Um, we know that trees are super important for um, climate reasons, for shade reasons, for human livability reasons, and we want to find ways to encourage and support them staying on sites where they're already existing. We're also adding a definition of, or recommending that we add a definition of volumetric factory built housing. This is a type of housing that can be built in factory in modules. These factories are regulated by the state and inspections happen at the state. Uh, by the state at the factory. And then when those modules come to the site, 
um, the site work can go much more smoothly and quickly, and the inspections on site are limited to how do the modules connect to each other and how do they connect to utilities. And so it can just really streamline construction and cut down construction time and costs for developers. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about um, what changes we're recommending for our development review process. So um, as we incorporate de objective de development standards into our zoning code, it makes sense to take a look at the way that we currently regulate development and make sure that everything lines up. If we have all of these objective development standards and design standards for multifamily housing, does it make sense to still require making 10 findings of a design permit? It should be that, you know, if you've met all these objective standards, ideally we, these findings would be automatic, right? So if we've written the standards correctly, we're meeting all of those findings. So a compliant project should already be meeting those standards. Um, additionally, I just want to reiterate something that Lee said at the beginning. Um, most projects, most of our significant development projects that are coming in right now are seeking to vary from our zoning code in some way that is already triggering a public hearing. So they're looking for a density bonus. I mean, I think that's the big one. We can provide incentives in terms of making a, a, a smoother permitting process. And we are recommending that we do that to create some incentives for compliance with these standards that we've just written. And the financial incentive of pursuing a density bonus is always going to be really attractive to developers. And so um, those projects are always going to be coming in and those will continue to re um, require a public hearing. So I want to be clear, I saw in a couple of the um, course uh, pieces of correspondence we received from the public that they were concerned that there would be no public notification and they would lose this opportunity. Several folks cited the they were involved with a developer at um, 515 SoCal. So I just want to be really clear to those folks. That is the that communication that you're having with that developer right now and with the planning department is a result of our community outreach policy, which is staying exactly the same as it is. So notification, community meetings, um, you know, posting on the site when development proposals come in, all of that is staying in place. Um, what we're talking about doing is creating some changes to reflect the limitations that have, you know, come down to us through state law limitations for housing, where we can't deny or condition a project to reduce the intensity. We have to rely on objective standards. We can't lose any of that development capacity. So here, here are two lists. On the left, you see um, what's in a currently required under our code, community outreach and notice and meetings, public hearings for commercial development, density bonus applications, planned development permits, variances, postal permits, subdivisions, buildings that are in proximity to slope, residential development and commercial zones. Um, there's a right of appeal with all of these applications and CEQA review is required for all of these projects. On the right, you'll see what we're proposing, which is that community outreach happens with notice and meetings exactly as it does now. Public hearings happen for commercial development, density bonus projects, plan development permits, variances, coastal permits, subdivisions, proximity to slope exactly as it does now. This one place where we're suggesting a change to in, to recognize the objective standards is that um, we now limit public hearings to only when alternative designs are proposed for residential development. So we keep this right of appeal. We keep our CEQA review. This is this is really crucial. Several people commented that we were moving to a ministerial review process, and I just want to underline this is not a ministerial review process. Ministerial permits are like building permits. It's really it's literally just a technical checklist and no one can appeal, a, an applicant can appeal a building permit, but neighbors don't have a right to appeal that. Um, what we're talking about is an administrative process. And as Lee mentioned in his intro, this is essentially the same as the existing administrative process that we have for, for conforming development proposals in our multifamily zones that exist throughout the city. That's a standard and a practice that has been in, in place since we adopted our current zoning code in 85 and perhaps predates that. Um, so currently with those conforming proposals, we still do make design permit findings. And as I've mentioned a couple of times, that process just can't function the way that it was designed to and intended to when it was written. But we, there's still a right of appeal on those projects. They're still subject to CEQA. So in our proposal, 
we want to keep, essentially extend this administrative review process and have it apply to fully conforming rental multifamily projects in all zones. So we're creating mixed use zones. It makes sense that mixed use development that is fully conforming to all of the standards that we have in our code. If we can make this finding that they are fully conforming, that they should be able to get through this process without a public hearing in the same way that residential development happens now on multifamily property without a public hearing, unless there's an appeal. And because of that um, community outreach policy, people are gonna get noticing, they're gonna drive by a site and notice that it's been posted for development. And um, they're gonna have the, the same ability that they have now to get on the email list, to check our website, to follow the project, to meet with the developer. And as Lee mentioned, that's really the most productive way to, a, to affect a project and to change a development proposal. Public hearings where your time is limited to two minutes and um, you don't get to get into a back and forth with the actual project proponent. Um, it's just not as effective in terms of a tool to like really affect change and really participate and understand what's happening with a project. So we wanna make sure that we're maintaining all of that. And so now I'm gonna go into more detail on this. I will um, try to move a little bit uh, more quickly through this because this, this does get pretty technical. So um, our proposed pot process for fully compliant proposals is that an administrative design permit would be required. So it's administrative, no public hearing, still have the right of appeal, still subject to CEQA. For um, proposals that want to vary from some of these new design standards, so these design standards that are in 2412-185, um, any of them, as soon as you vary from one of those standards, um, a design permit with a public hearing would be required. And um, it would be heard either at the zoning administrator or at the planning commission level, depending on how, how many variations from those standards they were seeking. And that would still retain the right of appeal and would still be subject to CEQA. Um, sorry, let me go back once. Um, so the finding that the, that the decision makers would be making at these public hearings would be essentially what Kristen identified so that there, we have that goal for each one of these standards. So we would be looking to see does this alternative proposed still meet the goal of the standard that was from which they're seeking to vary? So that's the text, and those are the changes that you see into our design permit process. It's to create this um, situation where fully conforming projects, we make one finding that they, that they are fully conforming. They meet every one of our zoning district standards. They meet every one of our community design standards in Chapter 2412. They meet all of our, exist, our um, objective design criteria, all of our public work standards. Um, and there's no other trigger in there like a density bonus or a subdivision map if they're creating condominiums or um, new parcels that would trigger a public hearing. Um, and so I just wanna mention uh, on this last slide, Again, of the 16 proposals that we've had since um, the beginning of 2020 that are significant large projects, 13 of those proposals have been for a density bonus. And all 16 of those proposals would have triggered a public hearing under this standard. So 13 of them were seeking a density bonus. One of them was seeking a planned development. Um, one of them was seeking to vary from our standards in some um, in some other way. And then one of them was in proximity to a 50% or greater slope. So um, in terms of taking away opportunities for public engagement, this process really doesn't do that. What we're doing is recognizing um, an existing process that we have for conforming development and extending it to places where we are seeking to create residential development. And we wanna make sure that all of those processes that are working so well around community outreach stay in place and that we create this right of appeal so that when, when folks really feel strongly about something or feel that these objective standards aren't being met, that they have recourse and a way to um, you know, seek restitution on that. So, stretch break. Um, so now we're gonna get into our new mixed use zones that we're proposing to create to implement the general plan and the Ocean Street area plan. So our um, 2030 general plan has many policies and um, vision statement and goals. And there are several that relate to um, this action that we're recommending that your council take tonight. So um, 
optimum utilization of infill parcels. So keeping a compact community with boundaries that are defined by the green belt and the Monterey Bay. So we're not expanding, we're not growing outward. Um, we're looking for a complementary balance of land uses and a land use plan pattern that promotes social diversity. So this is, again, one of those um, foundational values that um, when we as planners come in and we're like, we're, we're looking for places to put multifamily housing, this is part of that. We, we, we need more places to accommodate people in our community who need multifamily housing choices. Um, and then also specifically in these locations where the general plan identifies parcels that should be um, uh, designated for mixed use, we're um, looking at land use patterns that facilitate alternative transportation and minimize transportation demand. So we're transitioning to higher densities along the city's commercial corridors, which are shown here on this map. Again, this is the same map of our general plan. These are the parcels that we're gonna talk about now that are proposed for rezoning. We are rezoning them to exactly what is called for in the general plan, which to reiterate is already available to be developed under the state law. So, Within these districts, I also want to recognize that these rep represent sort of the commercial core of our city. So these are places that um, hold our existing you know, commercial uses that serve our neighborhoods and help us meet our daily needs for our households and both through employment and through services and entertainment options and restaurants and things like that. So in these mixed use zones, we are looking to require uses that are active um, on the frontage. So we are supporting mixed use in these locations, but we are gonna to continue to allow, or we're recommending that we continue to allow um, development that's a hundred, still 100% commercial, because these do represent our commercial core and we don't wanna see all of, we don't wanna see all of that go away. We wanna still maintain that option. So all the commercial uses that are allowed in these zones are based on the existing uses that are allowed in the CC zone, which is our you know most extensive commercial zone and most of the sites that are proposed for rezoning are currently zoned in the CC zone. So we didn't wanna be taking uses away from any existing property owners. Um, the Ocean Street zones encourage more commercial and visitor serving uses. So they're kind of skewed more towards commercial uses, whereas the, um, the zones on Mission Street and on the east side are more skewed towards residential style mixed use. And then the site standards that we're proposing are based on the adopted general plan and the Ocean Street area plan. So the heights are determined based on a combination of the floor area ratio, the FAR that's set in the general plan, and then um, the stories limit that's set in the Ocean Street area plan. So there's six of these zones. I'm gonna go through this part pretty quickly. So all on Mission Street, these sites would be rezoned into a new zone district mixed use medium density, MUM it would have a maximum height of four stories and 45 feet for mixed use development and slightly less for commercial development. Um, on the east side, these sites would be uh, rezoned to mixed use high density, MUH, um, located in clusters along um, a cluster here at Branson Forty and Water, cluster here at Water and Morrissey and along this part of Soquel and then at the corner of Branson Forty and Soquel. Um, so a maximum height here of five stories and 55 feet for mixed use development. Um, on Ocean Street, so Ocean Street, because of the way that the general plan land use designations intersect with the height standards in the Ocean Street area plan, there are actually four zone districts here um, and some sites that yeah. we can't, yes. Hi, okay, we had a request to slow down on the slides. Oh, sure. Do I need to go back? Go back a couple. And we, we are receiving a presentation. We will be able to have questions and public comments. Yeah, but she's, she's given the question right now. And she, she gave all the stuff, but now she's looking through and she's like, oh, I know you can understand it. But you're not going to Go ahead, Sarah. Um, okay, so... Again, these are the sites that are along um, along Mission Street. You can see this is the um, the site where the Safeway is, and and this intersection here adjacent to Miramar. Um, this is the corner of Van Ness. This is Bay Street right here. This is Bay Street Elementary, the site that's left out. So that can kind of help you orient yourself here on this slide. So mixed use high density. 
Again, here we're looking at um, these blocks of Soquel between Morrissey and Branza 40 with some um, areas that are excluded. And then there's a node at the corner of water in Branza 40 and at water in Morrissey. This portion of water is not being rezoned, This the interior portion between Poplar and Stanford. Um, and this is the area that has that 2.75 floor area ratio. And so we are recommending a maximum of five stories and 55 feet in height for these areas when it's a mixed use development. Um, so on Ocean Street, there are four zones and um, the first one mixed use Ocean Street medium density is shown here in this light orange color. So it's here. It's on this the back side of May. Oh, geez. Oh, this is really sensitive. On the back side of um, May here going up to Hubbard and then um, on this upper part up here. And then there's a little cluster down here on Barson at Barson and Ocean at the intersection. And um, this would be a height maximum of three stories and 40 feet for mixed use. The Ocean Street area plan also includes minimum heights. So um, one story and 16 feet would be the minimum height on these. Mis mixed use Ocean Street high density is shown in the darker orange color. So that's at um, Broadway and Ocean, this big cluster here, and then um, up here further above Ocean and Water, above the intersection. Um, that's also proposed for this zone district. So this would have a height maximum for mixed use of four stories and 50 feet and a minimum height of two stories and 24 feet. So mixed use visitor high density shown in the light blue color. Um, so it's at uh, ocean and water and at ocean and Soquel. And then there's also a piece here that's all the way over off of Riverside, just adjacent to the river. And so this again carries that highest um, floor area ratio of 2.75. And we're recommending here a height maximum for mixed use of four stories and 50 feet and a minimum of two stories and 24 feet. And then our last one, mixed use visitor serving additional height is this central portion. This includes the um, county building site, the Hotel Paradox, and then the um, this block between Dakota and Ocean. So this also carries that um, 2.75 floor area ratio in the general plan. And in the Ocean Street area plan, it's identified for a height of six stories. So we're recommending that for mixed use, it'd be a maximum height of six stories and 70 feet and a minimum of three stories and 40 feet. Again, these heights are based on the um, what's been adopted in the Ocean Street area plan. And so then this is a table. Um, this is also provided in the agenda materials as a standalone PDF uh, that just sort of summarizes everything so you can see it all together. Um, I will just point out, you'll notice that in um, MUM and MUH, the maximum height of commercial is less than the maximum height allowed for mixed use. And on Ocean Street, it's reversed. And this again reflects our um, the goals of the general plan for the Ocean Street corridor and of the Ocean Street area plan to encourage, be focused more on creating commercial development. And for these um, MUM and MUH sites on Mission and on the east side to be more focused on creating residential mixed use and really true mixed use in the traditional sense. So, um, so that's why you'll see that sort of change in heights from um, between the mixed use zones. So um, the rezone, creating a, an amendment to the zoning map, doing a rezoning requires a finding. The Planning Commission did make this finding at their hearing and um, had included it with their motion and their recommendation to your council. Um, so they found that the public necessity, general community welfare and good zoning practice would be served and furthered by the rezoning and that the proposed amendments is in conformance with the principles policy of the land use designation set forth in the, in the general plan, the LCP and any area or specific plan. Um, and that is true. We are implementing exactly what is called for in our general plan and um, to the extent possible in the Ocean Street area plan as well. So there are some other amendments that we made to our existing zones, because as we've talked about, these objective design standards will apply to multifamily housing that's built anywhere in the city that's outside of downtown. So downtown already has design standards in the downtown plan. 
Um, so these new objective standards won't apply in that area, but they will apply in all other areas of the city. So there were some um, sort of like tightening up and sort of adjustments we had to make to some of those existing zones to recognize that we're now using these objective design standards or would be using them. Um, and so uh, in our residential zones, our, our multifamily residential zones, so the RL zone and the RM zone, there we, we made a slight modification to the way that you calculate the side yard setbacks that allows for articulation at the top of the building and allows more floor area to be on the lower two stories. In the residential high density zone, the RH zone, we're deleting standards that conflict with any of our proposed standards. Um, and the RH zone only applies to about three parcels in the city and um, two of them are already fully developed. So, and one of them is in the downtown plan expansion area. So those, those standards really don't apply very far. And then you'll also see in all the zone districts, we um, recently updated our wireless communication, telecommunication facilities ordinance. And so we had to sort of add wireless communication facilities as an allowed use in every zone district where it's allowed. So you'll see that throughout the code amendments. In our beach residential zones, um, the anywhere where the zone itself described the purpose as providing housing or providing for residential development, we made residential uses principally permitted rather than Currently, they require a use permit, or, and in some cases, a special use permit, depending on the size of the project. So we're recommending that those all be principally permitted because essentially under the state law, we're not permitted to deny them. So what's the function of requiring a use permit? Um, we're removing a distinction, recommending that we remove a distinction based on project side, size, but the other site standards and the densities are not changing. Commercial uses are not changing, and we're just adding that wireless update. In our commercial zones, in certain commercial zones, so this is the commercial thoroughfare, the neighborhood commercial, the commercial at the beach, which includes the wharf, and in our um, professional administrative uh, zone districts, we're requiring active uses at the ground floor level. And in each of these zone districts, we're recommending that we create a category that identifies uses for active frontage. So that's very clear what is appropriate to fill that requirement. Um, we're making mixed use development principally permitted in those zones. So you can do residential along with commercial development and then limiting the ability to, to build standalone residential to just a few um, sort of some of the existing conditions in which you can do standalone residential. We're really making sure that that's tightened up and clear that they're very limited circumstances. Um, the density for residential development in those in these zone districts is either based on the existing residential medium or residential low multifamily, um, which is staying the same as what it is currently. And then we're adding that wireless update in those zones. In our CC and RTC, these are our main commercial zone districts. So the CC is along Mission, along Soquel, along Water, along parts of Ocean Street. Um, and the RTC is the, the beach frontage and the boardwalk um, down in the beach area. So active uses in these areas are encouraged. We are not requiring active uses in these locations because currently the code allows SROs, so single room occupancy units, which is the densest type of housing the city allows, can be built as standalone projects. So in order to not reduce the capacity for housing, we didn't feel like we could make a change there without making some other change to either increase the height and we didn't wanna to touch that. So we're just gonna to continue to allow the current condition um, and your council might recall that we just created flexible density units, FDUs. And when we created those units, we um, made the determination that in the RTC zone at the beach and downtown where those units are allowed, we would require them to be part of a mixed use development. So we do require a ground floor commercial use of some kind, but in the com community commercial, that CC zone that stretches out far along our corridors, um, we are going to allow those to be standalone developments as well. Um, and we're just recommending we maintain that decision that we just made um, a few months ago. So um, typical units are allowed either as mixed use, oh, oops, geez, either as mixed use um, or as standalone residential. And when if you're doing standalone residential, then we want to see some 
live work, we've created some standards that some of those units on the ground floor can be created as live work units. And we're hoping that this can create some more opportunities for small businesses in Santa Cruz, for people who are entrepreneurs or, um, you know, people who see a couple clients a week or something to have a commercial space that's combined with their living space and um, just create some opportunities for that kind of um, uh, land use in Santa Cruz. And again, there's the wireless update. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the Planning Commission recommendation um, on everything that I've talked about so far. So the Planning Commission uh, reviewed these at two separate hearings, three separate hearings, but you know we started off with two separate hearings to really dive deep on all of this content. And um, in both cases, they had sort of a yes and approach to them. So they are recommending approval of the staff, re staff recommendation of the standards, of the zone districts, of the rezonings, of the process changes. Um, Kristen mentioned um, a desire to prohibit vinyl windows on street facing building facades. They also um, direct or are suggesting that the um, that your council require bus passes for projects of 50 or more units. And then um, they also are recommending that you increase the inclusionary standard for projects of 50 or more units to 25% um, inclusionary and for 100 or more units to 35% inclusionary. Um, and then with the, in the, as part of the second hearing, they also approved the staff recommendation uh, about the mixed use zones and the process, and then also added um, a recommendation that your council increase the inclusionary requirements, specifically this time for density bonus projects. So um, our staff response is we've incorporated this um, change about vinyl windows. Um, we actually took it a little bit further. So prohibiting vinyl windows on building faces oriented towards streets for buildings that are up to three stories in height. And then for um, buildings that are over three stories in height, um, vinyl windows are not permitted on any building face. So they would have to be some other type of material. Um, in, as regards to bus passes and requiring them for every development over um, 50 units, we are recommending that your council um, defer consideration of that till you are considering the climate action plan next month. There is a lot of content in that climate action plan that gets into transportation demand management. And um, we think it's important to think about uh, context and and make sure that bus passes are the right measure to really reduce transportation demand. Um, Cause that could be kind of different based on where you are and what the bus routes are. Um, relating to the inclusionary increases, we understand that this is a really important issue. Affordability is um, something that everyone in our community cares about. And um, staff is concerned that we could increase this rate without studying it or testing what effect that might have on overall housing production. Um, we are concerned that it could chill development of all housing and reduce the number of affordable units that are created and the number of market rate units that are created. Um, this could put us into a tricky situation with failing to meet our RENA obligation. And then that means we're gonna have more super streamlined SB 35 development applications com coming through. And um, we are thinking about making sure we can certify our housing element that we're currently beginning to, to draft and we're gonna be working on over the next sort of 18 months. Um, inclusionary requirements are considered under housing element law as a potential governmental constraint and they need to be analyzed and we need to be able to show that our rate is not a governmental constraint on housing production. We're not sure how we would do that without a study identifying that this rate could work without chilling production. So um, failing to have a certified housing element could have big ramifications in terms of the grants the city can apply for, for everything from road work to affordable housing. So um, staff is really recommending that your council be cautious before um, taking any action that might put that in jeopardy. Okay, and with that, I'm going to pass it off to Nathan Wynn from Public Works to talk about um, public works standards for the public realm, loading spaces, underground utilities, sidewalks, things like that. Thank you, Sarah. 
Uh, good evening, uh, City Council, members of the public. My name is Nathan Nguyen. I'm the Assistant Director of Public Works, uh, City Engineer, and tonight I'll be presenting uh, items related to uh, essentially the, the public works and, and public realm. Um, the standards that uh, you have on that slide, uh, as, as Lee and Sarah and team has mentioned, that these proposed revisions to uh, work together to create objective standards uh, that comply with our uh, general plan, area plan, and zoning codes. Uh, one of the first things that we looked at was the loading, uh, off street loading uh, facilities. So we added additional use cases there. Uh, we had warehouse and other similar items uh, already existing in our code, but we wanted to be more explicit with regards to residential and office and mixed use development as, uh, as this project is about mixed use and uh, creating those objective standards for that. And so um, we added it in our community code, some uh, additional requirements with regards to what type of off-street parking would be required. And so type A, uh, you can see there the dimensions of the eight by 24 and a type B is what we had before, which was a 10 by 30, uh, actually with the 14 foot height requirement too. And this is to, um, again, uh, require developments to make sure they have enough adequate off-street parking for the types of um, development that they're proposing, uh, mainly mixed use uh, and high density type of uh, housing. Uh, in addition to that, we also wanted to include uh, mixed use or uh, multifamily uh, developments that are three or more units to include uh, refuse enclosures, so trash enclosures. Uh, again, it's something that uh, we at Public Works uh, often have to battle with regards to um, picking up trash and recycling containers uh, in the rain. We want to make sure that those things are uh, orga neatly organized and that there is a, a path of travel for our, our um, collections team to, to pick those uh, collections up. Uh, next, uh, we went into underground utilities. Uh, economic development reached out to Public Works, asked us about um, the idea of trying to put uh, conduit uh, in these development projects for future use. So while one uh, development may only be working on a certain section of roadway, you know, maybe 100 feet or or, or, or less, uh, the idea would be is that we add language in our mini code now so that we can only, uh, we can have them install a, a, a future conduit uh, for things like fiber as, as other developments come along uh, along the way um, that, again, that system gets uh, built out and, and or when we apply for grants to build out our own uh, communications network, uh, that conduit's in place. And so that's what, um, again, working with economic development, trying to uh, build out our communications uh, network. Um, the third item that you have before you is the public realm and sidewalks. And this is, this is something new. So this is under Title 15. Um, this, again, relates to mixed use um, and housing development. Um, what we decided to do is, you guys may be familiar with the traffic study requirements um, that has been before you um, in the recent uh, months. That, that usually is typically tied to uh, our TIF program as well, uh, traffic impact fee. But what we wanted to do is we wanted to bake it into our muni code so it's much more explicit for developers, uh, their understanding that the transportation study is required for uh, developments that have uh, 50 or more uh, peak hour, PM peak hour trips, and that the transportation study itself the, will evaluate the impacts of the project and what comes out of that evaluation leads into the next item you have before you, which is traffic control devices. So um, as we gained experience with some recent SV35 project, we realized that the transportation study needs to be performed in order for us to evaluate what needs to actually be included in a development project. And so now that essentially is explicitly stated in our mini code. Now, uh, on top of that, we added that um, projects from our city adopted active transportation plan, um, our area plans, and then uh, we called out uh, these other standards, the California Manual uh, Uniform of Traffic Control Devices, the National Association, of city transportation officials and the American Association of Highway Transportation Officials. Again, these are these are standards within the traffic engineering field, and we want developers to know that they have to meet these standards and that our city um, must comply with those. Um, the third item we have uh, there is under C, which is ADA bus stops. So we worked with Metro on this one as well. 
Um, the idea here is that with uh, developments that have five or more units and uh, that are greater than 10,000 square feet of commercial office space, that we want to, that type of development um, to install an ADA uh, bus stop. Um, again, we, we want to help try and promote uh, more mass transit in our area. And so this, this is one tool in which we would um, implement that. Uh, on number D, letter D, uh, street lights. So roadway street lights, um, you guys may have also heard in the past from local roadway safety plan, you, uh, you know, lighting is an important safety feature uh, for our roadway system. And so uh, units or developments that have three or more units or that are commercial would be uh, required to install a street light as a part of their project. Um, and then lastly, and, and um, this one also gets a lot of attention here um, uh, in our review is the corridors and sidewalk widths. Um, so in, instead of having developers having to go through all the different area plans that we have uh, throughout the city, we try to take all those uh, standards from those area plans and again, bake them into our muni code. So it's easier for developers to see what those minimum sidewalk widths um, are gonna be um, on these, you know, high, these uh, arterials and um, major collectors. Again, this, this relates to mixed use um, development. And uh, we put an eight foot minimum on, on sidewalks that, um, that aren't necessarily identified in the area plans, but that are, again, are still um, on streets where this is zoned for mixed use development. So this is an eight foot minimum sidewalks for your local or residential streets. But as, as Sarah has shown you on the maps earlier, these are for those roadways where we expect to have a lot of foot traffic uh, due to high density mixed use development. And then um, one thing I'll, I'll, I'll kind of close off with is um, a couple of things actually is in, we took these standards to our Transportation Public Works Commission on May 16th uh, of this year, and they unanimously approved the uh, uh, revisions before you, but they also added a couple of uh, additional um, requests in seeking uh, staff to look into Assembly Bill 602 with regards to um, uh, charging housing fees based on square footage rather than units. And so uh, we've looked into that and we'll continue looking to it more, but um, at, at the at, uh, based on our initial analysis, uh, at least with regards to the public work standards that are before you right now, these aren't uh, fees that are generated from these particular standards. So these are standards that we're, we want a developer to comply with, but uh, at, at no point uh, here that's being presented that um, these items are based on um, generating fees that the developer has to pay. So I just want to be clear on that, that it, the AB 602 wouldn't apply essentially to the public works uh, revisions, but possibly others um, in, in the um, revisions for objective standards. Um, in addition to that, our commission TPWC uh, asked us to come back with some future objective standards. Reason being uh, staff, we decided uh, not to um, take uh, a lot of maybe what we consider uh, controversial or more complex objective standards at this time. We wanted to be able to uh, provide and present something to uh, the commission and council that can be approved so that we can get these objective standards approved. Um, and then at a later date, uh, with regards to, um, uh, I, I apologize, that should be on-street parking in multimodal facilities. Uh, those would be evaluated uh, as a part of a future project for a curb management policy uh, once we have um, staffing uh, capacity to do so. Um, and with that, um, I will pass it on to, I think, um, Parks and Rec. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, good evening, Mayor Brenner, council members, and members of the public. I'm Travis Beck, superintendent of Parks and I'm here to discuss the portions of tonight's item that pertain to street trees. So before we get into the details, I wanna take a little trip back in time to April of 2021, when this council reviewed and approved our street tree master plan. And this master plan set a number of goals and actions for the city to achieve in order to increase our urban forest. And those include three items, emphasizing incorporating trees in development and redevelopment projects, 
exploring revising the municipal code to promote the protection of community trees and evaluating larger in lieu fees for mitigation. So the three items that we are presenting for your consideration tonight and that are detailed on the following three slides are really the actions taken to achieve those goals that were approved in the street tree master plan. So the first and principal one of these is amending the zoning code to require street trees in development projects. And this is really the origin of our involvement in the whole objective standards project. Uh, Sarah Noisy approached uh, Leslie Keedy, our urban forester, and myself and said, you know, we're hearing a lot of feedback from the community that green space landscaping trees are an important consideration in the objective standards. But in our current standards, we have no requirement for actually planting street trees. So we worked with uh, our colleagues in planning and public works and uh, came up with a set of requirements. Basically, whenever you have a development that triggers a sidewalk wide enough to incorporate street trees within it, it would trigger this planting requirement. One tree for every 30 feet of street frontage or fraction thereof would need to be planted and maintained permanently. And the existing trees on the site would count towards this total and they would of course be subject to other protections existing in the municipal code and chapters 1330, our tree ordinance and 9.56, our heritage tree ordinance. In those objective standards, we included criteria to avoid conflicts with utility infrastructure. As you heard in uh, Nathan's presentation just a minute ago, the objective standards include certain utility requirements, street lights, et cetera. So we wanna make sure that there aren't conflicts between the trees and those utility items, avoid conflict with existing trees and avoid creating traffic safety, that is to say visibility issues. And then we also include a provision that where trees cannot be planted as street trees, if there are a variety of conflicts with that infrastructure, they may be located elsewhere on the property including in a permanent planting bed on a roof deck at a ratio of 1.5 to one, and that would be rounded up. That's the zoning re code requirements that we're um, proposing. And then the next element that we're uh, bringing forward tonight are some updates to our tree ordinance, chapter 1330. And after much back and forth with uh, planning again, with the city attorney's office and with our parks and recreation commission, we came to these proposed changes to add certain elements of the objective standards within chapter 1330, those dealing with the selection of trees, with the size and quality of the trees. Also require that the planting and care of street trees follow industry standards, which was a recommendation from the street tree master plan. And then a lot of that red ink that you see on the page in the chapter 1330 revisions is really clean up, clarifying changes to the title. Um, we're proposing a new title, which is the Street Tree and Nuisance Vegetation Ordinance for Chapter 1330, clarifying the purpose of the ordinance and its relation to the Heritage Tree Ordinance, adding definitions to be consistent with other portions of the Municipal Code, clarifying the duties of various parties, homeowners, Parks and Recreation Commission, et cetera, and then a lot of cleanup in terms of our procedures for permitting, uh, appeals, damages, et cetera. So after two meetings and discussion with the Parks and Recreation Commission, the changes to 1330 were recommended for adoption on June 13th of this year. And then finally associated with those changes to 1330, we're bringing forward a proposed resolution to establish an in lieu fee for street tree replacement. So in circumstances where a property owner seeks a permit to remove a street tree, normally we, would, we will continue to require that that tree be replaced on site. But if it's not feasible to replace the tree on site, we're proposing that an in lieu fee would kick in. And these fees would fund the uh, planting of a replacement tree elsewhere on public property. The fees are based on the costs to purchase, install, water for two years until the tree can hopefully survive on its own, and then perform an initial structural pruning on a replacement tree. Now, as you can imagine, all of those costs add up. 
So we're looking at for smaller trees, those seven inches in diameter or less, a fee of $1,510. And for trees that are needing to be replaced over seven inches, a fee of $1,705. And those would uh, increase over time with inflation. We looked at other agencies throughout the state to see uh, what they were charging. We found that in lieu fees were common, uh, ranging from a low fee of $267 for single family properties in Los Angeles, uh, over $3,500 for the largest trees in Los Gatos and uh, trees in Sacramento. And as I said, these payments would go to fund tree planting and maintenance throughout the city. So this uh, resolution that's before you tonight was recommended for adoption by the Parks and Recreation Commission at their August 8th meeting. So those conclude uh, the elements relating to street trees, but urban forester Leslie Keedy and I are available for questions at the conclusion of the presentation. And now I'd like to turn it over to planner Catherine Donovan, who will discuss some additional changes to the zoning code. Good evening. Uh, my name is Catherine Donovan. I'm a senior planner with our advanced planning division. And um, just because this ordinance wasn't going to be long enough, no, that's not actually the reason. Um, at the same time that the objective standards were being developed, we were working on one of our uh, sort of almost annual zoning ordinance updates. And as both of those projects progressed to the public hearing uh, in the public hearing cycle, we realized that both of these ordinances were going to be um, going through at either exactly the same time or very close to the same time. And that meant that there was going to be a problem because we were working on some of the same chapters of the municipal code. And if they were approved and we sent them off to the code publishing to update our municipal code, those two ordinances would overwrite each other. And um, it would be very difficult to to uh, make sure everything went smoothly. Um, so we took them separately um, up to the planning commission or through the planning commission as separate projects. And then after the planning commission um, recommendations of approval, we integrated the two ordinances together um, and so that is part of the reason why you have such an enormous packet. Um, there's this incredibly um, dense and important objective standards document. Um, and then there is also um, one of our normal uh, zoning ordinance updates, which always um, becomes longer than we had intended. Um, so. That said, let's get on with the zoning ordinance update. So why do we do these updates? Um, there are a variety of reasons. We need to provide internal consistency in the zoning ordinance. Um, we want to improve development processes. We want to make sure that the municipal code is consistent with state law, which is constantly changing. Um, we want to update our standards and regulations either because things are out of date or because um, we've noticed that something is causing problems consistently and we want to fix it. Uh, we also want to do minor revisions to make things clearer and to easier to use. And we just want to improve the ordinance to better meet the needs of all of the city's residents, um, as well as developers and city staff. Next slide. Um, so I'm going to go through each sort of the types of, of updates that we have and some examples. So the first type is the consistency amendments. Um, and there are several different examples here. Um, in a previous ordinance um, amendment, we removed the conditional driveway permit requirement 
but at that time there was an error in the way it was written in the actual ordinance itself and um, the title in the first paragraph of that section that part got removed but the rest of it was still in there so we're removing the rest of that as it was originally intended um, another thing that we're doing is there's a process called a use determination um, which in all of our zoning districts we have allowed uses uses that require use permits and um, sometimes there is a use that is similar to what is allowed in a district but it's not listed because we can't list every single use that can be imagined and so there's a paragraph in each zoning district that says um, if there is a use that's similar to other uses the zoning administrator can make the determination of whether that can be allowed um, and whether it requires a use permit based on what use it's most like um, those sections occur in almost every district um, but the wording in them just varies just slightly depending on probably when it was added to the district um, so we're updating that section so that it's consistent across all the districts um, we're also updating uh, in our chapter 24.04 the administration chapter of the zoning ordinance there is a list of the projects that for use the use permit projects that do not require a public hearing and um, we're updating that list um, and we're also updating the table that um, shows which body makes the decision on what type of a process next Um, we also are doing some amendments in our processes. Um, we are um, removing the public hearing requirement for low risk alcohol permits, and that is for an alcohol permit that is associated with a restaurant. Um, we currently require a use permit public hearing at the zoning administrator. Um, the current planning division tells us that they almost never have anyone but the applicant at those public hearings and so um, requiring a public hearing for that type of use seems to be um, over and above what's needed um, we're also clarifying um, if you are applying if you have a minor modification to an existing approved use permit um, there is a section that says that you can only do that once in five years unless you are not increasing the intensity of use but there's a uh, it's not actually clear that if you are not increasing it you can do it more than once in five years and so this we're just clarifying that um, and then we're also making some revisions to our fencing standards so that fewer projects would be required to um, get conditional fence permits. Next slide. Um, and then I mentioned before that we um, state law is constantly changing and we're always playing catch up to make sure that our ordinances comply with state law. And so a couple of the examples for that, um, the last time we updated the requirements for family daycare homes which was I think in about 2017 um, large family daycare homes required a use permit um, and that has changed under state law we can no longer require um, any kind of a permit for any um, family daycare homes so um, we're changing that and that is another change that um, is in all zoning districts that allow residential uses so um, that changes in many places but it's a minor change um, we also are updating our um, replacement demolition and relocation assistance um, standards we are maintaining our city standards where those standards are more strict than the state standards but instead of um, 
reiterating every single standard that the state has at this point in time. We're simply referencing um, the state standards and saying that when the state standards um, are more strict or, or would provide um, more assistance or more units, um, that the state standards would apply. Next slide. Um, so some of the specific updates to standards, um, we made some changes to our fencing ordinance. Um, and these were based on recommendations from our current planning division because they are dealing with um, people and projects day in and day out. And so a lot of our recommendations are to help them um, make processes simpler or more sensible for the general public. So um, one of the recommendations was to change the fence height on interior side and rear fences. So um, the fences that are between two properties and in the rear of a property um, from a maximum height of six feet to a maximum height of eight feet um, with that two feet above six feet or anything above six feet being at least 50% open. So with lattice or slats or plexiglass or something like that. Um, we're also recommending a change to the setback um, for a six foot, foot tall fence on the exterior side yard. So this is on a corner property on the, not in the front of the house, but on the side. And we currently, um, you're required to have an eight foot setback before your fence can be six feet tall. Um, but that often defeats the purpose of putting a taller fence, which is to provide some, to allow the property owner to use that space um, as, as a usable open space with privacy. And so we're recommending changing that to a three foot setback um, and requiring that, that that three feet between the property line and the fence be kept landscaped. Um, and then that six foot fence would start either behind the front setback or behind the front uh, or aligned with the front of the building um, so that it would not encroach into the front yard. Next slide. Another example of the standards that we are updating has to do with our accessory buildings and structure section. A few years back, we um, did some updates to this and um, changed the ordinance. So it was addressing only accessory buildings. And um, after that had been done, we realized that we, we also needed a section about accessory structures. So we added in um, a second, we kept the accessory building sections and added a second section on accessory structures. Um, the difference being buildings have walls and a roof and structures are more open. Um, we also currently do not allow accessory structures or buildings in the front um, step back. And we're proposing to allow structures that are less than eight feet tall in the front and exterior side yards, as long as they are outside of the clear corner triangle. So that area that you need um, to be able to see on a corner so that there's not a traffic hazard. And also so that they would be 90% um, visually permeable above the first foot. And the idea there is that we want to be able to allow things like a gazebo or, um, a pergola, something like that, um, that would not block the view either from the house or to the house, um, but you could still have some sort of a structure in the front yard. Um, the other exception, we had a previously uh, uh, proposed a, a, an exception for a children's play structure, play house, um, and the planning commission expanded on, on our idea and um, 
recommendation was that children's play equipment that was less than 50 square feet in plan area and less than four feet tall be exempt from the regulations in the accessory building and structure section. Um, they would be required to have a three foot front, front setback and to be um, visually safe. Next slide. Um, and then there are some other sort of miscellaneous um, updates or, or corrections for clarity. We're, we found that there are still some references to the redevelopment agency, so we removed those. We revised the, a couple of references to the downtown recovery plan to just say the downtown plan. Um, we're changing, there's an allowance for projections that currently says into conforming interior side yards, and we're, we would like to change that to into required setbacks. Um, and we would like to include the planning director um, as an initiator of zoning map and municipal code text amendments. Currently, only the planning commission and city council can do that. that. Um, we also added in some definitions for the flexible density units that um, were accidentally left out of that um, ordinance change a few months ago. Um, and we're also clarifying the method of determining building height in our definitions chapter and also updating the definition of family daycare homes. Next slide. And I will also be doing the environmental review for both of these projects. Next slide. <coughs> Um, so for the objective design and development standards, the rezoning, the public work standards, and the street trees, um, they are they are implementing the general plan, which was studied in the EIR for the general plan. And so under section 15, 183 of the CEQA guidelines, no further environmental review is required. Um, and the zoning ordinance updates uh, fall under the um, general category of 15061B3, which basically states that um, when it is clear that a project um, would have no environmental impacts, then it, it, it's not required to review it under CEQA. Next slide. And I believe Sarah is going to take over now. Ooh, thank you. Thank you, um, everyone, <laughs> for your time and attention and for your great presenting and clear descriptions of the many different parts of this package of information. So we're reaching the end here, and I just want to hit a few of these key points again, because I know this was so much information for everyone to take in. and. Um, I just want to be responsive to some of the comments that we heard repeatedly in the um, community correspondence because I understand there's a lot of concern and a lot of just a feeling of overwhelm with the amount of content that we've provided today. So um, key reminders, the objective standards are not the same as the former corridors plan. Changes in state law have come down since the corridors plan that just really completely changed the ball game in terms of what's available to us and in terms of what our options are and the processes that we can use for regulating housing development and for moving development intensity or reducing development intensity as it may currently exist in those planning documents. So the zoning amendments that are here before you today reflect the general plan, they go no further and they, and they also reflect the entirety of what's in the general plan. The goal here is to provide greater transparency and certainty for everyone, ensure better design and materials. As Lee mentioned at the beginning, and we've talked about, um, the state law requires us to allow that level of intensity that's currently planned for in the general plan. That can happen today. And it has been available for developers since the beginning of 2020. So 
members of the public could go and look at our zoning code and really not understand that because our zoning code doesn't reflect the true development intensity that's available on those sites and provided to those to, to project um, proponents under our state law. So these design standards that we're creating are really about ensuring good community design. We have, as a reviewing agency, as a public agency, limited ability to improve design of projects currently because we have few of our objective design standards, of, of our objective zoning standards, which we have several, very few of them address design. And so what they currently address are, you know, boxes, building envelopes is what we have currently in our code um, because we've relied on these subjective review processes to get to good design. And we just simply are not able to do that anymore. Um, the objectives, these objective design standards really give the city the opportunity to retain some control over those design elements that we know are so important to creating high quality urban environments that are livable, that are walkable, that are wonderful places to live, to raise children, to work, and that our community really cares a lot about. And then lastly, about the development review process, I just wanna say again, this community outreach policy is completely intact. Folks who have been relying on email lists on the project um, on the city website to learn about um, new projects coming in, folks who, who know that um, sites have been posted in their neighborhood who've received postcards because of projects, none of that is going to change. Community meetings will still be required for projects that have more than 10 units. Um, anything that currently triggers um, a public hearing in terms of like a coastal permit or a tentative map for you know creating ownership units plan development permits use permits variances density bonus requests anything that varies from these standards in our code will trigger the need for a public hearing and so let's be clear a community meeting is an opportunity for the community and the developer and the planning department to come together and have a conversation that goes back and forth a public hearing is a formal event where a decision-making body is going to be making findings or a decision about a project and the community input is limited in terms of time. So um, the community meetings staying in place, some limited small number of projects that can fully conform to everything that we've discussed tonight and more that we didn't discuss might not trigger the need for a public hearing. But if they're in the coastal zone, they're gonna need a coastal development permit, you know, as we've mentioned, that, does, that density bonus is going to remain financially attractive for lots of developers. So those are going to continue to require public hearings. And then lastly, also this administrative process maintains the right of appeal and it ensures that CEQA applies to these projects. Those are really important points. Um, being able to appeal a, a project that you feel very strongly about, nothing about that is changing. And we want to make sure that we're continue to provide um, environmental review and appropriate mitigations where those are necessary. So, so next steps, this is presented tonight as a first reading for your council. Um, should your council take an action to approve this, we would bring it back for a second reading at the next available meeting. And then, um, so we have two different ordinances, one that involves sections that are part of our local coastal program, LCP, and one that involves sections of the code that are not part of our local coastal program. So the LCP ordinance um, after the second reading, should it pass, would take effect outside the coastal zone 30 days later. The um, ordinance that contains the sections of our code that are not part of the LCP would take effect citywide 30 days later. Um, those remaining pieces that aren't in effect in the coastal zone, we would need to submit to the Coastal Commission for review. So we would ask for that direction as part of our second reading and submit that to Coastal for review. Um, you'll see an analysis of LCP consistency in your um, agenda report. And then we would begin um, implementation of these standards and they would start applying to new development proposals in October. So we're going to need to be working with our consultant team to create some implementations tools for staff and applicants, series of checklists. We're going to update the standalone um, design standards document so that that's really just easy to use and um, easy to access for all members of the community. We do need to get to um, an amendment to the Ocean Street Area Plan to adjust the height that is um, currently limiting certain parcels that carry that highest 
2.75 floor area ratio, and there's just no way to make them match. So um, we didn't rezone those parcels tonight, and we are going to need to come back and do an amendment to the Ocean Street area plan to raise that height limit so it can really accommodate what's called for in the general plan, and then we'll be able to rezone those um, parcels into one of the zone districts we created this evening, or that would be created as part of this package. Um, we also, when we were here in November with the draft standards, we um, highlighted that there is an amendment to the text of the general plan that we really should make for the sake of consistency and clarity. Um, it contains some language that is no longer enforceable under state law. So um, we'd just like to clean that up and, um, you know, make it clear to readers of the general plan what, what's actually happening and, and able to be done. Um, and then, you know, we know this is um, one of the first times we're using objective standards to try and control design, which we have always done in a very site-specific and subjective way. And so we are anticipating that we're going to need to be making some tweaks and updates to this. And so um, sometime in the next, you know, 12 to 24 months, um, you should expect us to be back uh, with sort of a set of cleanups, amendments, you know, little updates for things that, you know, are not working quite the way we expected or, um, you know, need a little more clarification or a little more specificity. So, um, you know, you can expect that. And then I also want to mention, I forgot to put on my slide, there are two other next steps from Public Works. They are going to be considering um, pursuing more of a comprehensive set of standards around curb management and all the things that happen in that curb zone. They're waiting on some um, staffing up to happen uh, to support that work. And then in the Parks and Rec um, Department, they are going to be working with their commission on looking again at the mitigation requirements for heritage tree removals. Um, later this year. So that may be coming back to your to your council for some more adjustments to those um, heritage trees or large trees that are on private property. Um, and so then with that, we have our staff recommendation, which is printed in your agenda packets. We're introducing for publication two ordinances, one that includes sections of our code that are part of the local coastal program, and one that includes sections of our code that are not part of the local coastal program. Um, and then we are also introducing for publication an ordinance that would make um, amendments to our zoning map and rezone parcels into newly created zoning districts. And then um, our last recommended action for your council is that you adopt a resolution establishing a new in Luffy requirement for street tree removals. And that is our 80th slide. So thank you so much for your attention over the last um, two plus hours. And um, we are available, the whole team is here to answer um, any and all questions you might have after um, all of that content. Thank you very much, Sarah Noisy and your team. That was uh, probably one of the longest <laughs> updates, um, but thank you, I appreciate addressing a lot of the email questions we received ahead of time and creating the clear columns of what exists and what is being recommended in change. The visual on that was, was very helpful uh, rather than reading through dense text. At this time, I will uh, bring it to council for further clarifying questions on any of the presentation before I take it out to public comment. Council Member Brown. Um, I do have a number of questions, which um, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm gonna, we'll see how things go. <laughs> if I wanna lay all of those out um, tonight, um, but so I'm gonna reserve those for now. I, um, and I would, I would ask, we have people in the audience and people online who have been waiting a long time, and so it just feels like it would be nice to let them speak. Um, I do have a procedural question, though, that I want to ask first, um, because I received a um, query about this, and so I was um, checking with Tony Condotti about um, our, the way our zoning ordinance is worded and the relationship between um, Planning Commission recommendations, um, which uh, we have, there's some, there's, it's kind of muddy <laughs> whether or not we've received um, their recommendations as per the requirements in our code. And so I gave him 
any of the code questions and I wanted to see if folks were curious about that before we move on. So, uh, but I'll ask my other substantive questions later. Yes, the concern, as I understand it, is whether or not the Planning Commission's recommendations have been adequately communicated to the City Council as part of the staff report and presentation. Um, what the code says is, um, or essentially what the procedure is for uh, a zoning a text amendment is that a public hearing is held by the Planning Commission and then the Planning Commission, uh, the code says, shall forward a recommendation for approval or modified approval to the City Council for final action. Um, and then based on that, the code further says that any substantive change proposed by the City Council must be referenced back to the Planning Commission for a public hearing. And in such case, the Commission shall report back. It actually says report hack to the City Council within 40 days <laughs> after the date of the Council referral. I'm assuming that's a, a typo. But um, what you have is a, uh, a series of recommendations that were presented to the Planning Commission over the course of three meetings in June and July. Uh, the Planning Commission made some recommendations to the City Council, which are reflected uh, in the agenda report and in the minutes to the meeting, but the text amendments that were provided to the um, Council reflect the staff's recommendations. Um, in my opinion, because it <clears throat> it's reflected in the minutes, it was mentioned in the report and, and also in the agenda report. I believe the procedure has been adequately followed, but if the Council makes any additional substantive uh, recommendations that have not been presented to you, either as a staff recommendation or as a Planning Commission recommendation, then you would need to refer that back to the, to the Planning Commission for uh, further recommendation. I'll, I'll save my other questions for later. Okay. Uh, Council Member Myers. Yeah, I, I just, I would um, agree with Council Member Brown with the public um, being able to allow to go forward. Um, I'm also wondering just with the lateness of the evening and the amount of information and the amount of um, information that, um, excuse me, communication that was received on this. And, and really, um, I mean, I do want to compliment our staff. Really good presentation, cleared up a lot. But um, I am a little bit worried about starting this big project at 9.30 at night um, when this has just sort of hit. And so um, I would um, possibly consider, um, Mayor, if you would consider potentially a motion to continue the item to the next meeting, potentially, um, as something to do either before or after um, public comment. I think public comment would be nice to hear just because it gives us additional information about the community's thoughts. But it's always a little bit hard to do this st stuff so late at night because I don't think the public is fully aware what's happening. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Um, Council Member Cummings. I was gonna express my support of that as well because I think there's a lot. I mean, for a two and a half hour presentation by the staff, I have a ton of questions and I think it'd be a good opportunity for us to hear from the community we can have staff incorporate some of their com comments into maybe an update at the next the next time this can be heard, and then we can all, it gives us time to have um, some of our questions answered because I have a there's a lot that was presented that I now have questions with around street trees and some of the other things that came up. So and it this will go on for another three hours minimum. So I'll be bold and make that motion. I'll second that. <laughs> <laughs> and if we could email and if we could email because I know we've all been. If we could email our questions in, we're going to continue to be discussing. Vice Mayor Watkins. And I, 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 I too, um, agree with, with the proposal to continue the item and allow the community to digest this information. And I know a lot has gone into it. And I'm looking at you on my screen, Sarah, and all of the planning department in terms of your outreach. And I want to applaud you and thank you for such due diligence. and. Um, what's a couple more weeks in the grand scheme to allow our community to really weigh in and to clear up some of the confusion potentially with the planning um, commission's recommendations. But I would also really want to honor the folks who are here and who have called in. So I'm wondering if we continue the item after we hear from our community members um, and then revisit this and then agree with the point that Councilmember Golder made in that if we can just make sure to get our questions and comments to our planning staff in advance to allow them um, the time to really uh, digest that as opposed to us on the dais late at night um, 
you know, doing the interrogation questions, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'll just chime in that I would support that direction as well, to hear from the public and then move the motion. All right, it looks like we have a motion, Council Member Myers and a second by Council Member Cummings. Golder? Yeah, I would second it. <laughs> everybody. <laughs> to continue this item after public comment. So to honor those that have been waiting here with us um, here in person as well as the hands raised online, thank you. I will um, ask for a roll call vote and then we'll move. I, I, I we can just we do it with direction. After. All right. Here we go with public comment. So if you're joining us here in person, please line up to the right of the dais if you wish to comment on this item on the agenda. If you are a member of the public and you are joining us virtually via Zoom, uh, please raise your hand by uh, dialing star nine following the instructions on the screen and dialing star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Or choose the raise hand webinar control on your computer. When it is your turn to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted and the timer will then be set to two minutes. All right, so I will go to I'm going to alternate. Our first hand raised is the name Henry on virtual. Henry, go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hi there, welcome. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks so much. Uh, <laughs> really honored to be the first person in line. Feel quite lucky. My name is Henry Hooker, and I just want to first of all thank the city planners for an amazing effort to comply with state law and to provide a comprehensive framework for the city of Santa Cruz to encourage new development where it's most sustainable your services and public transportation. Hindering home construction in the city, which seems to be a goal of much of the opposition here is fine for the folks who've secured their place in this paradise, but it's terrible policy for those who work here but cannot afford to live here. And most importantly, for our children and succeeding generations who are depending upon us to make decisions that will keep the planet habitable for them. Among other things, the objective standards do facilitate multifamily housing, which compared to single family homes use dramatically less land, infrastructure, water, and electricity, especially when located near existing services and transportation. This provides a rational pr process for doing so and does not add housing that's not already allowed in the general plan. I urge the council to approve this effort to, to allow more neighbors in the city of Santa Cruz and to make a big step toward equity and sustainability. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public here in person. Welcome, thank you. Hello, my name is Colleen Douglas. I'm a homeowner on the east side of Santa Cruz. Lived here for almost 50 years. Um, a lot of good stuff in what I saw, so I, I appreciate a lot of it. But I have one big problem, which is that the community principles, sustainability, affordability. There's promoting social diversity. There's apartment and parking design, which is affordable by design. But whenever inclusionary units were mentioned, somehow affordable was not key for our community anymore. And this is not good. This is not good. I do not understand how we can continue, how our kids can, can live here 
when there, the housing is not affordable for our community. And I just do not believe that all, one ADU should be used to meet inclusionary units for primary residential areas. We want, we would like them on our property. Um, you know, I understand Planning Commission proposed for a higher share of new units to be affordable for people making less than 87,000 a year, but that's not in there. Where, where is that? I, I didn't hear that at all. There are not higher rates of affordability. Affordability is key. You must spend more time having affordability primary for us. It was mentioned over and over again as key for our community. Over and over again. But where is it? It's in small little bits. It's not enough. It's not enough. I don't believe that it's not possible. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I'll invite the next person in person. Welcome. Madam Mayor and Council people, uh, Gary Patton for Save Santa Cruz. I'll try to go very quickly and I'll be back with you based on your motion. First, as you may or may not remember, the council in initiating this process said that preserving and protecting residential neighborhood areas and existing city businesses was to be the highest level policy priority. Did you hear the staff talk about that? Is that in the staff report? No. In fact, what you heard was they judged things based on what was going to be profitable for the developers, these so-called test fits. You need to reorient what you're trying to accomplish. Secondly, I've submitted a letter. It's been passed out, I assume, on CEQA. The exemptions claimed don't work for you. You need to evaluate what the impacts uh, are under CEQA, and that's a, a real pr procedural deficiency. The public hearing issue, uh, you know, on page six of the staff report kind of brags about how we cut back the need for public hearings, and then the next page, uh, well, they're gonna be appeals. Well, appeals cost money. There's a real equity issue there. And then tonight we hear from the staff and, and Mr. Butler, don't worry, everything's gonna be the same as it ever was no matter what, don't worry about it. Well, if it's always gonna be the same, keep those public hearings in. That's what Save Santa Cruz wants, and I think that's what the public wants. The housing issue, uh, you just look at page, I think it's 12 in the staff report, in which your planning director and planning staff says, the development of new affordable housing units will be more successfully addressed by supporting market rate housing production. That's simply not true. We'll be back with further comments. You need to upgrade this, uh, this document. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public I'll take virtually. Uh, the name is Jim B. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. As, as one of the vast majority of your constituents who wasn't surveyed about this, I'm calling in now to express my views about the draft work before you. I'm a slow talker, so I'll just try to squeeze in three points. Point one, while I appreciate your staff has put considerable effort into this, they just don't seem to be able to see this project as an opportunity to address the serious issues that will increasingly exist if insanely tall buildings are permitted to be built right next to longtime R1 neighborhoods. I suspect most of you weren't all that happy with the outcome of the 831 Water Street hearings. Well, that nightmare will be a recurring one if you can't figure out how to address this obvious land use conflict. As a layperson, I'm certainly not in a place where I can propose specific solutions that address um, that that would add housing while also addressing constituents widespread widespread concern about overly tall buildings. But your planners should be able to acknowledge this conflict and there was virtually no mention of it in tonight's presentation. Um, my second point is to wonder why staff's work doesn't focus the tallest buildings not in the downtown on parcels closer to UCSC 
As the 831 Water Street project made clear, such large projects often have the smallest, most student-friendly units, yet the parcels along Mission Street seem to have more modest MUM zoning. Kind of makes no sense. Point three, while there's some good work in these proposed standards that staff should be proud of, I fear, really, that city residents are generally losing faith in the planning department's ability to advocate for the many, many people who live in residential neighborhoods. That's a trend that should worry you as city leaders a lot, and it probably explains why so many of us are alarmed at any hint that public input would be curtailed regarding such overly large projects. Uh, finally, just want to say, I'm, I'm, I and so many other people are for housing. Uh, we aren't opposed to housing. We just want it to be done reasonably and not create massive health and safety problems. Thanks a lot. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public is here in person. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Fenari. Uh, I heard a lot tonight about density. I heard about profit maximization. I didn't hear anything about infrastructure. Can you move the microphone closer to your mouth? Thank you. So the, the question is, how are we going to move all these people around? The streets in this city were laid out nearly 100 years ago for a population much smaller than we have now. I heard nothing about, I mean, I did hear about seven inch trees and some shrubs, but I heard nothing about parks or open spaces, all those things that contribute to quality of life. Um, I heard nothing about recreational opportunities. And then of course there is the issue of water. Uh, we are already in a water shortage. How are we gonna supply all these additional housing units with water? I also heard that this is all part of a state mandate, that we're just complying with a state mandate. I'm curious, when I go through communities like Los Gatos or Santa Barbara, I don't see any offensive high-rise buildings that are, are ruining the, the character and the nature of those, those communities. Um, I don't know, I, I look before me and I see people who are representing the investors and the developers. I question who among you is going to represent the long-term residents of this community? People who moved here not to live in a densely populated city with big city problems, but to uh, live in a, a relaxed seaside community. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Our next member of the public is calling in virtually the name I am watching you. Yes, hello. Uh, I want to talk about the tree ordinance. Uh, authority alone doesn't make it well thought out or justify the restrictions or the new penalties entirely. I noticed that this all inclusive list of about 30 allowed trees mostly all grow over or far above 20 feet high that are allowed. What do you literally have then against maybe ornamental fruit or citrus trees that can grow between 10 and 15 feet tall at maturity, but they cannot be planted and then removed in parkways? I think you need to bump the exemption from 10 to 15 feet from at least parts of this ordinance, such as permit to plant or remove, and then must pay a more aggressively large fines if planted than removed. There's a gap there. Your reduced definition of a small tree, I point out, also includes down to a zero trunk inches, with the only difference to you a fine of five hundred, uh, fifteen hundred and ten dollars and worth seventeen hundred and five. You must think an eleven foot tree is almost as big a deal as a fan farm. As to fundamental logic here, while I get big trees are a big deal, I say if the city plants a tree, it's a city tree, but if I plant a tree, it's always still my tree. Just as much as if I park a car on the street, it's still my car. Its presence can be permitted or regulated, but in my mind, only up to the extreme point where the city can order its removal. Requiring citizens to replant a tree if removed would be no different than requiring they plant trees in the first place, which any moron would consider an overreach. Oh wait, you propose to condition that also for development. 
uh, in an adjacent, if an adjacent property owner uh, has already planted a tree and doesn't like these new rules, I say it's their right to remove this tree property, no charge for ex post facto reasons. If privately planted, it's not the public's tree, it never was. To recap about parkways, the city plants nothing, waters nothing, trims nothing, pays nothing, assumes no duty, assumes no liability, but thinks trees planted and maintained by others are now somehow their trees to demand replacement. But the new penalties like the unspecified maximum amount for the old $100 in lieu of replacement fees tells me it's about money. Thanks. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public here in person, please come forward. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I'm uh, Greg Bengston. I'm a registered voter and I uh, live at uh, San Lorenzo Park. Um, I'm a homeless guy. Um, I had other things to state, but coming here and listening, I'm just massively impressed by the fact of the, the amount of I, it's it's thank you to the people, the staff, and and the elected officials. And look how few people are here, you guys. And um, I didn't plan on coming to do this, but you guys deserve. Thank you. And more people need to get their hearts out here and just come and take part in government because it does happen here. It does. That's what's cool. And look at you guys. Except for Kandati. I got to talk to you someday. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, um, no, sorry. Um, but um, I appreciate it. And um, I'm going to. Next time I'm going to bring more people, and then it'll get interesting then. But um, um, I was wiped out by the fact of how much effort was put in by by staff, and 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 everybody reviewing it, and so I just decided to say, check that, and just thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public is virtually Robin and Doug Ankfer. Go ahead and. Press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, this is Doug. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi there. Hey. Well, thanks so much for taking our call. Well, that was a meal. <laughs> I've, I've provided extensive comments in, in writing and I appreciate staff's and council's attention and responses to those comments. Nothing I've heard so far tonight though changes my perspective on this matter. The wisdom of the ages stands. Festin Alante, let's make haste slowly here. It may seem ironic coming from me as Council of the Planning Commission and staff know I've been engaged with and generally supported by the process since its inception. There's a ton of good work here. For example, the height transition guidelines and I applaud staff for the extensive outreach they've engaged in throughout the process. Uh, but despite tonight's tour de force presentation by staff, I agree with the sense of council that this item should be continued giving ample time for council and the public to absorb, digest, and potentially improve the recommendations so that we can get this as right as possible the first time. And in so doing, engender broad-based support among the community for these changes so we can move forward together rather than in conflict with one another to achieve a built form that meets our community's need for housing, especially affordable housing, especially affordable housing accessible to folks with housing vouchers, consistent with responsible integration with our existing neighborhoods. We can do this. Thank you so much for your time, thoughtful attention, consideration, and service. Take care. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public here in person, welcome. Good evening, Council. This is Ralph Sonnenfeld. Um, I came down tonight to support the staff's recommendation for the objective standards. I know how little uh, long and hard the city's been working on really trying to bring um, real equity into this process and uh, reach out to underserved communities and um, underrepresented communities in as part of this process. So I, I think that's uh, something that's really important and um, and the what we're seeing tonight is a reflection of like over I think it's two years worth of work um, and there have been a lot of folks involved in that. I understand that like for a lot of public folks, they haven't seen these proposals yet and they're complicated, um, but 
I think at the end of the day, uh, we'll end up back right here with a very similar proposal because it conforms with state law. If we don't approve something tonight, uh, essentially the same kind of development that we heard earlier is going to happen in our city anyway. Um, so uh, we do have some time to get it right, but I don't think getting it right is gonna look any different than what we have tonight. So that's why I'm here supporting what we have. And um, I just wanted to say, uh, I'm a homeowner in this community and I feel very privileged every day that I get to be in this position, but there's a lot, a lot of folks in from my generation who can't afford to be here. And I think this proposal that we have tonight is the kind of proposal that we need to move forward so that we have as much affordable housing in our community as we can get. And that's what I want to see. And I think we can get as much affordable housing, the most number of affordable units with this kind of proposal. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I'm gonna to go to the next member in person. Hi there, welcome. Good evening, uh, good long evening. Um, my, my name is Andy Schifrin, and I wanna thank you for the opportunity to speak. As a member of the Planning Commission, I wouldn't ordinarily speak about an item that was before the Commission. I have my chance at the Commission, and, and I'm not going to talk about the substance of the issues tonight. My concern was really with the material that was presented to, to you. Um, it's a huge amount of material, so I'm a little reluctant to say things were left out. But I think important things were left out, and it might account for one of the reasons why there was such a response around the issues around public hearing. The Planning Commission considered the uh, ordinance changes having to do with public hearings at two meetings, um, the June 30th and July 2nd, and the um, staff report doesn't reflect what happened at that meeting, uh, at those meetings, it doesn't reflect the uh, actions that were taken. So I hope when this comes back, I'm glad it's continued that it will be, the staff report will have a more um, full explanation of what, the, what happened at the Planning Commission, how the issues were dealt with. The other problem I think tonight, and I just wanna bring it to staff's attention and to your attention in case it hasn't been recognized, is that the ordinance, the clean, the ordinance uh, that's proposed does not include the, um, what was recommended at the Planning Commission for the non-coastal area that has to do with um, the, the, the um, objective standards. It's 2404130. It was in the agenda packet for the Planning Commission. It's not in the proposed ordinance at the council. So I think that needs to be next time around so that you have the full you, get, you have the full ordinance, otherwise it's gonna be incomplete. So thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public is virtual, phone number ending in 7650. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, hi there. Hi, good evening, Mayor Bruner and current city council members. Um, I am, my name is Sean Maxwell. I'm also a current planning commissioner as the previous speaker, um, but I'm here as a Westside resident as well as a current renter in the city. Um, I've been through what you've just been through more than once, so I understand uh, everyone's feelings right now. Um, this is a very important topic um, it relates to everything that you've dealt with today um, and, pre and previous agenda items. Um, and the bit, what I'm here to talk about right now is one important item that I think is on everybody's mind is housing, affordable housing. And the planning commission's recommendation to um, increase the inclusionary housing for projects with bonus density, um, I feel like uh, one of the main objections by staff was that there was no nexus study showing the feasibility that the, of the increase, but there really hasn't been any study showing the, feasibil the feasibility of any of the uh, recommended objective standards. Um, in fact, 
there was a similar argument when we were trying to increase the inclusionary to 20% a while back. And um, it seems like that has gone through. And even when the uh, developers at 555 Pacific, they, requ they requested a modification for their permit, they readily agreed to the 20%. So things have changed. We, we, we said it wasn't, we were nervous, maybe it wasn't gonna work, it's working. Um, and what we're doing by increasing the density bonus is not really getting, we're not gonna get 25, we're not gonna get 30%. What we're going for is the 20%. Um, because of the, dens the density bonus, units do not in are not included in the inclusionary units. Um, I think that's what we're trying to do. Okay, thanks for all your time. We're gonna do this again. <laughs> See you guys later. Thank you for your comment. I'd like to invite the next person in, in here in person. Hi there. Hi, um, I'm Deborah Marks, and um, I'm going to kind of go micro on my comments about my neighborhood. Um, I live in the Central Park neighborhood, which is composed of Leonard, May, and Dakota. And um, my concern is that the way the zoning is on this project, my neighborhood will be devastated. We're, th we're most single family homes. We're a block from Ocean Street, a block from Water Street. And um, I spent five or six years participating in the Ocean Street area plan, where I worked very closely with planners who invited the community. I heard nothing about this. I, I And also the other thing is I was promised uh, at the end of that process that our neighborhood would be included in the zone rezoning of Ocean Street or the zoning of Ocean Street, not rezoning. And, um, you know, of course, time went by and that certainly never happened. But I don't think I'm unusual. I think almost everybody has not heard of objective standards. And I know they did a nice effort to put this out to the community, but I don't think it reached a lot of people. Um, you know, maybe a select few, and I and the 800 survey represents 0.01 percent of the population. So it, you know, it's it just you know there was no community meeting, there was no public hearing community meeting that was really interactive, not being in a council or planning commission. But back to my neighborhood, I I do want to point out that there is a house on the corner of May and Leonard. It's 119 Leonard that was specifically left out of the Ocean Street area. It's a single family home. It makes no sense to take that lot and put a tall building on it. It'll ruin our neighborhood and it really needs to be looked into. Sarah, noisy, this is something we have to talk about. It's, it's absolutely wrong and we've been just shoveled over and I'm, I'm quite, quite upset. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next uh, member of the public, I'll take in person. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Ryan Meckel. I'm a Transportation and Public Works Commissioner, uh, lead for Santa Cruz EMB, and a resident of the city. Uh, I'd like to preface this by saying that I've participated in the objective standards process pretty much from beginning to end, from webinars to surveys to the focus groups that happened to the city meetings as well. Uh, staff put a lot of time into this and I'd like to thank them for that. Um, it's clear that we are in a housing shortage in Santa Cruz. We need more housing. Each year I see friends and coworkers move out of Santa Cruz because they can't afford to live here and I am under no illusion that I may be next. Approving these objective standards is an important step that we need to take to build desperately needed housing in Santa Cruz. I also strongly support the Transportation and Public Works Commission's unanimous vote to take AB 602 into account and make site improvements proportional to square footage rather than the number of doors. Please support staff's recommendation and direct staff to study how site-specific improvements could be more in line with AB 602. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next uh, member of the public is phone number ending in 3031. Go ahead and press star six to re unmute yourself. Hi there. Uh, good evening, this is, this is Scott Graham. Um, as far as the trees go, I lived in Isla Vista, which is right next to UCSB um, back in the mid seventies 
and they had a street tree program which was actually planting fruit trees along all the streets in Isla Vista so that people could, you know, have food to eat while they're walking down the street. And your ordinance makes it illegal to plant fruit trees along the streets, um, which doesn't make any sense whatsoever, especially given the, the fact that there's so many hungry people in town. Um, anyway, the other thing that I object to is that there's, they're saying, oh, well, this is not the corridor's plan. Well, it, right, it's not the corridor's plan. It's actually worse than the corridor's plan. This plan makes it so that people that uh, don't, that can barely afford to live here are gonna end up having to move away because this plan was gonna build mostly market rate housing. That's all, you know, it, it, it's in the plan. Market rate housing is the, the objective here. Um, the other thing I object to is taking away the right to public hearings. Now the staff said, oh, well, there will still be public hearings for this, that, and the other thing. Yes, but there's this ad administrative process of administratively uh, approving projects without a public hearing. So I would uh, strongly recommend that you get rid of that and make it so that there will be a public hearing on any project that's bigger than a single family house thank you for letting me speak and hopefully you'll pay attention to the public on this one thank you for your comment our next comment is uh here in person welcome hey thank you so much uh, so first i'll say i support the staff's recommendation i don't necessarily like everything that's within the plans um but it's really about codifying what we want to have be objective now, and we can change it later. That's the whole point here. Um, and I think staff mostly puts this together from what was realistically already objective standards. But all of that is just like technical mumbo jumbo around it. When really, you know, what I care about and why I come and speak on this is that people live in the homes. Like the whole point of doing this is to build a warm place for people to live where they and they can live among us and that we can welcome them as neighbors. I mean, that's, that's fundamentally the, the purpose and why we're doing this. It's not because we care about what the lattice looks like or <laughs> what we're gonna have for, for sightings. Um, and so as a, as a transportation commissioner, I was one of the people that pushed for, hey, you know, if we're gonna have these site-specific improvements that are only for three units and above, well, either all projects should have them and it should actually apply to all of them, including single family homes, which I might add have no affordability requirement. So I don't wanna hear from people talk about, oh, I'm really worried about affordability, and then they're gonna say they're worried about single family homes. There's something wrong there. There's an incoherence. And I'd like for people to actually look at that and analyze, you know, are they really looking for affordability or are they trying to protect their single family home? There's a big difference. I'd really invite everyone within the community to seriously think about that. So, please move forward with this. I look forward to the continuation. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Going to invite the next person here. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor Bruner, Council Members, Gillian Greenside. Um, with all due respect, I really think that in an issue as complicated as this, that uh, staff should not just be reading PowerPoints. We can all read. Staff needs to be explaining what is meant in each of those categories. Um, I attend many meetings um, and I couldn't follow a lot of it. Here's, here's an example. In the last presentation, what we read and what was read to us was that the change is to clarify how to determine building heights. But it didn't say how that was going to work. So it's sort of glazed over. So I really suggest that we get a different sort of presentation next time. No mention of density bonus. It sure sounded a lot like the corridors planned to me with the nodes, 
the closest one to me would be Mission and Bay. Uh, that was straight out of the corridor's plan, and 45 feet in that node or that area, well, with a density bonus, it could be 70 feet. So we need a much clearer explanation if you're going to think that the public will get on site. And, uh, I mean, it's hard to not think that... Um, when we a comment is we have people at all income levels, we need housing at all income levels. No, we don't. The people with money are in their homes. The people who are leaving are low-income people. And it was the Spanish-speaking residents who answered the survey who wanted lower heights. Finally, as I see the time's running out, um, is I'm very disappointed. We submitted something from Save Our Big Trees to protect heritage trees on site that will be cut down. It wasn't reflected anywhere in these objective standards. I hope it will be taken more seriously in the next go around. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. I'll uh, go to the next uh, member of the public virtually. And uh, Reggie Meisler, go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi there. Hi. Um, I am. It's unfortunate that I have to be like, apparently the only explicitly like far left person to sort of like scold other people here. But I am absolutely tired of hearing about people freaking out about five story buildings and then getting these like bizarre compromise bills where we care about housing, but then we limit it to five stories, but then it has to be mixed use. I mean, it's like either we care about housing or we don't like just make it a hundred stories tall. I don't give a fuck. And like, nobody should give a fuck at this point, right? Like this is a serious problem. And if you call yourself a progressive, you are gonna support uh, housing, with the absolute maximum density and not care about freaking trees in the way or freaking height limits or setbacks. Like we need to at least get to that point. And obviously I want all of this to be low income. I think it's ridiculous that we're talking about market rate at all. I think that's true. But then I hear other people talking about we can't do anything because of water. Like if you think we don't have enough water, then I don't know, just like, your life's over, right? Like, I mean, that's a, such an existential crisis. It's just totally irrational to bring that into the equation. Like, just build as much as possible. Don't even make this a compromise. I think this is too compromised as is. Um, so I support, I suppose, what you guys are doing here. I just think I'm just like frustrated that it's like, as watered down as it is, and people are still freaking out about it. Like, I think it's just unacceptable. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public here, here in person, welcome. I have to follow that. Um, good evening, Mayor Bruner and members of the council. My name is Diane Alfaro, and I am a renter in Santa Cruz, and I am also vice chair, or, or sorry, uh, yeah, Vice Chair of Housing Santa Cruz County. I urge you to pass the objective standards, um, but I will mention this as a response to an opinion piece that was released through various news sources today. Uh, a point in that opinion piece was made, planning decisions can have big impacts on the community. And that's true, I, can told, I can't deny that. But planning indecision can also have major impact on the community, and that's the point, community. Santa Cruz is very unique, um, and a very unique place and has its charms. And that has a lot to do with a, its diversity of people. We must remember that it's the people who make our community unique. And we have a major housing crisis to address so that we can remain unique. Santa Cruz County is the second most unaffordable county to live in in the US, according to the National Low Income Housing Coalition. Is that shocking? Not to my generation. The young professionals who are trying to make it work here young families who would like to raise their children here, and our essential workers like our teachers and emergency personnel who make our community functional are trying to make it work here. I understand that Santa Cruz County's residents want to preserve and protect the character and quality of our local neighborhoods, totally understandable, but at what cost? By not allowing our community to grow to accommodate people like me, you will continue to lose people like me. 
Our housing costs are too high and unattainable for people like me. I was not around when major planning decisions were made that shaped our community. I wasn't alive. I was born the year the first Top Gun movie came out. So, obviously, not my time. <laughs> um, and I didn't have a vote until the new millennium. I am not the only one. I can't change the past, but I urge you to think of the future. Redlining for people like me, mi gente, is unfortunately still a reality. It's not obvious, but it still exists, so keep that in mind as you move forward. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I will now go to virtual hand raise Christian Kadner. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Uh, good evening. No star six on computer Zoom. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I liked much of what I heard and saw. Um, I would ask if that slide deck could be made available. I couldn't find that online anywhere. Um, I've gone through all the PDFs and I see a lot of text, but not that slide deck. And my question would be in the face of um, those state regulations, what leeway or what can the city still do in terms of zoning? Can the city still decide where five story, four story buildings will be built? Or is that is that really up to the state? Um, I live in Deborah's neighborhood. She mentioned earlier that this is one house on our block. That's a cute old Victorian style house that would now in the new zoning be a four to five story tall apartment built potentially. And um, we, we haven't been involved in, in that process. And I would like to know if there is any chance that we can be involved and work on compromises on setback rules and things like that. That has been happening before. Um, as far as I understand, that had, did not happen here. And I'm looking forward to the follow up meeting and also looking forward to finding that slide deck online. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public here in person, welcome. My name is Nyanko, and I've lived in this community for over 50 years. And I wanted to thank the uh, council members for listening to this tour de force presentation from the staff, uh, which is most excellent. My comments are around the, um, uh, the, the material or the um, design elements. And um, specifically, let me see here, what did I say? I think the, um, the design elements presented I think would appeal to the you know hipsters in you know uh, places like uh, Portland, Oregon, or San Francisco. I think Santa Cruz has a diverse population, and I think the design elements should reflect that. That's my comment. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, welcome. Hi, welcome. Thank you for putting in over twelve hours. It's amazing. Uh, my name is Candace Brown. I'm from East Morrissey, and I'm on the Transportation Public Works Commission. Um, I wanted to make a few points here, mainly that as a Transportation Public Works Commissioner, um, after reviewing the standards, which we were told were draft in nature, and that we could go back later and change them, we were not told, because there was no planning commission or um, person from the staff there, that if there's any impact on the development with state mandates, that we could not make those changes. And so I had some concern after the meeting, called another commissioner who was as concerned as I was, in fact, so concerned that he was almost ready to quit, and I encouraged him not to do that. But we do need to look at things like, for instance, um, they talked about the measurement of sidewalks. They said on all other roadways, which would mean anything that's not a, a main arterial or collector street. I figured out in my street alone that that would infect and take out if we put eight feet. 65 off-street parking spaces and as many heritage trees just on my one street. So that one thing alone, I think, should really be carefully looked at. It's worth noting that Santa Rosa, I looked at Goleta, at Santa Barbara, have objective standards, and they've had them in some cases for a year or two. They're seven to 22 pages. They're simple, they're elegant, and they're worth looking at. For instance, try to figure out the maximum height of a roof line. I realize that some say we shouldn't argue that point, but I think it's important to note that it's so complicated, you really can't figure out the maximum height. Things as based on the average of the midpoint of the average of the peaks, and that may include dormers, doesn't tell you anything. When you look at 2.75 FAR, which is a measurement of mass, but not height, it really, was indicated in the original corridor advisory plan that that was too large. And it's really been the problem from the very beginning, and the staff has not been willing to look at that because it would require rezoning. I'm going to 
after my statements. I'll have to provide this to you later. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Our next uh, member is virtual Jesse Bristow. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Thank you, Mayor Bruner. Thank you, Council Members. My name is Jesse Bristow with Swenson Builders. Um, thank you for your time today. And I just really wanted to applaud staff. I know they worked really hard on this and the report was was a lot of information. It was very, very thorough. Um, one, one point I um, wanted to make, there was a comment about high quality uh, materials in uh, the vinyl window concept. And just when it comes to, you know, probably affordable housing, you know, you might want to take high quality out that's um that is subjective in itself so you might just want to list what it would be allowed and what wouldn't be allowed and but again when it comes to affordable housing developers uh they're going to be trying to source the you know the best bang for their butt their bucks so um just something to take into consideration and then uh we've been dealing with this a lot in a lot of our buildings with the new electrical requirement uh the transformer rooms for buildings that are 100% electric, they're taking up a lot of space and the utility company um, requires to have street access. So please keep that in mind. And, and then what I really wanted to talk about was um, the discussion of you know trying to raise that inclusionary requirement. There was a point in time where I think it was 2019, where it went from 15% and 20%. Um, and at that stage, uh, we as a builder and developer did not submit any applications. It wasn't until the uh, state density bonus increased from 35% to 50% that there was actually an, a financial incentive. So um, I just think that uh, by, by trying to follow planning commission's recommendation, you're gonna stall uh, proposals in, in a negative way. Um, I think you have a lot of affordable coming in because of the 20%. It, so I wouldn't want to try to fix something that's not broken. And um, I had a lot more to say, but um, I'm, I'm, oh, I would I just ask that you would uh, um, follow through with planning staff's uh, recommendation. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public here in person, thank you for waiting. Hi, good evening, everyone. It's very important to allow the public comment, just like we're doing now. It's not so bad, right? We can do it two minutes. Well, guess what? In our community, the project's fairly new on water by Market Street. That whole complex took into consideration what the community had to say. It turned out beautiful. There was no problems. Developers need to hear from us. They need the information we know. We live here. Same thing happened up on Highway 1 and Ocean Street with the burger place going in. Meeting with the community matters. Who wants to do something that's going to booby trap their whole, there could be a picket, no one will go there, you know, think about it. Public comment is important. Please put that. If it meets an objective standards, great, then no fear at all, right? You just have public comment. It passes the objective standards, that's great. Now, you're listening to the community. There's no reason to exit out. Xing it out is a problem. You want to charge people to do an appeal? How democratic is that? Just think about it. Oh my gosh, you're pulling people together and more people get involved just so they can have the money for the appeal? I mean, that just is a, it's a bad policy. And even though Sarah makes it sound like it's no big deal, it is a big deal. We can't just listen and be convinced. We have to get real what the dailiness of this is. This is all daily, very important things that matter greatly to our community. We have to put our thinking caps on and really understand. We want to see drawings. What is Sarah really saying? Let's see it in a drawing. What is it going to look like? You want to do all these streets? Show us what it looks like. Then somebody can get behind all of her hard work. A lot of hard work. Do this little bit. We Deeply appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you for all your hard work and staying so late. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public is virtual Bodhi Shargold. Hi there, welcome. Hi, um, good almost morning at this point to the council. Um, I'm, I'm calling as a, a, a lifelong Santa Cruz County resident and candidate for uh, council in district number four. 
and I'll, I'll keep this short for the sake of time and because I'm, I'm still learning um, about, about these issues at this point. Um, I want to start off by thanking the planning department for a really fantastic presentation that was informative to, to even me uh, and really actually comforted a lot of my concerns about um, community character or neighborhood character and, and all of those issues. But I, I also want to echo some of the concerns that were brought up by uh, Sean Maxwell a few comments ago over affordability in the new housing, especially that that we're going to see in the downtown expansion. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really concerning to me that a lot of these developments due to density bonuses are going to include almost exclusively market rate housing. Uh, in, in a lot of the discussions of the downtown expansion, we've heard mentions of a new neighborhood going in, but the fact of the matter is that there's already a neighborhood there because I, I live here. I see the people who are here now living their lives, many of whom are not going to be able to afford to live in the new neighborhood that's actually replacing the current neighborhood. So along with increasing the inclusionary uh, requirements for for these very large developments so that this neighborhood can remain affordable. I'd like to see the council exploring some possibilities to guarantee current residents of this area that they can remain in housing that is at or below 30% of their income after redevelopment has taken place to avoid the displacement that has been so rampant in our community over the last 10, um, 10 years and over my, over my whole lifetime. So that's that's my thoughts, and I, I thank all of you um, on the council and just watching the the meeting for for staying so late and putting this energy into trying to better our community. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public, uh, Beverly Deshaux. Hi there. Hi, hi, Beverly Deshaux. Thank you for all of your work and council, you are troopers. Amazing that you've been here all these hours and still listening to people. Um, I had a few comments to make. One is um, affordable is not really affordable for most people. There's a skewing of, of income uh, coming from the people who have high incomes coming from over, over the hill now. Uh, so affordable isn't really affordable. I didn't hear anything about low low income being included or very low income being included. So that's a big concern that I have. Um, I have a question about vinyl windows. Does that mean the windows themselves are vinyl? Does that just mean the surrounding? Um, I, I assume you mean the surrounding, that the window is not really vinyl, but if that could be answered for me, that would help me. Um, <laughs> am I being stupid? <laughs> um, uh, bus passes that people should, that the builders or whoever the owners are should be required to give people bus passes. No, if it's market rate, those people are not going to be using the bus. I've heard people and I've had in my own experience long, long ago in taking the bus that it costs people about four extra hours a day to use the bus. Our buses are still methane, 90, 74% methane with the natural gas. Um, when there's only a few people riding the bus at a time, uh, there's still a very high pollution rate going on. So I don't know if it's being done for pollution reasons or for traffic reasons or probably both, but um, that seems like a silly thing, providing a bus pass. Um, parking. Um, I may have missed it. I had to step aside for a while, but I didn't hear anything about parking. Uh, is parking being required? Because um, I'm, I understand from the, um, the climate action plan that parking is being not required of builders, and I think it should be required. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next uh, member of the public, Zenaniolate Crow. Hi, Council. Uh, can everybody hear me all right? Yes. Hi there. Hi. Um, hi, my name is Zenon Elliott Crow. I'm president of the Student Housing Coalition. Uh, and I just wanted to call it today uh, in support of the objective standards. I think that as a community, we need to begin to look forward and to look at the root of our crisis. And that crisis comes from a lot of different aspects. But one part of that is a lack of clarity when it comes to housing.
We lost you. Construction, including uh, displacement and including other non forms of, or no forms of rent. Can you hear me again? Yes. <laughs> hey, uh, sorry, lost you for a second there. Um, I'm just calling on the road right now. Uh, and so I just wanted to go ahead and reiterate the support for the other standards ordinance as it is an important step towards making sure we can have more clarity in our processes in terms of how we go about approving housing, which is very needed within the city of Santa Cruz. So thank you all for your time. Uh, I appreciate your support. Thank you for your comment. Our next uh, member of the public has phone number ending in 8288. Uh, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi there. Welcome. Hi. Uh, good evening, Mayor and City Council members. I appreciate it's been an incredibly long day for you guys, uh, so I'll be brief as I can. This proposal you're considering isn't understandable, it's not transparent, and most alarmingly, it seeks to eliminate public hearings on significant large projects which would have enormous impact on our whole community for generations to come. To propose removing public hearings is especially alarming at a time when much of the community feels concern and even mistrust about the city government. I also strongly agree with those who've reminded us tonight that we're not hearing nearly enough emphasis on affordable housing in this proposal, as well as the important question about what is actually affordable. For the seriousness of the challenges we're already facing with this issue, We've got to have the dedicated focus and will to address it. This isn't either or. It's not affordable housing or public participation. We need more public participation and more actual affordable housing. Thanks so much, you guys. Thank you for your comment. At this time, it looks like that concludes public comment. Uh, there's no more hands raised, and we've uh, there's nobody lined up here uh, in person. And so we will be continuing this item uh, to the next date, which it, um, do you have that handy? The 13th, September Thank 13th. You. September 13th is our next meeting. And um, the agenda will be posted here at City Hall and online. Council Member Cummings. I just wanted to um, maybe just put it out there that you just, I don't know if we're going to vote on having this at the very next meeting, but depending on what that meeting looks like, if it's another meeting that's going to start very early and end up having significant discussion, that maybe we consider if it can be a special meeting or okay. at a and on a date where it's going to fit well with kind of what's being proposed because we've been here for 12 hours and it would be sad to see if we're here again in the same position for another. There's going to be a lot of conversation and a lot of discussion about this item. And so I'm just, if it, if it works for the next meeting, great. But I'm just putting that out there as a suggestion. Yeah, I appreciate that comment, Council Member Cummings. It has been a marathon today. Uh, we're looking at the agenda for the next meeting and we think we can reshuffle things so that we can uh, not have another 12 hour meeting and uh, clear, clear the deck for uh, ample discussion uh, on this item. Council Member Brown. Thank you. Uh, I, I just wanted to make a comment about, um, and, which, and I do support the motion to continue this item, um, but one of the things that seemed very clear in the public comment and something that really resonated with me um, was the, um, the, the level of complexity and the way that the material is presented. I want to really commend the staff on, on trying to, and really making, giving us a, a presentation that was um, thorough and clear in, in as far as it goes. But in terms of actually understanding the potential impact of some of these proposed changes, I feel like there is more um, explanation to be given and so I'm just trying to figure out a way to or I, maybe I'll just put it out there I would like to I would hope that we don't just get the same you know the same presentation with a little bit of modification or a few extra responses um, because I think we're gonna we'll kind of end up with the same challenge so I'm I'm hoping that we can 
clear that the, the, the direction is to, that we get something that's a, that we can really wrap our minds around and that the public can weigh in on in a more deliberate way rather than um, sort of just trying to figure out <laughs> what the intention is. So I, I appreciate that feedback, Councilmember Brown, and I think uh, this evening's discussion was very helpful uh, for us to identify what some of those key themes are. Um, we had very robust community, uh, community input both tonight and in advance of the meeting, and we can take that information to hone in on some of those additional scenarios I think folks are asking for as part of uh, that future presentation and not simply rehash the PowerPoint we had tonight. So that, that's something the team uh, will work on. And in the meantime, making sure that our community and all of you here can help share that this will be an item. Um, so the messaging, the communication out, uh, making that very clear. Go ahead. Somebody from the public asked about the um, slides being made available and at, could that, we do The that? slide deck. Yes, we can certainly make all the materials that were shared tonight available for folks to consume, uh, spend some time with. There's a lot to unpack there. And i um, happy to bring back um, as part of uh, our discussion at the next meeting, some ways to kind of, again, uh, reinforce the information that was shared. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Um, just to Council Member Brown's point, um, I was taking notes as, as the public was speaking and as there were some comments, and I'm gonna. Um, go back over the packet, go back over these notes and generate some questions and send it to staff and hoping that that would help with the next iteration of the presentation. We always welcome questions in advance uh, from the council or the, or the community. And uh, th those three weeks will all also give us an opportunity to, uh, to get responses out to those that have engaged with us and uh, try to get uh, as much information and, and clarity out there as we can. Council member Cummings. I guess my last um, suggestion might be that given that, you know, we've had some, today, for example, we've had some controversial, uh, potentially controversial topics that come at times when a lot of people might be working, that given the interest of the public on this item, that maybe it come back, you know, at a time when most working people can attend. So whether that's six or five or, you know, just taking into consideration that oftentimes people want to comment and, and be a part of this but they're working and given how significant of a change this is to um, public policy in our community that we have it at a time that is accessible to most working people. And I would defer to the council on that. It's always a bit of a balance of having the meeting start at a time that's available but not have it go so late that it's also uh, inhibiting participation. So um, happy to happy to do our best to have it scheduled at a time that folks can attend. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. <laughs> okay, so with that, thank you everyone. We appreciate all the input and comments. It's very helpful. We did not vote yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> We're almost there. We need to vote on the motion to continue so we have a first by council member Myers and a second by council member Golder. May we have a roll call vote, please? Council member Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Golder. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Brown. Aye. Myers. Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins. Aye. Mayor Brunner. Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you everyone for your participation and input. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>